This is Audible. The Lost Fleet, Into the Darkness, a Slaver Wars novel, Volume 2. Written by Raymond L. Weil. Narrated by Liam Owen. Produced by Sci-Fi Publishing. Chapter 1 In the Triangulum Galaxy, thousands of small 20-meter probes search the depths of interstellar space for traces of intelligent life. Powerful sensors scan the nearest stars for radio waves and other forms of electromagnetic radiation or pulses, which might indicate the presence of budding civilizations. Probe number X-476-B-729 paused in its flights as primitive radio waves struck its sensitive detection system. It only took the device's complex computers a few microseconds to determine the high probability of these signals being from a civilized source. The probe instantly activated its FTL communicator and sent a message to the nearest comm relay. The relay would notify a simulan battle fleet of the detection of a possible future threat. Taras Ralt stared thoughtfully at the small viewscreen in the exploration cruiser. The ship and its ten-person crew were nearing the orbit of the sixth planet in their solar system. This was the first time a ship had been sent so far away from their homeworld of Kal, the fourth planet of the system. Ship status? All systems are functioning normally, replied his second-in-command, Bessel Dar. The atmosphere inside the Kal vessel was very high in humidity. Kal was a water world, with 92% of its surface covered in the liquid. The culls themselves had gill slits with which they could survive either on the surface or beneath the water. Most of the cities on the planet floated on the large oceans, held in place by massive anchors attached to the sea floor. The culls farmed the shallow oceans, as well as harvested the teeming schools of fish. We will go down in our planet's history as being the first from our world to set foot upon Trillian, said Dar pleased with what would be his place in this historic mission. The sixth planet was slightly larger than Kal, with only trace amounts of water in the atmosphere. Someday, mining operations and even domed colonies would be set up. The future for the Kal race was looking very bright. The ship suddenly shook violently, and warning alarms began sounding. The lights flickered, faded, and then came back on. The crew looked with sudden worry at their instruments, seeking the reason for the klaxon sounding. What just happened? Ralt demanded, his large eyes narrowing with concern. Turn off those alarms! The sensor operator merely pointed to the small viewscreen and the massive bulbous ship it was showing. The vessel was easily 1,700 meters in length, with six large spires on the front hull. It had never been built in the call system. Aliens! said Dar excitedly. We must establish contact. Just think of what we can learn from them. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. He didn't get to say anything else, as one of the tips on the six spires began to glow, and a deadly beam of white energy annihilated the call exploration ship. The simulan sensor operator turned toward the ship's commander. A primitive interplanetary vessel. It didn't possess even a rudimentary sublight drive. No shields or obvious weapons. That is why we have the probes, the simulant commander replied. The commander was slightly taller than a human, with skin that was opalescent. Blood vessels, as well as some of the internal organs, could easily be seen. It is far more efficient to eliminate these primitive species before they can become a threat. Set course for their home world and prepare the fleet to initiate nuclear bombardment of the surface. In space, 20 simulan battle cruisers turned and proceeded toward the single inhabited planet in the system. Long-range scans detected a few small space stations in orbit around, as well as numerous satellites. As the simulan fleet approached call, Frantic messages were beamed up into space, asking for peaceful contact. They stressed repeatedly that they were a peaceful race, only interested in exploring their own star system. Their long-range telescopes had witnessed the destruction of the exploration ship. Near panic had swept the planet, as news that alien invaders were approaching spread across the airways. 
The 20 Simulan battlecruisers took up orbit 2,000 kilometers above the surface, with each ship spaced equidistant from the others to cover the entire globe. For an hour, the Simulan ships orbited the planet as their sensors scanned the numerous cities, calculating the primary impact points for the missiles. The primitives are still attempting contact, reported the Simulan communications officer. They are offering to surrender their world. There can be no others, commented the commanding officer harshly. Early in their history, their homeworld had been subjected to numerous bloody and damaging wars. Simulan was an arid planet with few resources, and the different tribes had fought brutal campaigns to control what was upon the planet. One tribe eventually won out, but the wars had seriously depleted what few resources the planet once had. In desperation, they journeyed into space to the three other planets in their star system. Like their own planet, Resources even on these worlds were also sparse. Then, one day, a brilliant scientist developed the hyperdrive. One of their first exploratory missions discovered a system rich in resources with a planet in the liquid water zone in a nearby system. Unfortunately, that planet was inhabited by a primitive species, just entering their Bronze Age. The exploration cruiser returned and reported its amazing discover to the Simulan Grand Council. They had found a system rich in resources and a world much more suitable for life. It didn't take the Grand Council long to reach a decision. Life on Simulon was hard and growing more difficult with every generation. If something wasn't done soon, their race would die out, as the planet would no longer be able to sustain life. Four years after the discovery of the new star system, a Simulon battle fleet appeared in orbit over the inhabited planet. Nuclear missiles rained down upon the surface, detonating high enough above the cities to limit the spread of radiation. Then, the first Conqueror drones were unleashed. Thousands were dropped on the planet with instructions to eliminate the planet's inhabitants. Ever since that time, the Simulan race had been expanding and destroying every intelligent species they came across. The Simulan population was growing rapidly, and no competition for the available resources could be, or would be, tolerated. In the flagship, the Simulan who was second in command turned to the ship's commander. Ships are in position and targets are locked. Fire missiles, ordered the commander. He felt no remorse at what he was about to do. Emotions such as that had long since vanished from the Simulan race. The ship shuddered imperceptibly as 40 missiles left the missile tubes and entered the planet's atmosphere. Each missile was targeted on one of the call cities. At an altitude of 3,000 meters, the first 10 megaton missile detonated, obliterating the floating city beneath it. On the ship's view screens, hundreds of brilliant fireballs appeared across the blue-white globe as more detonations announced the death of the call civilization. For several hours, the Simulan fleet orbited the planet, ensuring all vestiges of the planet's civilization had been eliminated. At the end of that time, four large simulant transports exited hyperspace and took up low orbit above the planet. Instruct the cargo ships to deliver the Conqueror drones, instructed the flagship's commander. Ten thousand of the deadly, crab-like drones would be dropped on the planet. Due to their construction, they could function just as easily in the water as well upon the land. It would take a few years or possibly a few decades but any call survivors would be hunted down and eliminated. Sometime in the far future, Simulan colony ships would come to this world, and it would become another Simulan inhabited system. From each of the four cargo ships, small pods began falling toward the besieged planet. In each pod resided eight of the deadly Conqueror drones. The drones were programmed to be killing machines with no concept of mercy. The Simulan commander watched impassively, as the first drones fired their engines and set down on the land masses as well as in the water. Upon contact, the pods split apart, freeing their deadly cargo. The freed, crab-like automatons would immediately begin searching for potential targets. Satisfied this future threat had been eliminated, the commander turned toward his second in command. The fleet will return to its patrol station for further instructions. Shall we destroy the space stations? Leave them, the commander replied. 
Without supplies, their crews will soon perish. Our mission here is finished. This world will never be a threat to the Simulan rays. What about those strange ships that came from the AI galaxy? Asked the ship's second in command. What has become of them? They vanished, replied the ship's commander. Our fleets are still searching. When they're found, they will be eliminated. Could they have returned to the AI galaxy? It's possible, replied the simulan commander. That's why the invasion is being sped up. The AIs were supposed to eliminate the organic races in that galaxy. The commander nodded his head as his eyes turned toward the ship's view screens. Their programming failed, and they've somehow joined with that galaxy's organics. Our invasion fleet will soon correct that unfortunate situation, the second officer predicted. Our race will someday need the living space of that galaxy, and those organics must be exterminated. In the command center of the Simulan flagship, there was very little talking. The Simulans were a pragmatic and ruthless race. They'd long since decided they would tolerate no competition for resources. For thousands of years, they had spread across ten galaxies, colonizing tens of thousands of worlds. Already they had agents working in twenty more, preparing to add them someday to the Simulan Empire. A spatial vortex formed in front of the flagship, and it jumped into hyperspace. Across the Triangulum Galaxy, there were hundreds of such fleets responding whenever a probe reported the presence of intelligent life. If all went according to plan, in another few hundred years, the only intelligent life in the Triangulum Galaxy would be Simulan, as all others would have been wiped out. Admiral Jeremy Strong was standing in front of the massive view screen in the command center of the 2,600-meter exploration dreadnought, Distant Horizon. The Distant Horizon was the largest ship ever built by the Federation or the Altons. It had been four months since the battle with the Simulans, which had seen the dreadnought make it safely to the nebula and the hidden world the lost fleets had made their home. It had been a busy four months as the ship had brought messages from home, as well as additional technology which might be of use. There had also been some startling revelations, particularly where the simulants and the AIs were concerned. I still can't get over how this screen makes everything seem so real. Jeremy stepped forward and touched the screen, as if to assure himself there was something between him and the view of space. They were deep inside the heart of the ship, but the scream made it seem as if the deadly vacuum of space was only a footstep away. We enjoy this type of screen, Andra Muse said with a smile. The tall, white-haired Alton was pleased Admiral Strong had come over to the distant horizon. He had several subjects he wanted to speak to Jeremy about. This screen serves us well in our explorations. I can see why, replied Jeremy. He could well imagine how useful such a screen would be in scientific studies. It made the view screens in the Avengers seem quite primitive by comparison. Kelsey was sitting at the navigational console and looked over at Jeremy with a big smile. You need to see what it looks like when we're in hyperspace. Over the last four months, Kelsey and Jeremy had spent most of their time together. After spending years apart, it was a fantastic feeling to finally be together once again. I can imagine, Jeremy responded. It had been a huge morale boost when the distant horizon had finally gone into orbit around Gaia. For Jeremy, the ship carried his wife, who he had never expected to see again. For others, it had brought messages from friends and family. After a lot of discussion, Jeremy had agreed to allow both Katie and Kelsey to remain aboard the distant horizon and their current positions. Not only was the Exploration Dreadnought the most powerful ship in the fleet, but it also had Clarissa on board as well. The human-like AI had been instrumental in bringing the ship safely to Gaia. Reaching forward, Kelsey adjusted the screen, and a close-up of the clan protector appeared. I don't think Dalethon's mobile shipyard will ever leave Gaia. The mobile shipyard had been greatly expanded, and was now nearly three times its former size. It had been exciting for Kelsey to renew her friendship with her bear friends, 
Both Maleth and Corral were on board the shipyard. Jeremy let out a deep sigh and nodded his head in agreement. Ariel says it would be possible if we added additional hyperdrive systems. However, it would take one hell of a job of coordination to fly the clan protector now. Graceth wants to do it, but I'm not sure it's worth the effort of materials. Ariel or I could fly it proclaimed the cute blonde standing a few feet away. Her deep blue eyes gazed confidently at Jeremy. Ariel and I have discussed the current configuration of the mobile shipyard, and we would have to add three additional hyperdrive systems, as well as a better integrated computer system. Miko Lal claims she can design a system which could take the clan protector safely into hyperspace. I don't know if it will ever be needed, replied Jeremy, nodding toward the AI. Gaia is our new home, and it's heavily defended. The simulants find us here. We'll drive them back out of the system. In the last week, they'd finally completed constructing the last of the Alton particle beam satellites. Gaia was now protected by 1,500 of the powerful satellites. They also had 32 Type II battle stations in orbit, with plans for 40. Once the last eight battle stations were complete, Jeremy was confident they could hold the planet against the simulants if they ever did discover where the Federation fleets were hiding. I believe Andrum wants to discuss with you the Alton probes we have stored down in one of the flight bays, commented Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes as she walked over to stand next to Jeremy. Catherine's father was the current governor of Cirrus and had been influential in getting the distant horizon built, as well as arranging for her to command the exploration dreadnought. The probes... Jeremy said, his eyes narrowing. He recalled how he'd been stunned when the Altons on the distant horizon casually mentioned they had two probes, which they might be able to send back home. Andrum nodded and began to explain. Shilum, Miko, and I have been working on what would be needed to send one of the probes back to our galaxy. Ariel and Clarissa have helped, and we believe we could be ready to send one back in just a few months. Jeremy let out a deep breath. It would mean so much to his people if they could get messages back to their families. Jeremy would also like to send back a detailed report of what they'd discovered about the simulants to Fleet Command. Kelsey had informed him Nagumo was the new Fleet Admiral, as Fleet Admiral Streth had retired and Fleet Admiral Johnson had been killed in the battle at the Galactic Center. What would you need? Six of the small ring vortex generators and four Fusion 5 reactors to power them. Can we do it? asked Jeremy, looking over at Clarissa. Over the years, he'd come to trust the judgment of the two AIs. They'd saved his life more than once. Yes, Clarissa answered after a moment. It will be necessary to construct the Fusion 5 reactors, but we have the detailed specifications, and with the construction capability of the mobile shipyard and the fleet repair ships, we should be able to get them built. We also have the designs for the AI's capacitor stations, and we would be building a scaled-down version of them to house the reactors. Can we send the probe from inside this nebula? Jeremy was hesitant about leaving the nebula, since it would expose them to possible detection by the simulants. Andrum shook his head. We can't generate enough power. The heavy layers of gas in the nebula would prevent the spatial vortex from reaching our galaxy. It would destabilize it too much. We need to be in open space, preferably close to a large star or even a black hole that we can use as an anchor for the vortex generators. It would drastically reduce the amount of energy we need. If we had a large enough gravity anchor, we could generate a vortex that would work through the nebula. However, Gaia's star is too small. A black hole, said Jeremy, recalling what had happened the last time he'd been close to one. The battle at Sagittarius A, which was the massive black hole in the center of the galaxy, had been brutal and extremely costly. It ended when he'd used the Avenger to destroy the AI's hypertranslation station, which had opened up an uncontrolled spatial vortex and transported the Avenger and the other fleets to the Triangulum Galaxy. It also won the battle for the Human Federation of Worlds and its allies. There is a large one at this galaxy's center as well, Andrum informed Jeremy. When we were traveling to where we thought you would be waiting, 
Our astrometrics department was busy cataloging many of the stars along our route. We also spent some time observing this galaxy center. There is a black hole there, but not a supermassive one. Our computer estimates place the mass of the black hole at three to four thousand solar masses. The distant horizon has a stealth shield, Catherine informed Jeremy. If we were careful about our chosen route, we could probably travel there undetected. Clarissa stood with her arms folded across her chest. We've made some minor adjustments to the system to fine-tune it. Betram Jalot has also done some work to make the ship more difficult to detect even in hyperspace. Betram was the Alton, who was the ship's assistant chief engineer. I don't know if I feel comfortable sending the distant horizon that far without a powerful escort, responded Jeremy with a frown. The ship had almost been destroyed by the simulants on its voyage to the rendezvous coordinates. He stared sharply at Clarissa. Can we make the same adjustments to the Avenger? And a few more of our ships? Clarissa quickly established a communications line with Ariel, who was on the Avenger, and filled her in on Jeremy's question. Then the two of them ran a series of calculations and studied some specialized design plans for the systems on the distant horizon. All of this only took a few seconds, as the two were working at a speed which would seem incomprehensible to humans or even Altons. It's possible if we start the work immediately, Clarissa reported. How many ships would you want to modify? Some of the changes will be major. Give me a couple of days, Jeremy answered. This was something he wanted to talk over with Rear Admiral Susan Marks, Grayseth, the Command AI, Admiral Cletius, and of course, Catherine, since her ship would be heavily involved in this operation. The task group needs to be small to prevent detection, but powerful enough to get us out of a jam if the simulants find us. Ariel and I will provide design plans for the Alton battleships, human battleships, human battle carriers, and for the AI ships, Clarissa said. After a moment, once she was finished conferring once more with Ariel, we'll have them ready within 24 hours. Add strike cruisers to that also, Jeremy ordered. That won't be a problem, responded Clarissa. Jeremy looked over at Kelsey, knowing once more he would be putting his wife's life in jeopardy. But she was the daughter of an admiral, and he knew she would have it no other way. Can we be ready in two months? Yes, Clarissa and Andrum both said together. Very well then, Jeremy said, reaching a decision. In two months, we'll travel to this galaxy center and attempt to send one of the two probes through to our galaxy. Let's just hope we're successful and don't run into any simulant. Chapter 2 Admiral Race Tolson felt the Warhawk drop out of hyperspace and exit the swirling blue white spatial vortex which announced their entry back into normal space. The 1,600-meter flagship of the Third Fleet was alone, as it was making a trip to the Alton's home system deep in the galactic center. The rest of the fleet was at Carith, undergoing additional updates. The Bear shipyards were some of the largest and most efficient outside of the Federation. For the last four months, Race had been traveling around the Human Federation of Worlds, talking to various senators and even several key allies of the Federation all at the bequest of former Fleet Admiral Strath. His meetings had been met with skepticism and demands for solid evidence of the threat he was trying to convey. Only at New Tellus, Cirrus, New Providence, and Carith had his words of warning been met with promises of future action. All four worlds had grown concerned when Race had invoked former Fleet Admiral Heaton Strath's name. We're being challenged, reported Lieutenant Denise Travers from Communications. I have an Alton battleship at 12 million kilometers. Send our ship ID and inform them we have permission from Ambassador Terrain to visit Astral, Race responded. His trip to the Alton's current home system had met with only lukewarm support. The Altons didn't want to become involved in another drawn-out war, as most of their population were pacifists. They were also heavily involved in uplifting many of the former slave worlds of the Hawkland Empire. Only at their former homeworld in the galactic center did they maintain a powerful fleet of warships. They did have a few other battleships assigned to various Federation fleets, patrolling the borders of the former empire. However, for the most part, 
the majority of their warships had been withdrawn back into their core systems. I have a message from an Alton Admiral named Victel. He says we were expected. We've been given permission to continue on to Astral and go into orbit using a micro-jump. That was easy, commented Commander Madeline Arnett. The Altons were very strict about allowing visits to Astral. Race glanced over at Commander Arnett. Ambassador Terrain feels the Federation, as well as the other allied worlds, owes much to former Fleet Admiral Strath. He was very concerned when I related what the Admiral told me. It's unfortunate they're such pacifists. He wasn't certain just how much support he could drum up for us. Premonitions, said Colonel Bryce Cowell, the executive officer. Do you really believe in those? The people on New Providence certainly do, Race replied. All through the history of the original Human Federation of Worlds, there were people who could see the future. They actually knew what events were going to occur? asked Cowell, shaking his head in disbelief. Race turned toward his executive officer. Not quite. These premonitions occur in the form of very vague dreams. For instance, before the battle at the Galactic Center, Fleet Admiral Streth had a dream about a great circle of white light. The spatial vortex the lost fleets were drawn into, said Cal with a frown. Fleet Admiral Streth actually saw it before the battle? Yes, but he had no idea what it meant. That's the problem with premonitions. They're very unclear most of the time. Cal was still finding it hard to accept. What are we doing here at the Alton's home system? Race looked over at Commander Arnett before answering. She was the only one on the ship. He had revealed what Fleet Admiral Streth had warned him about. Research, Race answered. There may be a new threat we need to prepare for. What type of threat? asked Cowell, looking perplexed. The Hawklands were defeated. The Borzon were staying close to their own territory. And after Third Fleet's defeat of the Shari... The threat from them had greatly diminished. That's what we're here to find out, answered Race, turning toward the helm officer. Plot a short jump to just outside the orbit of Astral. Race leaned back in his command chair and let out a deep breath. He'd been briefed by Fleet Admiral Nagumo on what Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes discovered on Astral about the simulans and how they had reprogrammed the AIs. Then later, Fleet Admiral Streth had summoned him to Macon with a dire warning. The Simulans were still in existence and coming to conquer the galaxy. He'd also revealed to Race the galaxy the invasion would come from was the same one the Lost Fleets and the Distant Horizon had traveled to. This was the message he'd been explaining to key individuals across the Human Federation of Worlds and their allies. A new and terrible war was coming, and they had to be ready. Race looked at the main view screen in the command center in awe. The screen showed the Alton City of Light, the only remaining city on the planet of Astral. At its height, the city could easily have held over 100 million inhabitants. It spread out for kilometers, with wide avenues and soaring towers. Some of the buildings seemed to reach up nearly to the few clouds, which floated high in the almost clear sky. It's remarkable, said Commander Arnett as she gazed at the view screen. To think the A.I.s preserved it for all these years. As their empire shrank and the Altons became ever more dependent on the A.I.s for their day-to-day -day lives, they came to this city, Race answered. For hundreds of years, the city persevered as the Alton race slowly declined and the birth rate fell. In the end, only the A.I.s were left. Except for the Altons who had set up a colony in our sector of the galaxy, commented Colonel Cowell. They survived... Commander Arnett nodded her head. Because they didn't bring any AIs with them, and had a strong belief their artificial constructs, someday, could pose a danger to the galaxy. They were right, Race said, but not due to the reasons they thought would come to pass. It was more due to the simulans meddling with the programming of the Master Codex. Your shuttle is ready, reported Lieutenant Travers from Communications. General Wesley and Garrick Rath are waiting for you at the city spaceport. Let's not keep them waiting, Race replied as he stood up. Commander Arnett, you're with me. Colonel Cowell, you have command. Several hours later, they were standing in the computer center, deep beneath the city, staring in amazement at the largest computer system they'd ever seen. The room they were in was so vast, neither Admiral Tolson nor Commander Arnett were sure they could see the far wall. There are kilometers of computers beneath the city. 
Garrick Rath informed them. The tall Alton was the chief researcher in charge of cataloging the data stored in the massive computer system. They're all tied into the computer core, several kilometers beneath us. Everything the early Altons discovered is recorded here, as well as the history and science of tens of thousands of worlds the AIs and their proxy races conquered. The information about the simulans and what they did to the Master Codex is here also? Questioned Race. They were standing on a platform 20 meters above the floor of the massive computer center. Yes, Garrick replied with a deep frown. My research partner, Lin Talmath, and her team have spent quite some time analyzing what the simulans did to the AIs. There can be no doubt the change in the programming they instigated caused the AIs to become a much more deadly threat than they ever would have on their own. Could these simulans still be alive in another galaxy? Garrick paused for a moment, considering his answer. That's unknown. However, the programming the simulans used seems to indicate a long-term plan to conquer our galaxy. This implies they expected to be around to pick up the pieces once the AIs fired off their eternity device. You think they're going to return? said General Wesley, his eyes widening in concern. That's why you've come to Astral. Race focused his gaze on Garrick. If the simulans were to return, is there any way to know where they would appear? It took a hell of a lot of power to open the vortex the lost fleets went through. Are the simulans tied down to using a black hole? Garrick's frown deepened. That information may be available in the computers. I can have some of my research assistants begin searching for any pertinent data. I would appreciate that, Race responded. I've spoken to Fleet Admiral Nagumo, and it's vital for us to know if we might soon be facing an invasion by these simulans. Nagumo had been one who had expressed doubt at Race's warning of a possible extragalactic invasion. He'd heard Race out and informed him he needed more proof other than just the ramblings of a retired fleet admiral. I would hope not, Garrick replied, his eyes showing concern. If their science is any indication of their power, our fleets wouldn't stand a chance. Are you saying they would be more advanced than the AIs or Altons? asked Commander Arnett in surprise. She thought Alton science was supreme. This change in the Master Codex occurred thousands of years ago, Garrick answered. We have to assume their science has continued to advance. Race felt disheartened by this information. If the lost fleets in the distant horizon had indeed gone to the Simulan galaxy, then they might have been overwhelmed by the deadly aliens. But then again, Fleet Admiral Streth had indicated he felt the fleets and the distant horizon had survived. If they had, Race would give his right arm to know how they'd managed to do it. That information might prove vital in protecting the galaxy from a simulant invasion. It was several hours later, and Admiral Tolson, Commander Arnett, and General Wesley were standing in the lobby of the huge building above the computer center. The edifice easily rose 300 stories above the ground and extended down an additional 40 more. Commander Arnett was admiring the hundreds of wondrous paintings placed with great care upon the walls. They're beautiful. These were some of the most gorgeous paintings she'd ever seen of landscapes of different planets. They showed sunsets, sunrises, mountains, massive green forests, lakes, waterfalls, and strange animals, the likes of which Madeline had never imagined. She stepped closer, imagining what the artist must have felt in painting such things. Many of these buildings are filled with paintings such as these, General Wesley informed them. In the final days, the surviving Altons gradually moved from the outlying cities to here, until all who were left lived in the City of Light. For a few more centuries, they practiced the arts as the birth rate continued to decline. In the end, they died out, but they left behind this wonderful artwork. These are truly amazing, Madeline said. Her eyes captured by one which showed a waterfall cascading over a steep cliff and falling for thousands of meters to strike a deep blue pool. The painting almost seemed alive. She wondered on what world this painting had been done. It's hard to believe they died out, General Wesley continued. 
Their minds were brilliant, but they became too dependent upon the AIs. I've spoken to Garrick about this, and he claims the Altons here in the City of Light became so involved living in computer-generated worlds toward the end that their bodies simply ceased to function. There are rooms I could show you where the Altons lay upon comfortable couches, immersed in unimaginable worlds of fantasy and make-believe. The AIs attended them to the very end, but this final virtual reality was their doom. The population over a period of 200 years dropped from 112 million in this city to less than 10 million. By the time the remaining Altons grasped what was happening, it was too late to reverse it. Very few Altons of childbearing age were still alive, and most of them refused to give up their virtual worlds. Virtual reality? asked Madeline, looking confused. This was something she hadn't heard of before, in relation to the Altons. One of the Alton scientists, along with several AIs, discovered how to connect their computer system directly to their brains. They could create any type of world or adventure one might desire. The virtual world seemed so real. Many Altons would only wake up long enough to eat and then go back to it. That explains why the current Altons are so opposed to AIs, added Race. The Altons had accepted Ariel and Clarissa but discouraged the Human Federation of Worlds from delving any further into AI research. Have you found any more functioning AIs in the last few months? Asked Madeline. Only a few, Wesley replied. I have over 100,000 Marines combing the installations in this system, searching for any still activated. We've only found 12 in the last four months. I'm starting to believe there can only be a few more left. I noticed when we went into orbit, there are a number of indomitable class battle stations in orbit. Race commented. He had been surprised to see the massive Alton stations surrounding the planet. Yes, Wesley answered with a nod. There are 24 of them. Garrick told me it's to ensure the information stored in these computers stays secure and doesn't fall into the hands of either the Shari or the Borzon. A wise decision, Race replied. He had also noticed quite a few Alton battleships and battle cruisers in the system, as well as a small Federation fleet. There is so much knowledge stored in those computers, Wesley said. Garrick and Maleth both say it will take several hundred years just to catalog everything. Researchers are already coming from the Alton Core Worlds to study and do research here. Within two years, there will be more than 20,000 Altons involved in various research programs. What about your Marines? When will they be going home? Wesley turned toward Race. The Altons have asked that we keep a large contingent in the system. We'll rotate them out on a regular basis, but it might be some time before the numbers drop significantly from where they are now. Race nodded his head in understanding. The knowledge contained here in the computer core is beyond belief. I still find it hard to believe the AIs didn't use it to create super-advanced weapon systems. They didn't feel they were necessary, and as a result, were deemed a waste of research and time, Wesley responded. They had their four slaver races who were doing most of the fighting for them, and they ensured all four had weapon systems considerably less advanced than their own. It's a good thing, Commander Arnett said. The Hawklands were difficult enough to conquer without having advanced weapons. Even the AIs would have been too much for us without the Altons. How long do you think this search will last? asked Race. Altons were known at times to become deeply involved in their research, that the passage of time meant little to them. Wesley laughed and looked over at Race. Who knows? It could be a few days or it could be a few weeks. Weeks, moaned Madeline, shaking her head. This might be a good time to set up some shipboard drills, Race said thoughtfully. Madeline agreed. I'll set up some as soon as we get back up to the Warhawk. Race was in his corners, reading the latest messages from home. His parents lived inside Cirrus and were still doing well. They wanted to spend some quality time with him the next time he had leave. His mother wanted to travel to Nutellus and see the beach resorts. She heard they were fabulous. There was also a message from his sister, Massey, who had just been promoted to commander of the battle carrier Hera. It was well over a year since the last time he'd seen his younger sister. Race wondered if it would be possible to arrange for all of them to travel to Nutellus together. It was something he needed to look into. Looking back at his parents' message, he saw his mother had mentioned Massey was dating a vice-admiral. He allowed a smile to cross his face. 
leave it to his sister to pick a higher officer to become involved with. The comm unit on his desk sounded, and getting up from his comfortable couch, he crossed the room and pressed the button. Yes? Commander Arnett's voice came over the comm. We just received word from Garrick Rath that Lean Tall Moth has concluded her research and is ready with her report. Do you want her to send it to us, or would you like to go down to Astral? We'll go down to Astral, Race answered. It would be a lot easier to ask questions if they were together on the surface. Have a shuttle prepared, and we'll leave in an hour. He was highly curious to hear what the Alton Research Specialist had discovered. They were once more far beneath the surface of the city lights in a small conference room, which had been set up for the occasion. Race was surprised to see half a dozen Altons in the room, as well as General Wesley, Garrick Rath, and Lintol Moth. It made him wonder just what the research had turned up. We have the information you requested, Garrick began as they all sat down. We were quite surprised at what we discovered, and also extremely concerned about the ramifications of what you're about to be told. Lean Tall stood up and gazed somberly around the group. As you all know, several thousand years ago, the simulants came to our galaxy and made a programming change in the Master Codex which eventually led to war with the Hawkland Empire and the A.I.s. It culminated in the battle at our galaxy center. The A.I.s built a massive ring of capacitor stations to store the energy given off by the black hole's accretion disk. Their ring generators, when activated, created a spatial vortex nearly 20 kilometers in diameter. Oblon Donald is a scientist who specializes in black holes and the effects of gravity and energy on the binding structure of space. An older, white-haired Alton stood. I was amazed and frightened by what our research turned up. He paused for a moment, looking over the group, making sure he had their undivided attention. Each time the AIs activated their vortex ring, they weakened the very binding structure of space. When the Avenger destroyed the translation station, an uncontrolled spatial vortex was created. This vortex was rampant with massive surges of energy and tremendous fluctuations in gravity. If our theories are correct... The very fabric of space in that vicinity has been severely weakened and possibly even ruptured. Race felt confused, not really certain what Oblon was implying. I don't understand. Oblon turned toward a female Alton and indicated for her to explain. Our hyperdrives work by creating a small spatial vortex, which momentarily creates a tear in space that allows our ship to travel through a higher energy dimension. The holes are so small, they instantly seal up, and over a period of a few hours or days at the most, the binding structure of space returns to normal. However, that is not what happened at the galactic center. The release of energy and the tear in space was so violent and massive, it cannot repair itself. It's like a bubble which has been stretched so thin that it's near its breaking point. Okay, Ray said, barely grasping what the Alton was explaining. What does that mean as far as the simulans are concerned? The amount of energy the AIs were using to power the vortex generators allowed them to establish a spatial vortex literally anywhere in the Triangulum Galaxy they wanted. Ablon began explaining. They just needed a reasonably massive star to serve as an anchor point for the vortex. There's not a black hole as large as the one at our galaxy's center in the Triangulum Galaxy. We believe any attempt to travel to our galaxy will result in any ship or fleet being drawn to the area of space where the white vortex which swallowed the lost fleets appeared. How likely is that? Race asked sharply, his eyes narrowing. Ninety-two percent, Oblon replied. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to create an intergalactic spatial vortex in 
another galaxy and even more energy to actually control its emergence point. Due to the very nature of the spatial vortex being created, it's going to be drawn to an area of extreme mass and any weakness in the binding structure of space between our regular dimensional space and hyperspace. Race nodded his head slowly. They're going to come out in the vicinity of where the translation station was. This could be a serious problem. Admiral Jackson was in that area working on a special project for Fleet Admiral Streth. If the simulans appeared there, they would wipe his fleet out and destroy his work. This couldn't be allowed to happen, or any chance of sending a second rescue mission or help the lost fleets would be gone forever. One of the other Altons looked over at Race and began speaking. We have analyzed what type of race these simulans are. The results of our study were shocking and quite unnerving. If we're correct in our assumption that the simulans are trying to eliminate all organic races except their own, then they may have already spread to several other galaxies. We may be facing an enemy who has vast resources and a population far beyond any race in our own galaxy. Will they eventually come to our galaxy? Race asked in a low voice, already knowing what the answer would be. Oblon let out a heavy sigh. Yes he said. The simulans are coming, and we don't know if there is anything we can do to stop them. Race and Commander Arnett returned to the Warhawk, both speaking very little. The Altons had gone on and explained in more detail the type of threat the Federation and its allies might be facing from the simulans. It made the slaver races and the AIs seem quite benign in comparison. A race without emotions? said Madeline finally breaking the silence. I can't imagine such. They have emotions, Race replied. He'd been thinking heavily about what he needed to do. They just no longer have the compassionate emotions, such as love and empathy. Something in their past forced them to abandon those emotions in exchange for the harsher ones. We may never know what that was. What do we do now? When we dock with the Warhawk, I need to send some messages. Garrick is going to send a complete report of their findings to Ambassador Turin, as well as Fleet Admiral Nagumo. I'll be sending reports to Nutellus, Cirrus, New Providence, Carith, and Fleet Admiral Streth. What about Third Fleet? I'm going to take it to the Galactic Center to reinforce Admiral Jackson. We'll be sending instructions for the fleet to meet us there. Without orders? asked Madeline, her eyes widening in surprise. Admiral Tolson was normally more cautious than to risk the ire of Fleet Command. We don't have time to wait for orders, Race responded tersely. What if the simulans come through and only Admiral Jackson is there to oppose them? Madeline nodded. She knew Admiral Tolson was making the right decision, though there might be some ramifications later. She also wondered, after what they'd just learned, what that might mean for the lost fleets in the distant horizon. Was there any way possible they could have survived in the simulan galaxy? Also... Was the Triangulum Galaxy even the home galaxy for the Simulans, or was it one they had already conquered? Madeline was beginning to realize the Triangulum Galaxy was a very dangerous place to be. She didn't envy Admiral Strong's predicament in trying to preserve his command, if it still existed. Chapter 3 Jeremy was aboard the Bears Mobile Shipyard, the Clan Protector, visiting with Rear Admiral Susan Marks, Grayseth, and the shipyard's commanding officer, Dalethon. They were standing in one of the large construction bays, where a new 1,200-meter Conqueror-class battlecruiser was being constructed. Her name will be Gaia, after the planet our people have jointly settled, commented Grayseth in his gruff and booming voice. Grayseth had dark brown fur and towered over Jeremy, However, there was a softness in the Carthian's eyes. Any time he looked at his longtime friend and honorary clan member, her primary weapons will be two bow particle beam cannons, as well as two extremely powerful power beams, with the new Fusion 5 reactors the Altons on the distant horizon have made available. We believe both weapons will be able to penetrate the simulants' energy screens. 
These fusion five reactors are a blessing, said Susan, as she looked inquisitively at the new ship. Anything that can give us an advantage over the simulants in combat, I want. How soon before she's ready? This was the first large ship Jeremy had given permission to build, and only after the scientists and technicians involved had patiently explained how powerful the ship would be. There had been a lot of discussion about building new warships, both pro and con, and there would soon be a problem furnishing crews unless they transferred people from other ships. Every day, more humans, Carthians, and Altons were opting to go down to the planet and live in the two cities that had been established. Jeremy couldn't blame the crews, as the warships were being kept inside the nebula in orbit around Gaia, not daring to venture out. The only ships allowed to leave the nebula were the heavily modified AI spheres, which were keeping an eye on the system where the lost fleets had exited the runaway vortex. They had decided to keep an eye on the Sigma system in case more Federation ships came through, though from what Rear Admiral Barnes had reported, the odds of that were almost infinitesimal. Two months more, Dalethon answered. Dalethon was Graceth, second in command and a member of his clan. We're using the spider robots to help in its construction, and everything's going very quickly. Jeremy nodded. The spider robots over the years had been greatly modified. They were capable of almost any type of work, including space construction, and were untiring. They only required a minimal amount of maintenance and a new energy charge every 36 hours. Looking over at Gaia, Jeremy could see over a dozen of the large robots busily working. It may be necessary to suspend work on the Gaia for a few months, Jeremy told the others, knowing they would be disappointed. Why? asked Susan, raising her eyebrow. The Gaia will be an excellent weapon against the simulants. If she performs as expected, we could use a full squadron of the new battle cruisers. On board the distant horizon are two special probes that might be capable of being sent back to our galaxy, Jeremy began explaining. According to Andrum, we may need to travel to the black hole in the center of this galaxy in order to be able to launch one. A black hole? Susan said, her eyes narrowing with concern. After what happened the last time, I have no desire to come close to another one. Me neither, rumbled Grayseth, folding his arms across his massive chest. Is it worth the risk to send this probe? We don't even know if the probe will work. Jeremy agreed about the black hole, but he also knew his duty. We need to send word back to the Federation about the threat the simulants pose. Susan let out an explosive breath, shaking her head. She closed her eyes, opened them, and then looked at Jeremy. I know you're right. We can't let the human Federation of Worlds and our allies live in ignorance of the threat these simulants represent. It's just going to be extremely dangerous to do what you're suggesting. I wish there was some other way. While I detest the idea of going near another black hole, even I know the wisdom of warning our clans back home, said Grayseth in a softer voice. I would like to send a message back to Kareth and tell them what's happened in this hunt and the danger we have found. That's why I intend to modify some of our warships, Jeremy explained. The distant horizon has a stealth shield and other technologies which can aid us in reaching the black hole undetected. I also want to change the power plants in the ships to fusion five reactors for more power. That will give us stronger shields and more powerful weapons. You think we'll encounter the simulant somewhere along the way, commented Grayseth, his large eyes widening. I didn't say you're going, Jeremy reminded his Carthian friend. Grayseth was always anxious for his Carthian ships to be involved in the fighting. Grayseth's clan believed they were duty-bound to fight alongside Jeremy at every opportunity. I'm going, Grayseth replied in a determined voice. My flagship, the Warrior's Pride, will be ready. Very well, responded Jeremy, deciding it was best not to get into an argument with the large bear. When Grayseth made up his mind, it was almost impossible to change it. Jeremy turned toward Dalethon. What's the current status of the clan protector? Jeremy knew Dalethon was very proud of what had been accomplished with his command. With the help of the four fleet repair ships, as well as the manufacturing capability of the shipyard, there had been many changes over the years they'd been trapped in the Simulan galaxy. We currently have four construction bays operational. We can handle any ship in the fleet, 
including the AI spheres, though they're too large to enter a bay. We've built a special docking cradle to allow for repairs or modification to the spheres. We also have eight flight bays which hold active squadrons of fighters and bombers. The fighter and bomber crews are a combination of humans and Carthians, added Graceth proudly. Carthian pilots had increased their training until they were now equal to human pilots. We keep a full squadron out on CSP at all times, Dalethon added. We have 240 bombers and 480 fighters in the flight bays which can be launched to defend Gaia if needed. All the crews are well-trained, added Susan. She was actively engaged in all fleet fighter training, as she was in overall command of the battle carriers and bomber and fighter operations. She took the task very seriously. Jeremy gazed at the battle cruiser Gaia as he thought over what needed to be done. What's the current status of the bays and the AI docking cradle? There are ships in all being updated. Dalethon reported. You have 48 hours to finish what updates you can, and then I want three of the bays as well as the docking cradle. 48 hours, Dalethon repeated in surprise, his large eyes focusing sharply on the Admiral. That's going to be pushing it to get the ships back to being spaceworthy. Use whatever people you have to, ordered Jeremy. I want to get that probe sent back as soon as possible, and we can't do it without the ships being modified. I don't want to risk sending the distant horizon out on its own on this mission. Dalethon's light brown fur seemed to bristle as he thought over the order and how to accomplish it. If I pull the crews and work robots off the Gaia, we just might be able to do it. Make it so, ordered Graceth. If what our clan brother Admiral Strong has told us is true about the importance of getting a message back to our people, then we must prepare our ships for the hunt. The hunt, repeated Dalethon with an understanding nod. The ships will be ready. How soon can we expect the specifications for the new modifications? Within 24 hours, Ariel and Clarissa will have them to you as soon as the Altons have reviewed everything and confirmed the modifications will work. Have you chosen which ship will accompany you to the black hole? Asked Susan. If Graceth was going, she strongly suspected she would be left behind. Yes, Jeremy replied. I'll be taking the Distant Horizon, the Avenger, the Warrior's Pride, two Alton battleships, the Strike Cruiser's Nemesis and Orion, and four AI spheres. What about the Command AI? The Command AI and a few of their science AIs will be going, Jeremy responded. They may be needed, as the power generating stations will in many ways resemble a smaller version of their capacitor stations. You will be in overall command of the defenses here, at Gaia in my absence. Admiral Cledius will be your second. Admiral Cledius was the Alton Admiral. If the simulants are traveling regularly between galaxies, they could have a substantial presence around this black hole, warned Susan with worry in her eyes. It may not be possible to launch the probe. It's possible, admitted Jeremy. That's why we're taking every precaution we can to prevent detection. The warrior's pride will keep the Avenger safe, boasted Graceth, slapping Jeremy on the back. We will destroy these simulans. Jeremy winced from the force of the blow and only shook his head at his large furry clan brother. He was used to the bear hugs and the hefty slaps on the back from his Carthian friends. It was their way of showing their concern and friendship. Kelsey, Katie, and Angela were down on Gaia doing some shopping. There were currently two cities on the planet and three military bases. The city they were in was the largest, with nearly 10,000 humans living in it, as well as a few Altons and Carthians. They had gone into a clothing store to see what the locals had to offer. These fabrics are amazing, said Katie, as she examined several bolts of cloth. She looked over at the store clerk. How are these made? We've been setting up a number of small automated factories that can produce many consumer items, the young woman explained. Between the four fleet repair ships and the mobile shipyard, we had sufficient production capacity to make the parts for the factories. Once the initial factories were finished, we used them to construct more. While we don't have everything that's available in the Federation, we're making great strides getting there. What did you used to do before coming to Gaia? Asked Kelsey, feeling curious. I was a fighter pilot, the young woman replied with a friendly smile. I fell in love with a wonderful man, and we decided to come down to Gaia to begin our lives together. Kelsey nodded in understanding. Being cut off from home, 
many members of the crews in orbit were pairing up and coming down to the surface to live. She couldn't blame them. She might have done the same thing in their situation. Have you seen our beach resorts? Asked Angela excitedly. I took Brace there last week and he really loved it. Not yet, Kelsey replied. Jeremy had told her about the resorts. They'd been set up to give the crews a place to relax and spend some quality leave time. It had been difficult to pry Jeremy away from his duties, even for a few hours, as he was so intent on making Gaia as safe as possible. They did spend most of their evenings together, either in her quarters on the distant horizon or in Jeremy's on the Avenger. She looked over at Katie. How's Kevin's supply of hamburgers holding out? Katie laughed, and her light green eyes shifted to Kelsey. I'm rationing him, she said with a grin. There's enough for several years if I can keep him from eating them at every meal. I'm sure you can think of some way to distract him, Kelsey said mischievously. Katie blushed and nodded. These last few months have been great. I'm just worried about what'll happen when the simulans eventually find us. Admiral Strong will protect us, the young clerk said confidently. He's building a powerful defensive grid above the planet to keep us safe. I'm sure he will, Kelsey replied with a reassuring nod. However, she wasn't so confident. Every day, more people were opting to come down to the planet and they were becoming more and more dependent on the AI ships for protection, even though Jeremy had spent a considerable amount of time explaining to her how the AIs were now a valuable part of their alliance. She still didn't feel comfortable being so close to so many AI spheres. Miko had spoken with Kareen, and later reassured Kelsey that everything was okay. She had told Kelsey there was nothing to fear from the AIs, Kelsey was also deeply concerned about the upcoming mission to the black hole in the center of this galaxy. Andrum had assured her that with the new modifications to the ship's stealth shield, the simulants wouldn't be able to detect them. Kelsey wasn't so sure. There was still a lot about the simulants' technology they knew very little about. Let's go find a restaurant, Angela suggested. There are several good ones close by, and it'll be nice to eat somewhere besides the ship's mess hall. Sounds like a plan answered Katie, fully in agreement. Lead the way, Kelsey said, gesturing for Angela to head toward the door. I'm feeling rather hungry. Shopping, Angela said, grinning. It always makes me hungry. Jeremy returned to the Avenger and was met by Ariel as soon as he stepped into the command center. She was surprised he hadn't greeted him as soon as his shuttle landed in the flight bay. Update designs are nearly complete, the dark-haired AI reported with a smile. It's great to have Clarissa here to help. We're all glad she's here, as well as the others, Jeremy responded. It had been a huge relief for all of them when the distant horizon was finally brought safely to Gaia. We'll have the plans finished in another few hours, and then sent over to the Alton science vessels for verification. Jeremy walked over to his command chair and sat down, with Ariel going to his left and taking her customary position. What's the current fleet status? The battleship Deneb is reporting power fluctuations with the hyperdrive, and Commander Ashall has requested several Alton specialists to assist with correcting the problem, reported Commander Malin, from where she was standing near communications. Admiral Cletius is in the process of sending a team over. Everything else is normal. How was your meeting? I think Dalethon was aggravated about me taking three of his repair bays in the AI docking station. He understands the reason why but I'm playing hell with his ship upgrade schedules. Did you tour the new battlecruiser? No, not this time. It was well on its way to being completed. A commotion at the hatch drew Jeremy's attention, and he saw Kevin come in. Kevin had stopped to speak briefly with the marine guard standing in the outside corridor. I hear we're going to visit another black hole, Kevin said, as he walked over to his sensor console, taking a quick look to satisfy himself everything was still normal. Maybe, Jeremy said. Kevin was his best friend, and they'd been together from the very beginning. Jeremy hadn't said anything to Kevin about going to the black hole, so he strongly suspected the information came from Ariel. She made it a habit to keep all five of them informed of what was going on that might affect them. Secrets were impossible to keep around the overly protective AI. We're in the process of creating a possible mission profile to deploy one of the Alton communication drones back to our galaxy. Finally, said Kevin, his eyes lighting up with excitement. Maybe if we can inform them we're still alive, and the distant horizon made it, they can figure out some way to rescue us. Jeremy let out a deep sigh of regret. I don't think that's going to be possible. 
not as large as the simulant presence is in this galaxy. I've spoken to Andrum and the other Alton scientists on the distant horizon. There's just no way the simulants will allow us to build the energy capacitor stations and other equipment necessary to create a stable spatial vortex which can send us back home. It could take years to complete such a project, and we would have to defend it against the simulants the entire time. All it would take would be a few well-placed antimatter missiles to destroy whatever we build. We have a good world here, Commander Malin said, gesturing toward a view screen, which showed the planet beneath them. Our defenses are nearly complete, and I think we have to accept that Gaia is our new home. Jeremy nodded. He'd already accepted that fact. We need to send a message home to warn the Federation about the simulant threat. I would also like to allow our people to send a farewell message to their families and loved ones back in our galaxy. This may be their only opportunity to do so. What about the AIs? asked Kevin. He still didn't trust the machine people, but he knew Jeremy felt comfortable. They would not betray his trust. I'm meeting with the command AI, as well as with Kareen and Miko, Jeremy said. Kareen and Miko were their top computer and AI specialists. We need to decide what to do about the master codex the AI possess, as well as whether we want to create more AIs. As our crews go down to the planet, our fleet grows weaker. We're becoming more dependent every day on them providing protection for Gaia. We have also designed a new AI ship which will be much more combat capable than their current models, Ariel added. We can increase their combat efficiency and weapon systems by nearly 200%. Much like the new battlecruiser Dalethon is building, pointed out Commander Malin. Kevin was silent for a long moment and then let out a heavy sigh. Do we have any other choice than to trust the AIs with our protection? No, Jeremy responded. If Gaia is going to truly be our new home, we need the AIs and what they can do for us. I'm just glad there are so many Alton scientists on the distant horizon, Kevin said, folding his arms across his chest. I feel more comfortable knowing we have people who can keep an eye on the AIs. Katie says Miko is a computer genius, and the AIs could never fool her. Since the command AI agreed to become part of our alliance, they have fulfilled every demand I've made of them, Jeremy responded. I think we've reached the point where they can be trusted. He also knew the AIs seemed to really enjoy working with the Altons. I agree, said Ariel, placing her hands on her hips. She looked over at Kevin. I'm constantly running simulations based on their actions, and I'm confident we no longer have anything to fear from the AIs. The command AI, Andrew, Shilum, Kareen, and Miko, are all coming over here to the Avenger for the meeting, Jeremy informed them. We have a lot of work to get done over the next few months, and the sooner we get started, the better. The Command AI will agree to be a part of this expedition, Ariel announced. Since Kareen informed the AIs what the simulants did, as far as reprogramming the Master Codex, the AIs have been even more cooperative than before. They now recognize their war against the organic races of our galaxy was wrong, and their initial Alton programming contained no such command. I don't believe we'll ever have anything to fear from the AIs again. I also believe it would be quite safe to begin creating more of them to crew additional warships. More AIs, muttered Kevin, shaking his head doubtfully. After what happened in the home galaxy, Kevin wasn't sure he would ever be able to trust the AIs. Do we know just how many there are aboard their ships? You may be surprised, replied Ariel, walking over to stand next to Kevin. Her holographic imagers allowed her to move about the ship just as a normal human would. There are 470 AI spheres, and each has a crew complement of between 60 to 70 AIs. That's all? Kevin said in surprise, his eyes widening. I thought there would be hundreds at least on each ship. It's not necessary, Ariel replied. Their ships are highly automated, and the AIs don't need to rest like humans or other organics. It's rather easy for them to run diagnostics on any ship problems. There are just over 30,000 AIs in their fleet, Jeremy said, grinning at Kevin and his obvious discomfort. He'd known the actual numbers from the very beginning. So many, Kevin said slowly. I guess I worry that if we allow more to be created, someday they'll outnumber us. There's nothing to fear about that, Jeremy responded. One of the stipulations we'll make of the AIs 
if we decide to create more, is that they can't come down to the surface of Gaia. The Command AI and the others have arrived, Ariel announced. I'm having them brought to the main briefing room. I've already prepared it for the meeting. Thanks, Ariel, Jeremy responded. There were several matters he wanted to speak to this group about. Some he had been delaying to allow for Kareen and Miko to delve deeper into the AI programming. Today would be a decision day for several of them. Jeremy entered the briefing room, seeing the others were already there waiting. He was surprised to see an additional AI next to the command AI. The AIs used anti-gravity propellers, which allowed them to float six inches above the deck. Both AIs were cubicle-shaped with six tentacles and a glowing globe of energy about the size of a basketball which served as a head. I've brought one of my science AIs to this meeting, the command AI said, seeing Jeremy come into the conference room. Its designation is Z14-E63-D38. I call him Zed, commented Kareen, the tall, white-haired female Alton. It's much easier than memorizing these long strings of numbers. I will respond to Zed, the science AI confirmed in its mechanical voice. Jeremy nodded and sat down at the head of the conference table. I have several things I want to discuss today. Jeremy looked over at Kareen. What's the current status on removing all traces of the simulant changes to the Master Codex? It's done, answered Kareen, glancing over at the command AI. With Zed's assistance, we have made sure all AIs in the fleet have had these commands purged from their systems. We deeply regret what was done to us and how it affected our behavior for all these years, said the command AI in an apologetic voice. In order to ensure no more tampering has been done to the Master Codex, I have given Kareem permission to inspect all AI programming. Nothing will be restricted from her viewing or investigation. I have assured the Command AI. I won't make any changes without permission, added Kareem, leaning forward with a serious look upon her face. I will be assembling a team of qualified Altons to help study the programming. We're talking about millions of lines of computer code. We can do much of it with our own computers, Miko volunteered. Once I've set up a program on what type of changes we're looking for, the process of examining the AI codex will go rapidly. We should be able to complete our preliminary study in six to eight weeks. Jeremy leaned back and took a deep breath. Is it feasible to begin creating new AIs? The room became silent as everyone focused their attention intently on Jeremy. This was not a question they'd been expecting. Why would you want to create more of our kind? Asked the command AI, the ball of energy above his cube growing brighter and slightly larger. After what we have done to your people, I would have thought you would desire just the opposite. Jeremy gazed at the command AI. Each time he met with the mechanical construct, it seemed as if the AI was becoming more human in its actions and in what it said. As you know, from what we've learned from the crew of the distant horizon, there is very little chance of our ever returning to our galaxy. Gaia will, in all probability, become the new home to our people. For the next few years, we will be able to maintain our fleet. But as more crew members opt to go down to the surface, it will be increasingly difficult to maintain our current fleet numbers. You want to turn more of our defense over to the AIs, said Andrum, in understanding. That's why you're considering creating more. It would please us to serve in that role, answered the command AI. It is the least we can do after the terrible crimes we committed in the home galaxy. We're also redesigning our own ships for smaller crews, and have designed a new AI vessel which will be more suitable for defending the planet, Jeremy added. The new battlecruiser in the construction bay on the clan protector, reported Ariel, as she popped into existence just behind Jeremy. The Gaia will be able to operate, with a crew of less than 500. The normal crew complement of such a vessel is close to 3,000, including the Marines. This is all very interesting, commented Corrine, her eyes focusing on Jeremy. After we have finished studying the rest of the programming in the Master Codex, I don't see any reason which would prevent us from creating more AIs. Very well, Jeremy said, satisfied with her answer. If no one objects, 
then once the study is complete and we're all satisfied with the results, we may indeed begin creating more AIs to aid in our defenses. What about the trip to the black hole in the center of the galaxy? asked Andrum. The black hole might not be necessary, Shilum commented. Shilum was an expert in hyperspace and dimensional studies. We have a design for a small capacitor station, which can be powered by a fusion 5 reactor. We just need a strong gravitational source to anchor the vortex generators so we can open up a stable spatial vortex back in our own galaxy. How strong of a gravitational force? asked Andrum with interest. Shilum told him the figures, and Andrum leaned back in his chair and thought. How soon before the vortex generators and capacitor stations can be ready? asked Jeremy. He wanted to get a timetable set up as soon as possible. He had a strange feeling it was imperative to get this information back to the Federation as soon as possible. The vortex generators are finished, Andrum replied. They were done over a month ago, as we expected you would want to deploy one of these probes. The Fusion 5 capacitor stations are going to take longer as it takes a while to build the reactors. We'll need four of them to power the vortex ring. We should have them finished in six weeks. Jeremy looked back over at Shilum. You mentioned we might not need to travel to this galaxy's black hole. Where else can we go? There is an area your people have designated as NGC-604. It's located northeast of the central core and is quite close, she replied. We observed it in the distant horizon on our trip to the rendezvous point, Andrum said, recalling what the astrometrics department had reported to him. It's an H2 region with a diameter of 1,500 light years and contains several hundred massive blue giant stars, ranging anywhere from 20 to 60 solar masses. The entire area is in a nebula containing ionized hydrogen. Would it be safe for our ships? With the proper precautions. Shilum replied, we would have to travel slower in hyperspace and avoid the denser regions, and the blue giants would serve as an anchor for the vortex generators. We'd also need to find an area of open space, free of the ionized hydrogen. There should be several areas like those, close to the stars, Andrum pointed out. Once there, it wouldn't be long to set up the vortex generators and power them with the Fusion 5 capacitor stations. I think this would be much better than traveling to the black hole. Jeremy turned toward the command AI. I would like for you to accompany us with four of your ships. We have some upgrades that will need to be addressed so your ships won't be detectable in hyperspace. We'll also be installing the stealth energy shield on all vessels. I will go, the command AI responded. I assume you will want several of my science AIs who are versed in capacitor stations and the vortex ring. Yes, Jeremy answered with a nod. You have more experience using spatial vortexes, which are capable of reaching another galaxy. That experience might come in useful in our attempt to send the probe back. I'll speak to the astrometrics department on the distant horizon and pull up our scans of the blue giant region, Andrum said. Turning toward Shilom, he added, if you will give me the specifications needed for the gravitational anchor for the spatial vortex, I will search the scans for an acceptable star. You might choose several, suggested Shilu. We don't know if the simulants will be active in that region of space. We'll also have to ensure the nebula is thin enough in that area to allow the vortex to function properly. We'll base our plans with the assumption the simulants will be in the area, Jeremy said. I need to know how long it will take to launch the probe once we arrive at our target star. I can get that information, Ariel said. She looked over at the Altons. If you will transmit the necessary data to the computer core here on the Avenger, I'll run simulations on the quickest and safest method to send the probe back to our home galaxy. Very well, Jeremy responded. Satisfied the meeting was going as hoped. I have a few more items I want to discuss while we're all together. Once this meeting ended, he was considering flying down to Gaia to meet Kelsey. He needed to speak with General McGowan over the defenses he was setting up to protect the two cities on the surface. He wished he could spend more time with his wife, but the weight of protecting the people under his command was a heavy burden to carry. Perhaps, sometime later in the future, 
he could set up some leave and spend some quality time with his wife at one of the beach resorts. He was just grateful she understood what he was going through. Chapter 4 Admiral Race Tolson let out a deep breath as the Warhawk exited the spatial vortex near Sagittarius A, the large black hole at the galaxy center. The main view screen quickly darkened to shield the viewers from the harsh light given off by the accretion disk of the all-consuming maw of gravitational attraction. Status on sensors, asked Race, as he leaned back in his command chair and tried not to think about what had happened the last time he was here. That had been the great battle, which saw the defeat of the AIs and the loss of a major portion of the Human Federation of Worlds fleet. We're 10 million kilometers from the capacitor station, reported Lieutenant Brent Davis. I have the Dauntless showing up on the sensors as well as two battle cruisers, four strike cruisers, two battle carriers, two fleet repair ships, and several supply vessels. Race nodded. The Dauntless was Admiral Jackson's flagship. What about Alton vessels? Four battleships, ten battle cruisers, and four science vessels, replied Davis. It seems both fleets have been substantially reinforced since the distant horizon made their transit, commented Commander Arnett. What about the other two damaged capacitor stations? This is strange, said Davis, as his long-range scans found and located one of the two stations in question. One of the two damaged stations is only 22 million kilometers distant, and I'm not detecting the other one. It's too far away, and our sensors can't get past the radiation the accretion disk is giving off. From older scans, the station I'm detecting should be much further away. It's been moved. Any ships around it? Asked Race, keeping his voice neutral. He knew who had ordered the station moved, and that the order had come from the planet Macon. I'm picking up another fleet repair ship and an Alton science vessel, answered Davis. Commander Arnett looked over at Admiral Tolson, but said nothing. There had been a lot of secret meetings and discussions over the last several months. Race turned toward navigation. Plot a course to the Dauntless. I need to meet with Admiral Jackson as soon as possible. I have Admiral Jackson on the comm, reported Lieutenant Travers. Inform him I'll be coming over to the Dauntless as soon as we make rendezvous, Race ordered. We have a lot to discuss. High Lord Commander Octil of the Shari gazed at the dark purple colors of hyperspace flashing across his flagship's main view screen. How much longer until we arrive at the AI's great project? He had been sent by the Shari High Command to find out if there were any truth to the rumors of the humans and the mysterious Altons destroying the AIs and their precious project. After reporting back to command, the results of his battle with the human fleet there had been much conjecture about the possibility the humans had spoken the truth about the defeat of the AIs. Nowhere in Shari space was there an AI sphere. They had vanished, and if the human story was true, there was a possibility they were no more. If this were so, it would remove a major obstacle to the Shari developing more modern and powerful warships. Two days, reported his second-in-command. We should exit hyperspace 110 million kilometers from their ring of constructs around the black hole. If the constructs still remain, responded Octil, folding his arms over his chest. All they had to go on were speculations of what the AIs had been building. You think the rumors of the humans defeating the AIs can possibly be true? It's been years since we last saw an AI ship. Octil replied. We know the Hockland Empire fell to the human and their allies. It's possible the AIs have also been defeated. I find that hard to believe. The AIs are too powerful. Perhaps, Octil said. We shall find out shortly. Race was shown to one of the briefing rooms in the Dauntless, where Admiral Jackson and several Altons were waiting for him. Greetings, Admiral Tolson, Jackson said, coming forward and shaking Tolson's hand. I want to introduce you to Shea Malay and Palel Maz. Shea is the one in charge of repairing the stations, and Palel is our hyperspace specialist. Shea was a tall female Alton in middle age, and Palel was a male Alton, slightly older. Ambassador Turin has instructed us to repair the capacitor stations 
as requested by Fleet Admiral Strath, Shea said, nodding at Admiral Tolson. He was very vague as to why. Are we planning on launching another rescue mission? Not at the moment, Race replied. He would get into that shortly. How are the capacitor stations? Station 1 was never damaged and is fully charged, Hillel replied. Station 2 is 60% repaired and will be ready for full operation in approximately five to six more months. Station 3 has had only minimal repairs done and is at least one to two years away from being able to hold any type of energy charge. We could proceed faster if we had a few more fleet repair vessels, Admiral Jackson said. New Providence sent a ship a few weeks ago with additional personnel to help. I wish others would do the same. Race nodded. It was about as he expected. He reached into his pocket and slid a small computer flash drive over toward Palel. That's from the computer core on Astral. We believe the very fabric of space where the white vortex formed has been severely degraded. Alban Denault put together the research on the drive. I know, Alban, Palel said as he reached out and took the flash drive. I have wondered myself if the energies released might have caused an anomaly in that area. I've requested some scientific measuring equipment in order to scan the vicinity where the vortex formed. It should be arriving shortly. There is a danger, Ray said, looking over the group. Admiral Jackson had been briefed about the probable simulant threat shortly after the distant horizon had gone through the vortex. At the time, it had seemed like only a remote possibility. The simulants, said Admiral Jackson, looking thoughtful as he realized what Admiral Tolson was implying. You're afraid they're going to come through where the vortex was. That's why my fleet, as well as the Altons, have been substantially reinforced. Yes, Race answered. Fleet Admiral Strath feels the simulants will make an attempt to conquer our galaxy. If they do, the most likely area for them to appear is here where the vortex has substantially weakened the fabric of space, making an intergalactic vortex easier to establish. The Altons at Astral have confirmed that belief based on their research. Shea looked confused and then spoke. Then why are we repairing the capacitor stations? I thought we were going to try to send help, or another rescue mission to find the lost fleets in the distant horizon. We are, Race replied. If the simulants are going to be stopped, it will have to be done in the galaxy where Admiral Strong and Rear Admiral Barnes are. They are going to need help to do that, and that's why we're repairing the stations. If they're still alive, commented Admiral Jackson, with a worried frown on his face. We only have Fleet Admiral Streth's word they're still alive. He'd been told about the Fleet Admiral's premonitions. That's good enough for me, Race replied. I think we have no choice but to act on what Fleet Admiral Streth believes to be true particularly after what he's done for the Federation. With the ships we have now, we'll never stop the simulants if they come through in force, said Admiral Jackson worriedly. He leaned back in his chair and looked pointedly at Admiral Tolson. Do we know what type of weapons they have? Does Fleet Admiral Streth have any idea of what we may be facing? Is there any information available on Astral that might indicate how powerful these simulants are? Research into that is still ongoing, Race answered. He realized there was a lot they didn't know, and it was a growing concern. At the moment, what information we have is very sketchy. When will more ships be arriving? My fleet will be here in another two weeks, Race informed the other admiral. I've also asked for additional reinforcements to stop the simulants. As far as their weapons, we have to assume they're more advanced than the AIs, and possibly on a comparable level to the Altons. Crap muttered Admiral Jackson, taking a deep breath. If they're as advanced as the Altons, we could be in for one hell of a fight. There may be a solution, Hillel said. He had been scanning the data on the flash drive on a small handheld computer pad he always carried. If we can locate the damaged area of space, we could place our warships around the perimeter and destroy the simulant ships as they come out of the vortex. If their ships are like ours, it will take a few seconds after transit for their shields and weapons to become fully functional. That might give us the opportunity we need to destroy them. More violence, said Shay, shaking her head with a sad look in her eyes. 
Why does everything involving humans always seem to end in violence? Race had read up on Shay and Palel before coming over to the Dauntless. Shay was a pacifist, as were most Altons, whereas Palel was more willing to accept that sometimes violence was a viable solution. I wish it didn't, Race said with a sigh. The universe we live in is much more violent than any of us would like. Perhaps someday, things will change. But for now, I plan on doing whatever it takes to keep the Human Federation of Worlds and its allies safe. Let's just hope they don't come through before we're ready, commented Admiral Jackson with a heavy frown. The capacitor stations have no armaments, added Palel. They would be quite easy to destroy. If we lose one of them, it would be difficult to ever launch a major rescue operation or attempt to reinforce Admiral Strong. Then our first priority must be to protect the stations, said Race. Once his fleet arrived, he would place it around the former location of the White Vortex once the weakened area of space was pinpointed. I'll check on my equipment to see when it will be here, added Palel. Once it is... I should be able to pin down the exact area of space which has been affected. Let's keep our repair work on schedule, ordered Race. With any kind of luck, Third Fleet will be here before we have to worry about the simulants. And perhaps by then, your equipment will have arrived and we can pinpoint the damaged area of space. The meeting lasted for several more hours and ended with Race taking a quick tour of the first capacitor station. It was 120 kilometers in diameter and covered with giant energy collector dishes. Part of the inside had been modified to allow human and Alton technicians to work in comfort. When the work had first begun to allow the distant horizon to make transit, there hadn't been a breathable atmosphere on the station. While Race was there, Palel played a video of the distant horizon entering the spatial vortex created by the ring of small vortex generators. A small piece of debris hit the ship, Race said in disbelief, gazing over at Palel. He knew the odds of something like that occurring were one in a million. How did that affect their transit? Unknown, Palel answered. It could have been anywhere from a few kilometers to hundreds of light years. If the area in space where the lost fleets exited was also damaged by the runaway vortex, then the distant horizon in all likelihood still exited the vortex there. If the vicinity was not significantly damaged, then they could have ended up anywhere. Race wished he knew what happened after the distant horizon reached the Triangulum Galaxy. Fleet Admiral Streth had indicated he was certain Rear Admiral Barnes had found the lost fleets. Race just prayed the Fleet Admiral was right. Once his inspection was completed, Race finally returned to the Warhawk and made his way to the command center. How was the meeting and the tour? asked Commander Arnett, as she stood up from the command chair. I didn't realize just how big those capacitor stations were, Race replied. It's hard to imagine there used to be over 1,200 of them in orbit around this black hole. So what do we do now? We wait, answered Race, folding his arms across his chest. We wait for Third Fleet and whoever else might be coming. Looking at one of the tactical displays and the few green icons being displayed, Race couldn't help feeling worried. If the simulants came through before Third Fleet arrived, he would be helpless to stop them. Race was in his quarters, working on a report he intended to send to former Fleet Admiral Strath, as well as current Fleet Admiral Nagumo. He was greatly concerned about what would happen if the vortex reopened and a massive simulant fleet made transit. With the forces he currently had at his disposal, there would be no choice but to withdraw and leave the enemy in control of the area around the black hole, as well as the three capacitor stations. He also wanted to send a personal message to his parents on Cirrus, as well as his sister on the battle carrier Hera. A knock on the hatch to his quarters drew his attention, and reaching forward, he pressed a button on his desk which caused the door to slide open. Admiral, said Colonel Cowell, may I come in? Certainly, Race answered. He maintained an open-door policy for all of his officers. He gestured for the colonel to take a seat in front of his desk. I'm just finishing up a report to send back to Fleet Command, as well as a few personal messages. What can I do for you? It's about the simulants, Admiral, Colonel Cowell began, arching his eyebrow. 
It's been several thousand years since they tampered with the AI's master codex. Surely, if they were going to return to our galaxy, we would have seen some sign of them by now. Admiral Strath feels they're a viable threat, Race reminded the colonel. Premonitions, replied Cowell, shaking his head doubtfully. I'm sorry, sir, but I just don't believe in them. It just seems we're about to put a lot of time and effort into defending this space around the black hole. Those fleet resources could be better used keeping an eye on the Shari and Borzon. I understand your concerns, Colonel, Race answered. It worried him also how thinly the fleet was being stretched. However, I know Fleet Admiral Streth very well, and if he feels there's a threat, I'm duty-bound to take his word seriously. Yes, sir, Cowell answered unhappily. I understand your loyalty to the Fleet Admiral. Race gazed at the colonel, sensing there was something else Cowell was worried about. Bryce, if there's something else bothering you, you go ahead and spit it out. It's your career, sir, Bryce said, looking sharply at the Admiral. If you're wrong about this simulant threat, you could be reassigned to a desk job, and you're too good of an officer for that. I appreciate your concern, Race replied. He knew the colonel was correct. If Fleet Admiral Nagumo and some of the others he'd expressed his concern to felt he was crying wolf, he could very well be busted down to a desk job at one of the shipyards or planet-bound bases. Even former Fleet Admiral Streth would be powerless to prevent that. He was about to thank the colonel for his words of concern when Condition 1 alarms began sounding and red lights in his quarters began flashing. At the same time, he heard Commander Arnett's voice come over the comm system. Set Condition 1. I repeat, set Condition 1. This is not a drill. A large Shari fleet has just exited hyperspace, 106 million kilometers from our position. Combat is imminent. I repeat, combat is imminent. Admiral Tolson, please report to the command center. What the hell? Cowell said, standing quickly up. What are the Shari doing here? I don't know. Ray slapped his comm button on his desk as he stood up. I'm on my way. Focus our long-range sensors on those Shari ships. I want to know the exact composition of that Shari fleet. It only took Race a few minutes to reach the command deck and then make his way to the command center. He had to pause a moment as the two heavily armed marines at the now closed hatch checked his and Colonel Cowell's identities before allowing them entrance. Status, demanded Race as he stepped inside, gazing at one of the large tactical holograms displaying the inbound Shari fleet. 32 inbounds, Commander Arnett responded as she moved out of the Admiral's chair. Eight 1,100-meter battle cruisers and 24 900-meter escort cruisers. They're definitely scanning us, added Lieutenant Davis, as warning alarms sounded on his sensor console. I'm detecting high-intensity scans from several of their ships. They're also moving toward us. Race switched his minicom over to ship to ship. This is Admiral Tolson. We have an inbound Shari fleet heading toward Capacitor Station 1. Tell us what you want us to do, Admiral Jackson's voice responded. My ships are yours to command, spoke a softer voice. Admiral Bacall, acknowledged Race, recognizing the soft-spoken Alton. He knew the majority of the crews on the Alton vessels were human. Admiral Jackson, assign your two battle carriers to protect Capacitor Station 1. All non-combat ships are to fall back to the carriers. I want the rest of your ships to form up on the Warhawk and prepare for a micro-jump. Admiral Bacall, I need two of your battle cruisers to cover Capacitor Station 2 with the rest of your fleet joining the Warhawk. Orders have been sent to the battle carriers, Jackson reported promptly. The rest of my ships are moving into position. Same here, Admiral Bacall added. We are prepared for the micro-jump. Stand by, Race ordered, as he sat down and fastened his safety harness. He looked over at Captain Daniels at Tactical. Prepare Devastator 3s and sublight antimatter missiles. I want to show the Shari they're not welcome in this sector of space. What do you think they want? asked Madeline as she gazed at one of the tactical holograms. The Shari seemed to be moving forward extremely cautiously. To see what happened to the AIs, Race responded unhappily. We should have seen this coming. Hell, the Borzon could show up once they figure out there are no more AI ships around. High Lord Commander Octel gazed at the main tactical screen in shock. Where are the AIs? They're gone, his second-in-command reported. We're detecting battle debris falling into the black hole. There's not nearly as much as one might expect. Much of the debris may have already been consumed by the singularity. 
detecting three large structures, reported the Shari at the sensors. All three are obviously of AI construction. One is heavily damaged, and the other two seem to be operational. Status of the human and Alton ships, forming up into a single fleet, answered the sensor operator. Several ships have broken off and seem to be moving to protect two of the large AI structures. So it's true, then. Octil's second in command said, The AIs have been defeated and their great project destroyed. It would seem so, Octil replied. He wondered what he should do now. They discovered what they came for. The AIs could no longer tell the Shari Empire what to do. This would result in a big change in war strategy by the Shari Grand Council of High Lords. Much would be different in the Empire now that the AIs were no longer a controlling force. Humans in Alton ships are jumping, warned the sensor operator. Spatial vortex is detected at 6,000 kilometers. Charge all weapons, ordered High Lord Octil. Hit them as soon as they exit the vortexes. He'd hoped to get away without exposing his fleet to combat. He now realized that wasn't going to happen. Race felt the Warhawk exit hyperspace as his pulse began to race. If he'd calculated correctly, they would be in extreme weapons range. That would give his fleet just enough time to bring their systems online before the Shari could hit them with anything major. Inbound weapons fire, warned Lieutenant Davis, as the Warhawk's energy screen snapped into existence. Strike cruiser Drake is reporting moderate damage from an antimatter hit, just as their screen went up, Lieutenant Travers reported, as she listened to the damage report over her comm system. Weapon systems are online, reported Captain Daniels. I have a target lock with our Devastator 3s and antimatter missiles. Fire, ordered Race, leaning forward in his command chair. Helm, close the range with the Shari fleet. I want our power beams and particle beam cannons ready to fire. He felt aggravated at himself for the damage done to the Drake. Crew personnel had died because they'd exited hyperspace too close to the Shari. The 20 human and Alton ships let loose a full barrage of their powerful missiles. Both the Devastator 3s and the antimatter missiles were sublight capable and seemed to vanish from their launch tubes as their drives were activated. Microseconds later, a series of brilliant flashes of light ignited across the Shari fleet formation. The Devastator 3s were equipped with 50 megaton nuclear warheads, and the antimatter missiles had 100 megaton warheads. They were the two most powerful missiles in the Federation and Alton arsenal. Raw energy clawed at the energy screens of the Shari ships as the missiles detonated, causing them to strain and fluctuate. Four of the 900-meter escort cruiser screens failed, as the energy tearing against them was too great. A second wave of Devastator 3s arrived, impacting the hulls of the four ships, blowing them apart and leaving behind a field of glowing debris. On one of the Shari battlecruisers, antimatter energy penetrated the ship's defensive shield, blasting a gaping hole in the ship's stern. Two of the ship's main fusion reactors were destroyed, and the ship faltered as its sublight drive began to fail. Seeing the weakness in the Shari ship, the Dauntless launched two antimatter missiles through the now fluctuating energy shield, and a pair of glowing suns appeared where the massive warship once existed. The range continued to close, and energy weapons began to hammer the screens of the two opposing fleets. Dark violet power beams blasted against Shari shields, as well as the slightly more powerful bright blue particle beams. The defensive pulse laser beams even added their ruby red beams to the fray. Missiles were still being launched, and the space around the two embattled fleets was aglow with deadly energy. The Shari were firing their heavy energy beams and sublight nuclear missiles. However, the Shari missiles were only equipped with 20 and 30 megaton warheads. The intensity of the battle rapidly ratcheted upward. High Lord Octil felt his flagship shudder violently, and red lights began glowing on the damage control board. Warning alarms began sounding, indicating there was a hull breach. All ships, target the Alton vessels at coordinates Y-72 by X-43, he ordered, breathing hard. He hadn't intended to fight a fleet battle at the Galactic Center. It was essential he return to the Empire and report the AIs were no more. From the Shari ships, a rain of fire descended upon the Alton battlecruiser. Its screen glowed brighter and brighter, 
as energy piled up against the straining protective shield. Dozens of Shari missiles were detonating, releasing torrents of energy trying to knock a hole in the screen. Finally, fate took a hand, and a minuscule hole appeared just as a Shari missile arrived. The missile darted through and impacted the hull, blasting a huge glowing cavity in the side of the battlecruiser. The energy shield seemed to brighten momentarily, and then failed completely. Moments later, the Alton battlecruiser vanished as it was turned into glowing plasma. Alton battlecruiser Swift Wind is down, reported Lieutenant Davis, shaken by the sudden loss of the powerful Alton vessel. The Warhawk shook perceptively, and the lights dimmed briefly. Race looked inquiringly at Commander Arnett. Several nuclear missiles hit our shield, she reported. It's holding at 86%. Race took a deep breath. Continue to close with the Shari vessels. Set all weapons to continuous fire. The Drake's been hit again, reported Lieutenant Davis, with concern in his voice. Then the green icon on his screen that represented the Human Federation of Worlds battlecruiser swelled up and vanished. The Drake is down! Race sucked in a deep gulp of air and shook his head at the laws. Glancing at the main view screen, he could see one of the large Shari battlecruisers under attack from two Alton battleships in a sudden flash of light. The Shari cruiser blew apart. Shari battlecruiser is down, reported Lieutenant Davis. Shari are attempting to disengage. I'm detecting an energy buildup indicating they're preparing to activate their hyperdrives. Other ships are reporting the same, added Colonel Cowell. Continue to press the attack, ordered Race, evenly. I want to impress on the Shari that they should never return here again. Less than a minute later, the last Shari vessel vanished into a swirling vortex, leaving the black hole far behind. The fleet had been brutally savaged by the combined human and Alton fleet. Two battlecruisers and seven cruisers had been lost in the brief encounter, with a number of other ships severely damaged. The humans and Altons are dangerous, High Lord Octil's second-in-command said, as he looked at the report of the ships which had been lost, as well as some early damage reports. They could someday be a threat to our empire. I doubt it, Octil replied. They have their hands full, taking control of the thousands of worlds the Hawklands enslaved. Their forces are spread thin, and it will be many years before they can turn their attention toward us. We now know the AIs are no more, and we can proceed with developing a robust weapons development program. When the humans come for us, we will be ready, and they will know defeat. Race looked down at the battle report Commander Arnett had just handed him. The Drake and the Swift Wind destroyed, and several other ships reporting minor to moderate damage. Fortunately, they had several fleet repair ships to fix the damage. It would mean halting some of the work on the capacitor stations, but Race needed the ships repaired in case the simulans appeared. He was also greatly concerned about the appearance of the Shari fleet. They would now know the AIs were no longer a controlling influence, the Shari Empire would become much more dangerous and would require the deployment of more Federation forces along the border. He greatly feared that even though this battle could be considered a victory, it might have cost him dearly in any possibility of substantial reinforcements. With a deep sigh, he turned the command center over to Commander Arnett. He had a battle report to prepare and send a fleet admiral to Gumo. He also needed to send his personal message to his parents and sister. Ray strongly suspected it would be a long time before he saw home again. Chapter 5 Jeremy was in the command center of the Avenger with his eyes focused on one of the main view screens. A Type 2 battle station was being moved from one of the construction bays of the Clan Protector by a small tug specially designed to move and position the stations. Jeremy knew the Altons, along with some human technicians, had redesigned the battle stations to greatly increase their survivability. The new ones were 150 meters in diameter and fully self-contained. They had an upgraded energy shield, defensive lasers, and two particle beam cannons. They were also equipped with 12 Devastator III missile tubes and a standard crew of 50. The new stations were powered by a Class III fusion reactor. That's the last one. Kevin said from his sensor console. Glancing at his screens, he made an adjustment and 39 blinking green icons appeared, 
Encircling Gaia, each icon represented a completed battle station. Over the years, Kevin's freckles had faded some, but his hair was still a fiery red. That completes our defenses, Ariel said in a soft voice from Jeremy's left side. With 42 Type II battle stations and 1,500 particle beam satellites, Gaia should be safe from the simulants. Then it's time for us to send the probe back to our galaxy, Commander Malin said, as she stepped away from one of the tactical displays where she had been studying the now-finished orbital defenses. All required ships have been updated, Ariel reported. Clarissa says the distant horizon is also ready, with most of the Alton scientists transferring over their science vessels until the ship returns. Jeremy nodded as he leaned back in his command chair. It had been ten weeks since he'd given the order for the selected ships to be updated. He had delayed their departure until the final battle station was completed. He felt better leaving, knowing Gaia was safe. We leave in 48 hours, he told the others. Angela, contact all the ships which will be part of our task group. Tell them the mission is a go, and give them the departure time. Angela nodded and turned her attention back to her comm panel. It shouldn't take her long to send the messages to the various ships involved. They'd been expecting the departure order. Kevin walked over to Angela and waited patiently for her to finish sending the messages. Once he was satisfied she was done, he tapped her on the shoulder. What's this rumor about you and Brace making wedding plans? Angela blushed and then nodded her head. Brace has been transferred, she explained. General McGowan has promoted him to the rank of Major and placed him in command of one of the military bases. I'm impressed, Kevin said, letting out a low whistle. Brace was a likable character and Kevin wished he could spend more time with the man. Angela was completely smitten with the Marine, and she'd brought him around on several occasions when the Special Five had been together. Kevin had sensed Brace had felt a little uncomfortable in their presence, but that would go away in time. After all, they were no different than anyone else. He's very proud of his promotion, and has some very nice personal quarters. We can live on the base when I'm not needed on the Avenger. I can help plan the wedding, Ariel said as she suddenly appeared next to Angela. Her dark eyes were glinting in excitement. Better watch out, warned Kevin with a laugh. If you allow Ariel and Clarissa to become involved, your wedding could turn into a major production. You can help, promised Angela, smiling at Ariel. However, Brace and I want to keep it simple with only our closest friends. Ariel looked as if she was about to pout and then brightened up. Small can still be fun, she announced. Then she turned and walked back over toward Jeremy. I would watch out, cautioned Kevin, watching the beautiful AI walk away. He wondered if she'd practiced that walk. Katie had warned the two AIs about becoming too sultry with their actions. I can handle Ariel and Clarissa, Angela said confidently. Besides, they're both my friends. Jeremy made a quick trip down to Gaia to speak to General McGowan about the defenses at the three military bases being put into place. The three bases formed a triangle around the two cities still in the process of being expanded. A lot of work was still being done at all three bases, including installation of powerful weapons in case of an actual invasion. How are things going? Jeremy asked as he stepped off the ramp of the shuttle to where the general was waiting. As well as can be expected, McGowan replied as the two turned and began walking toward the main control building. Every time we finish up one aspect of our defense, we think of something else that might be useful. We're installing Fusion 5 reactors at all three bases. It will allow us to deploy power beam installations as part of our defense. We're also looking at building some ion cannons if the Altons can come up with a workable design. Jeremy nodded. The distant horizon had used some special defense globes, which used ion cannons to disable the shields protecting the Simulan warships. It was a highly advanced technology and the Altons were having some problems with the available resources, building a workable prototype. I'll be leaving shortly to try to send the Alton Pro back home, Jeremy said, as they entered the large building. What's the current status of our Marines? Great, McGowan replied. We're setting up a rotation for the crews on the battle stations, one month on and then two weeks off. Are you being stretched for personnel? No, McGowan answered. At least not yet. We have nearly 40,000 Marines available. Only a few hundred have requested to allow their enlistments to run out so they can move to the cities. I've moved 10,000 of them down to the surface of our warships. Jeremy nodded. 
He'd already considered talking to McGowan about retaining some of his Marines to handle other positions in the fleet. If the number of fleet personnel who wanted to come down to the surface of Gaia to live continued to grow, then it was something they would have to seriously consider. What's the current condition of the Anlon bombers and Talon fighter squadrons that we've transferred to the three bases? They entered the large above-ground command center. The walls were covered with hundreds of view screens, which showed views of the sky above and the landscape around all three bases. There were even a few screens, which showed views of the main streets in the two cities. Captain Marshall, change the main view screen to show the flight strip for the fighters and bombers, ordered McGowan. The indicated captain quickly changed one of the view screens, and a long landing strip as well as several metal hangars were displayed. Along the strip, a number of fighters and bombers were parked. We keep a squadron of fighters on the tarmac at each of the three bases, ready to be deployed within just a few minutes' notice, McGowan explained as he gazed at the screen. Between all three bases, we have ten squadrons of fighters and six squadrons of bombers. What if the simulants land their scavenger drones? This was a big concern for Jeremy. If the drones were to get loose in the cities, they could cause irreparable harm. The scavenger drones were merciless and quite deadly. Our marines are equipped with armor-piercing rounds that should handle them, McGowan replied. He glanced over at the admiral. We also have him placed laser turrets on towers around the city's perimeters, which should aid in eliminating them if they get that far. There are special munitions for the bombers which should be quite effective against them. Let's hope they don't get through our defenses and we have to use them. Jeremy responded. It's good to know we're ready. He gazed at a screen showing the main downtown thoroughfare in New Eden. They'd named the city after one of the original human Federation of Worlds planets. This is a good planet. It will make an excellent home for our people, McGowan said, seeing where the Admiral's eyes were focused. I made a tour recently of the schools in New Eden. It was strange seeing Hume and Alton and Carthy and children all in the same classrooms. Jeremy allowed himself to smile. He knew Kelsey's two Carthian friends, Maleth and Corell, were talking about transferring to the planet and having children. There were 412 female Carthians who'd made transit in the Clan Protector. Graceth had recently commented he would like to see most, if not all of them, go down to the surface of Gaia and start families. The bears liked big families, and their homes were like giant dens. The Carthians came from a very family-oriented culture, and they all took their duties as family and clan members very seriously. How's your underground command center coming? It's nearly complete, answered McGowan, turning to face the admiral. We built it in an uninhabited area in case the simulants try to target it. We've installed the hunter missile batteries and the defensive laser turrets. We should have it finished and ready to move into in another four to six weeks. Jeremy saw some movement on the screen, showing the parked fighters and bombers. He watched as two Talon fighters accelerated down the runway and rose rapidly into the air. The two fighters did a barrel roll and then shot straight up into the sky, rapidly dwindling until they vanished from sight. Some of our pilots like to show off, grunted McGowan, slightly embarrassed by the pilot's antics. He would have a word with them later. I don't mind it, Jeremy answered. It shows their level of skill handling their fighters. We have some good pilots, both human and Carthian. Jeremy took a deep breath and then looked over at the general. Charles, when I get back from the probe mission, we may be creating more AIs. I thought it was coming to that, McGowan said with a deep sigh. Ever since the distant horizon arrived and it became evident rescue was off the table, I've been hearing more people talk about coming to the planet and settling down. Even a large number of my marines are discussing it. We have a new design for an AI sphere, which should be much more powerful than their current ships, Jeremy said. With the particle beam satellites, battle stations, and the AIs, the planet should be pretty secure. Particularly, if we don't venture out of the nebula, we stay in our rabbit hole and don't come out, said McGowan, nodding his head in agreement. It's the smart thing to do. Jeremy didn't like the idea of hiding from the simulants. But being cut off from home, he didn't have the ships or personnel to fight a galactic war. All he could do was send a warning back home and then retreat to the nebula and stay there. At least Kelsey, Katie, and Clarissa were here now. Maybe it was time for all of them to settle down. Katie was staring at Clarissa with a deep frown on her face. It was obvious the AI was once more tampering with her program, making slight modifications to her appearance. 
Clarissa's hips were slightly larger, and all of her curves had been accentuated. Whenever she walked across the command center or stopped to talk to one of the male crew members, she instantly became the center of attention. Has she always been this way? Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes asked, as she watched the AI speaking to Lieutenant Stiles at the helm. Stiles looked like a lovesick puppy as he talked to the provocative AI. Katie laughed and nodded. Sometimes more than this, she replied. Ariel did some experimenting, but not to the extreme Clarissa has. Clarissa enjoys the attention she gets from the male crew members. Ariel has always been more reserved. An AI flirting, said Catherine, shaking her head in amusement. What's next? Who knows, answered Katie, smiling. Both AIs have been around for a very long time. Katie could well recall the surprise she'd felt when Ariel had introduced herself back in Admiral Jason Strong's office so many years ago. She'd snuck into Jason's office searching for information on a computer program, and Ariel had caught her. They'd been friends ever since. She cherished those memories of her time at the Fleet Academy. And of course, there was the New Horizon incident, where all of them had nearly been killed. Since then, both Ariel and Clarissa had looked over the Special Five, as they came to be called, doing everything in their power to ensure their safety. Looking at her computer console, Katie noticed that Clarissa was running battle simulations. Reaching out her hand, she entered a few commands to see how the AI was doing. Without surprise, she saw the simulations were of the distant horizon battling numerous simulant ships. It looked as if Clarissa had half a dozen battle simulations running simultaneously. It wasn't surprising. The AI was easily capable of multitasking and still interacting with the crew. What are those? asked Catherine seeing a blur of movement on one of the screens above Katie. Battle scenarios, Katie answered. Clarissa is fighting the simulants, trying to come up with the best possible tactics to ensure our survival. Both Ariel and Clarissa run these almost continuously. Catherine frowned and then glanced over at Katie. And who is commanding the ship in these simulations? Katie took a deep breath and looked over at the Admiral. Sometimes you and sometimes Clarissa. I almost hate to ask, but who is doing the best? In the simulations where the distant horizon wins, Clarissa is in charge 72% of the time. That means I'm only at 28%, said Catherine, frowning. It's her reaction time, Katie quickly explained. When Clarissa is in charge of the ship, she can run simulations on her attacks to ascertain the best probability of victory. She can also control all of the ship's systems to ensure maximum efficiency. Catherine was silent for a moment. She suspected that the AI was listening to every word she and Katie were saying. Nothing on the massive exploration dreadnought was a secret from the inquisitive AI. Just make sure she asks me before she takes control of the ship, Catherine said finally. Only if the ship is in immediate danger of destruction is she to act on her own. I'll make sure she knows, promised Katie. She knew how upset Rear Admiral Barnes had been about Kelsey and Clarissa taking over the ship in the battle when they'd reached the rendezvous coordinates where they hoped they would find 4th Fleet. However, if the AI hadn't taken control, there was a high probability the distant horizon would have been destroyed. Catherine paused and then asked another question. In how many of the simulations do we lose? Katie hesitated before answering. Clarissa was running the simulations based on the simulant's tactic of attacking with overwhelming numbers. In none of the simulations were the odds even. The distant horizon is destroyed in 92% of the scenarios. Catherine nodded and then said, I guess it's a good thing we're not going on this mission alone. Katie watched as the Admiral walked back over and sat down in her command chair, letting out a deep sigh. She wondered if she should talk to Clarissa about her current appearance. Even a few of the women were eyeing her speculatively. One thing she could say for certain, Life around the two AIs was never boring. Catherine looked over her command console, seeing the distant horizon was ready for departure. She wondered what they would find in the blue giant nebula. Glancing around the command center, she noted nearly half the duty stations were vacant. That would change as they neared time for departure. The majority of the Alton scientists had already left and gone over to the four Alton science cruisers. Shilum, Andrum, Mikau and a few others would be going on the mission in case their expertise was needed. 
The hatch in the command center opened and Colonel Anne Grissom walked in. Anne had been down on Gaia, taking some well-deserved leave time. How was your leave? asked Catherine. She'd even gone down and spent a couple of days at one of the lavish beach resorts. They had reminded her of the ones back on Nutellus that everyone raved about. She noticed Anne's neck was a rosy red. Great, Anne replied. I'd forgotten what a sunburn feels like. Guess I spent too much time out on the beach. Dr. Keel can take care of that if necessary, Catherine said. She'd also made the mistake of staying out too long in the sun and had gone to see the doctor upon her return to the distant horizon. Already been there, Anne replied, as she walked over and checked one of the command consoles. She gave me some ointment and a shot, and said I should be fine in a few hours. I also took a lecture about being out in the sun after spending so much time aboard ship. Catherine nodded. She'd gotten the same lecture. One thing about a ship's doctor. They never hesitated in speaking their minds to the commanding officer. Any major changes while I've been gone? Since we're out of the defense globes, we've added another squadron of Anlon bombers in the flight base. I bet Major Arkels was pleased with that, Anne answered. I imagine so, Catherine replied. It gives him a few more options if we have to deploy them. What about our Marines? We're leaving half of them on Gaia, answered Catherine. The Marine complements on all of the ships are being drastically reduced. I'm not surprised, responded Anne, nodding her head. I always wondered why we had so many Marines on our ships. I don't recall any battle where there was a boarding action. Our Marines will be taking on a new role, Catherine explained. Between the battle stations and the three bases on Gaia, their mission profile will be quite different than what it was. Anne nodded in understanding. Gaia will be our new home, she said in a softer voice. It's hard to believe we'll never see the Federation again. Catherine nodded. She had put a message to her father in the drone. He was the governor of Cirrus and had been responsible for her getting command of the distant horizon. She knew he would be highly upset when he received the message. While they hadn't been that close in recent years, they'd been back when she was younger. The message had been hard to compose, and it was likely the last thing he would ever receive from her. Jeremy gazed at the main view screen and the world it was displaying. Gaia was an arid world with a narrow swath of green that circled the planet around the equator. There were several small oceans and a large number of rivers and lakes in the habitable area. Gaia was slightly smaller than Earth, and the habitable area was only 1,400 kilometers across, with a wide variety of plant and animal life. It was enough to serve them for many hundreds of years, if they could remain undetected by the simulants. All ships report ready to depart, Ariel said from Jeremy's left side. Trip to the Blue Giant area will take nine days. We'll have to drop out of hyperspace 22 times before we reach the nebula, Commander Malin informed him, as she looked at some navigation calculations on her console. Kelsey has plotted a course which should allow us to avoid most of the systems that might have simulant worlds or outposts in them. She based it on what they learned while they were fleeing the simulants on their flight to the Sigma system. Let's just hope she's right, Jeremy said. He had all the confidence in the world in Kelsey's navigation abilities. She was one of the best in the fleet. Jeremy allowed his eyes to linger on Gaia for a few more moments, and then he turned toward Commander Malin. Take the task group out of the gravity well and prepare to enter hyperspace. They didn't have to exit the gravity well, as all the ship's hyperspace drives were capable of opening up stable vortexes, even in close proximity to a planet. However, there was no point in putting unnecessary strains on the task group systems if it wasn't necessary. Helm, take us out, ordered Commander Malin. All ahead one-third sublight. Distant Horizon will jump first, followed by the rest of the fleet. The Distant Horizon had the best sensors and was the most powerful ship. If she jumped into danger, she would have the best chance of survival and could warn the rest of the task group. Twenty minutes to jump, reported Ensign Stryker. Hyperdrive is charged and ready to initiate. All eleven warships quickly left Gaia behind and accelerated outward. The small, compact system only had four planets and a very small asteroid field. Once sufficient distance had been put between them and Gaia, a swirling blue-white spatial vortex formed in front of the distant horizon. The ship quickly accelerated and entered the center to instantly vanish. Moments later, the vortex collapsed, leaving no sign of it ever existing. Shortly after, vortexes formed in front of the other ten ships, and they too entered them and quickly vanished. 
On the battle carrier Retribution, Rear Admiral Susan Marks watched as the Vortexes collapsed. She let out a deep breath, hoping Admiral Strong was successful in his mission. She also hoped they didn't lead the Simulans back to Gaia if and when they returned. Chapter 6 The small task group slipped out of hyperspace for the 15th time and instantly activated their stealth energy shields. So far, they'd avoided the simulants and were well on their way to NGC-604. On the distant horizon, Kelsey was staring at the view screen in front of her, displaying the nebula. It was aglow with the energy from the blue giants. The magnificent sight mesmerized her. The stars are very young, explained Andrum, noticing Kelsey's interest in the nebula. They're very hot with temperatures around 72,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It almost seems alive, said Kelsey, as she gazed at the nebula. The nebula appeared to be pulsing with a red glow. Intense ultraviolet radiation ionizes the hydrogen gas in the nebula, causing that effect, explained Andrum. It's a stellar nursery with hundreds of newborn stars. Have you located a suitable location to deploy the capacitor stations and vortex generators? Asked Rear Admiral Barnes, as she stepped over closer to the two. The view of the nebula on the massive forward screen was breathtaking. We have several possibilities, replied Andrum, turning to face the Admiral. We'll need to take some additional readings when we get closer. Admiral Strong is saying we'll spend six hours here to check our hyperdrives, reported Colonel Petra Leon, the executive officer. Our own drive is functioning normally, added Shiloom, from where she was sitting at a science console. Betram reports the drive is functioning well within its operating parameters. It should be, Commander Grissom said. We've slowed down considerably in hyperspace to allow the other ships to pace us. They don't have the advanced hyperdrive like we do, Lieutenant Parker pointed out, from the hyperdrive console. We can travel at nearly a light year every two minutes when it's fully engaged. At the moment, the best speed we make is a light year every five minutes due to the drives the other ships are using. We didn't have time to update them, Catherine explained. It would have been a major job to tear out the old hyperdrives and build new ones based on the experimental hyperdrive the distant horizon uses. Any new ships we build will have the upgraded drive, Clarissa said. The battlecruiser Gaia, back on the clan protector, was equipped with it. She was standing to the Admiral's left. Ariel and I have already prepared the new designs for our other ships, and the Altons on the science vessels are confirming the new construction blueprints. Unfortunately, this may be the last time we come out of our protective nebula, Catherine said, with a sad look in her eyes. She would miss flying the distant horizon between the stars. Once we launch the probe, it will be best if we avoid further contact with the simulants. It might be quite some time before we venture out of the nebula again. What about the AI ships Admiral Strong is using to monitor the Sigma system? Asked Colonel Leon. There are four on station, using long-range sensors to watch the system. Eventually, even that will be stopped, Catherine replied. Someday, the simulans will figure out we're hiding our ships in the atmosphere of gas giants, so they will remain undetected. She let out a deep sigh. Most of her adult life had been dedicated to the fleet. It was difficult to imagine being pinned down to one solar system and not traveling the galaxy, but they had to do whatever it took to survive. They were in a hostile galaxy and vastly outnumbered. Sensor scans are in, reported Captain Reynolds. Star is an orange main sequence spectral class K. It's slightly smaller than Sol. I'm only picking up two planets and they're in extreme orbits. Frozen balls of ice, commented Colonel Leon as she gazed at the data. Not a very friendly system for life. Also, absent of any simulans, said Catherine, her eyes gazing at the view screen. I just hope our luck holds, added Commander Grissom. We still have seven more transitions to make before we reach the nebula. As the others returned to their duties, Clarissa stepped closer to Andrum and Kelsey. She had modified her figure slightly, so her hips and breasts were no longer so pronounced. There's a lot of energy being given off by the blue giant stars in the nebula. Yes, there is, replied Andrum looking at Clarissa curiously. It would be an ideal spot to build energy-gathering capacitor stations if we ever wanted to make the attempt to return home. You think it's possible? Asked Kelsey in surprise. She'd been preparing herself to spend the rest of her life on Gaia, 
It never occurred to her there still might be a possibility of going back. It would take a few years, but the energy is definitely there. There may be a problem, Clarissa said poignantly. If the simulants travel between galaxies as we suspect, they could have a substantial presence in this nebula. With the energy available from the Blue Giants, it would make an ideal base of operations for them. Kelsey leaned back in her chair, her eyes growing wide with concern. The simulants, she repeated. I thought they would be at the black hole in the galaxy's center. It's safer in the nebula, Clarissa said in an even voice. Why risk the high gravity near the black hole when you have all of this energy being generated by hundreds of blue giants? Andrum, is what Clarissa's saying possible? Andrum's brow creased in thought. He then turned and spoke to Shelum over his minicom. For several minutes, the two held an animated conversation. Finally, Andrum turned back toward Kelsey. It's highly likely, he said with some anxiety in his voice. If the simulans are traveling regularly between galaxies, they could indeed have a major presence in the nebula. Does Jeremy know? Asked Kelsey, speaking to Clarissa. Ariel is informing him of our suspicions even as we speak, Clarissa replied. Any time the distant horizon was out of hyperspace, it was easy for the two AIs to communicate with one another. How will this affect the mission? It shouldn't, Clarissa responded. Her deep blue eyes focused on Kelsey. It won't take us very long to deploy the capacitor stations and the vortex generators. Once they're in position, we can activate the vortex ring and send the probe through. How long? Kelsey persisted. If there were simulants in the nebula, then their mission had just become much more dangerous. Six to ten hours, Clarissa responded, if everything goes according to plan. Kelsey took a deep breath. That was six to ten hours in which the simulants could find the task force. Standing up, Kelsey motioned for Clarissa to follow her. We need to inform Rear Admiral Barnes of this. If we find a suitable star, the distant horizon will be jumping in first. She needs to know what might be waiting for us. Jeremy closed his eyes and shook his head. It seemed like their plans to use the Blue Giants was going to be just as dangerous as traveling to the Black Hole. Do we go ahead? asked Commander Malin. She had listened to Ariel explain the possible danger of a major simulant presence in the nebula. I think we have to, Jeremy responded with a deep sigh. We've come this far, and I don't want to turn back without knowing what's in the nebula. I assume Clarissa has informed Rear Admiral Barnes of what might lie ahead, asked Commander Malin. Clarissa and Kelsey are doing that now, Ariel replied. Her eyes seemed to focus sharply for a moment, and then she continued. I don't think Rear Admiral Barnes is pleased. She's asking Clarissa a lot of detailed questions about the simulants and what they might be doing in the nebula. Jeremy looked at the view screens on the front wall of the command center. Most were focused on the stars, and one was showing a magnified view of the nebula, which glowed a light red on the screen. We'll jump in, emplace our equipment, send the probe, and then leave as soon as we can. We could leave the capacitor stations and the vortex generators behind, Ariel was quick to point out. That would reduce our time in the nebula by several hours. It's an option, Jeremy conceded. He didn't really want to leave the equipment, as it had taken several months to construct. Angela, get me the command AI on the comm. I need to inform it of the danger we may be jumping into. The AIs could jump first when we reach the nebula, suggested Kevin, looking over at Jeremy. The distant horizon is better suited for such a jump, Jeremy reminded Kevin, shaking his head at his longtime friend. He knew Kevin had no love for the AIs. Unfortunately, there were many in the fleet that felt the same way. It would take years before the AIs were fully accepted. It was just a suggestion, answered Kevin, turning to check his sensor screens. Eleven friendly green icons were displayed. Four of them were the massive 1,500-meter AI spheres. Once the command AI was on the comm, Jeremy quickly explained the possible danger they might be jumping into. The command AI took a few moments to consult with several of its science AIs and then informed Jeremy they agreed the simulants might have a significant presence in the nebula. They also saw no reason to cancel the mission. Once he was finished speaking to the command AI, Jeremy contacted Rear Admiral Barnes and held a brief conversation with her. All they had at this time was conjecture and no hard evidence the simulants would be in the nebula, but it would be wise to take precautions. What about Grayseth? asked Commander Malin. 
She glanced at one of the view screens, showing the Carthian battleship Warrior's Pride. Contact the Warrior's Pride, Jeremy said to Angela. In moments, Jeremy was explaining to his large friend what might be waiting for them in the nebula. It is the way of the hunt, Graceth boomed over the comm. We must always be prepared for the unexpected. If the simulans are there, we will destroy them. The way of the hunt, Jeremy repeated. He knew his clan brother would always be there beside him. Once he was finished talking to Graceth, Jeremy sent a joint message to the two Alton battleships and the strike cruisers Nemesis and Orion, explaining to their commanders what they might be facing in the nebula. Everyone agreed the mission should continue. The launching of the probe was a high enough priority to justify the risk. Later, Jeremy made his way to engineering to check on Chief Engineer Roger Simpkins. Simpkins was a firm believer in keeping the ship's intricate systems running at top efficiency. Jeremy had found he needed to remind the Chief Engineer to let his people have some time off occasionally. It wasn't unusual to walk into engineering and find competent engineers down on their hands and knees scrubbing the floor. It was a joke on the Avenger that only in engineering were the floors so clean you could eat off them. How's it going, Chief? Jeremy asked as he walked over to a large control console where Simpkins was working. There was a constant hum in the engineering spaces from the steady operation of the fusion reactors and other necessary equipment. Admiral! Simpkins said, standing up and acknowledging Jeremy. These fusion five reactors are fantastic! They're much smaller than our old reactors and put out 40% more power. I think you'll really like what that will mean to the ship's particle beam cannons and power beams. Did you have to make any adjustments in the weapons for the additional power? Some, Simpkins said, nodding his head. We had to increase the protective lining in both weapon systems to handle the increase in energy. How's the hyperdrive holding out? No problems, replied Simpkins, allowing some pride to show in his voice. It's working exceptionally well. And there hasn't even been an iota of variations in the drive's harmonics. Your engineering crew? Simpkins looked down at the deck and then back up at the Admiral. I've been working them hard, he admitted. But I promise, once this mission is over, I'll give them all some well-deserved leave time. Just don't overwork them, cautioned Jeremy. We may need them at their optimum when we reach the nebula. We'll be ready, Simpkins promised. I have the best engineering crew in the fleet. I know you do. Jeremy replied with a smile. He spent a few more minutes in engineering, talking to various crew members, and then left. Jeremy enjoyed walking about the ship and speaking with the crew. Stepping into the officer's mess, Jeremy picked up a tray and selected something light to eat. Most of the food they were consuming now was grown on Gaia, on the farms that had been established. Several herd animals had been selected and were being bred to make their meat more consumable by humans. Sitting down at a table next to the wall, Jeremy thought over what was ahead. Once they reached the nebula, their margin of safety would be gone. The simulants could show up at any time. Deep in thought? asked Ariel, as she suddenly appeared across the table from Jeremy. Her holographic emitters allowed her to appear anywhere in the ship. Jeremy smiled at the gorgeous, dark-haired AI. He was used to her popping up unannounced. This could be a risky mission. I just hope we all get back safely. We will, Ariel replied confidently. After all, both Clarissa and I are here, and we won't let any harm fall to the Avenger or the distant horizon. Jeremy pushed his plate away and gazed seriously at the AI. Ariel, I want you and Clarissa to work out some battle plans with the two of you in command of the Avenger in the distant horizon. You mean you want us to fight the ships? Ariel asked, her dark eyes gleaming with excitement. It wasn't often she got this opportunity. If we get into a jam, it might be our only option to get out, Jeremy answered. You and Clarissa can do things the regular crews can't. I'll tell Clarissa, Ariel said, still showing her excitement. She'll be thrilled at the prospect, though I would suggest you speak to Rear Admiral Barnes about the idea. She wasn't really happy the last time Clarissa took control of the distant horizon. Jeremy nodded in understanding. Kelsey had finally told him about the incident and how she ordered the AI to take control of the ship. It was borderline mutiny, but their actions had saved the distant horizon and allowed it to be rescued. The time passed quickly by, and soon the small fleet jumped back into hyperspace, leaving no evidence in the system they had just left or ever having been there. 
Seven more times the fleet dropped out of hyperspace to allow their drive cores to cool and scan the nebula they were rapidly approaching. The high levels of radiation being given off by the hundreds of blue giant stars were making long-distance observations nearly useless. What do you think? Rear Admiral Barnes asked Andrum, gazing at the view screen and the massive nebula that now dominated space in front of the ship. He had changed the main view screen several times to show different blue giant stars buried deep inside the glowing nebula. Astrometrics is still making observations, Andrum replied. He stood up and took a step closer to the screen. The tall, white-haired Alton was an imposing figure. Using his minicom, he spoke once again to the Alton, who was running the astrometrics department. There's a lot of radiation out there, commented Clarissa from Catherine's left side. We'll have to keep our energy shields up at all times, though at a low level. Our armor isn't enough to protect us, Catherine asked, surprised. She'd thought as thick as the battle armor was, it would protect them from all forms of radiation. For a while, it would, said Clarissa. However, there are areas in this nebula where the high levels of radiation would quickly penetrate our armor. What about our radiation meds? asked Catherine, growing concerned. Should I ask Dr. Keel to have them ready? We could give the crew shots as a precaution. I don't believe it'll be necessary, Clarissa answered. If I see the radiation count is getting too high, we could always move the crew deeper into the ship. The interior areas should be safe for quite some time even if the shield is off. Catherine looked back at Andrum. The Alton scientist was still speaking to the astrometrics department. Damn nebula is impressive, commented Commander Grissom. There's nothing like it in our galaxy. Sixteen hundred light years across, added Colonel Leon. Even here outside the nebula, we're starting to see some of the radiation. I doubt if there are any habitable worlds in this area. The radiation would have long sterilized their surfaces. There are over 200 stars of spectral type O and WR in the central cluster. You may be surprised, Clarissa replied. Life has a way of adapting to even the most virulent environments. It wouldn't be life as we know it, said Commander Grissom. Andrum finished talking to the astrometrics department and returned to sit down next to Kelsey. We have three possible targets. There are none we can detect that are free of radiation. However, the ones we've chosen are emitting lower levels and are a few light years from the other stars in the nebula. Give me the coordinates and I'll see if I can plot a course, Kelsey said. They would have to avoid the heavier radiation areas or risk dropping out of hyperspace. Even areas in the nebula where there were thicker clouds of hydrogen gas would have to be avoided. We may have to make several shorter jumps to reach any of these stars, Andrum informed Kelsey. Do you have a preference? This one, Andrum said calling up a star chart from Astrometrics and showing Kelsey the star he was talking about. It's 600 light years inside the nebula. Wow, Kelsey said, shaking her head at Andrum. You couldn't find one any closer? She didn't like the idea of going so far inside the nebula. She'd thought they'd find one on the outskirts. Not one that was massive enough and with low enough radiation levels, Andrum answered. There are several large hydrogen clouds that are partially shielding the star I've chosen from the radiation from the others. The central cluster of blue giants is where we need to go. Kelsey spent some time working out a navigational path, which would be safe for the fleet. When she finished, she wasn't happy with the results. Five days, she said in exasperation. We have to reduce our speed to nearly half, and we'll have to exit hyperspace eight times to get there. There are a number of areas we have to avoid or we risk becoming stranded in the nebula. I'll inform Admiral Strong, said Rear Admiral Barnes. She had been listening to the conversation with interest. What type of course are you plotting? There are other stars beside the blue giants in the nebula, Kelsey replied. I'm maneuvering our course to allow us to come out of hyperspace in the vicinity of five class M T Tauri stars and three class M. T Tauri stars, repeated Catherine. Her eyes opening wide with concern. Don't they still give off a lot of radiation? Not as much as the Blue Giants, Andrum answered. T. Tauri stars haven't started their hydrogen fusion stage and are powered by gravitational energy generated as the stars slowly contract. There will be some high X-ray emissions and we'll have to watch out for powerful stellar winds. I'll plot exit points far enough out so those shouldn't pose a problem, Kelsey promised. Very well, Catherine said, satisfied with Kelsey's response. 
Captain Travers, get me Admiral Strong on the comm. We have a decision to make. Interesting, commented Commander Malin, as she studied the course Kelsey had plotted on her computer screen. I've never jumped into a Titari star before. There may be protoplanets in orbit, added Ariel, as she studied the data on the stars Kelsey had designated. As long as we stay on the far outskirts of the system, we should be okay. I'm not certain how well our sensors will function in the nebula, Kevin added. On one of the main screens of the command center, the pulsing red nebula glowed ominously. The radiation and hydrogen clouds will have some effect. Can you compensate for the radiation? asked Jeremy, looking over at Ariel. Some, Ariel replied, with a frown appearing on her face. I can set the system to take into account the potential aberrations caused by the radiation. If I do so, it will extend our sensor range, but what the sensors show might not be 100% accurate. Don't modify our short-range sensors, but I do want to extend our long-range sensors to the maximum. What about our special Alton sensors? asked Malin. She was referring to the ones that allowed them to see ten light-years around them even when they were in hyperspace. Unknown, Ariel answered. We'll know once we enter the nebula how the radiation and hydrogen clouds will affect them. Very well, replied Jeremy, knowing they'd done everything they could in preparation. Looking at one of the view screens, he could see the distant horizon being displayed. The 2,600-meter ship looked awesome and quite deadly on the screen. It was comforting to know Rear Admiral Barnes was on the ship along with Kelsey and Katie. The distant horizon was the safest place for them to be. Angela, contact all ships and tell them we'll be jumping in one hour. We'll be relaying the first coordinate shortly. All ships go to condition one 20 minutes prior to exiting hyperspace. Afraid we'll be jumping into a nest of simulants, muttered Kevin, his eyes focusing on Jeremy. Possibly, Jeremy answered. We don't know what lies ahead of us. I want to get to our destination, set up the vortex generators, deploy the probe, and then get back out as quickly as possible. Do we call off the mission if we encounter the simulants? Asked Commander Malin. I don't know, answered Jeremy. The simulant threat was constantly in the back of his mind. We'll deal with that scenario, if and when it occurs. This was something he was greatly concerned about. Once they started deploying the small capacitor stations and the vortex generators, the fleet would be vulnerable to attack. Jeremy was committed to not leaving anyone behind as there would be shuttles deployed from many of the task group ships, aiding in the operation. It would take time to get everyone back aboard their respective ships if the simulan showed up, time they might not have. Time passed as the fleet prepared to jump. Systems were checked and jump coordinates were confirmed. Ready to initiate jump, Ariel informed Jeremy. She was in constant contact with Clarissa and knew her counterpart was ready to depart on their mission. Order the distant horizon to jump. We'll follow, ordered Jeremy, as he took a deep breath and settled back in his command chair. He could sense the heightened level of anxiety in the crew. They were jumping into the unknown, and there was no way to tell what was waiting for them. Distant horizon is jumping, reported Kevin, as his sensors picked up a spike in energy readings. On the main view screen, a blue-white vortex formed in front of the exploration dreadnought. The massive ship accelerated into its center and instantly vanished. Counter is running, reported Commander Malin. Two minutes later, the Avenger and the rest of the ships of the task group followed the distant horizon into their respective vortexes. They were entering the nebula and would soon find out if the simulans were waiting. There was a possibility that some of the task group might never see Gaia again. Chapter 7 The Avenger came out of the spatial vortex in the vicinity of a Class M Titari star. It was a mass of slowly coalescing gas, which someday would become a main sequence star. Jeremy frowned as the view screens on the front wall of the command center remained covered in static. This was a major problem each time they dropped out of hyperspace in the vicinity of one of these stars. Detecting high levels of X-ray and radio emissions, reported Kevin, as he worked diligently at his sensors, trying to clear up the static coming in on his scans. He looked at Ariel in annoyance, as his efforts seemed to be having little effect. One moment, Ariel said, as she began adjusting the ship's systems, as well as the stealth energy shield. 
On the front wall, the screens gradually cleared until all showed views of space. Sensors are not indicating any signs of artificial objects or other ships besides ours in the system, Kevin reported, as the information finally began to come in. There are some areas our sensors are not penetrating due to high levels of radiation and clouds of hydrogen gas being drawn into the star. Communicate that to the other ships, Jeremy ordered. He knew only the distant horizon had the capacity to use all of its sensors normally in these conditions, since it was designed for this type of work. Ariel was doing everything she could to help Kevin operate his sensor console. One more jump, Commander Malin commented as she ordered the ship to go back to Condition 2. Toward the end of each jump, all the ships in the fleet were going to Condition 1, just in case they jumped close to a Simulan ship. So far, it hadn't happened. There had been no sign of the Simulans. Jeremy nodded. The long-range sensors, which normally reached out for 10 light years, had been nearly useless from all the radiation and ionized hydrogen gas in the nebula. Things had gotten worse as they neared the center of the nebula, where most of the blue giants were located. The fleet was traveling through areas where the density of hydrogen gas was lower, as well as the level of radiation. I have the distant horizon on the comm, Angela reported. Kelsey says it will take her a few minutes to confirm the next set of jump coordinates as we'll be jumping into a blue giant system. She also says their sensors confirm this system is clear. We'll have to use our regular defensive shield in the target system if we want to cancel out the effects of the intense ultraviolet radiation, Commander Malin added. The stealth shield is capable of blocking some of it, but not enough. Inform all ships, Jeremy ordered. He knew the distant horizon with its extra thick armor would be the least affected. However, once they started work in the system, the shuttles, capacitor stations, and vortex generators would all be easily detectable by Simulan warships if one happened to enter the system. The work shuttles had been equipped with minimal shields to protect them from the radiation. We'll stay here for one hour. If any ship is having system malfunctions of any kind, we need to know before the hour is up. If not, then we'll jump to the Blue Giant. Angela busied herself at the communications console and then turned back toward Jeremy. Message is sent. The last jump will be 68 light years, Ariel said, as she checked the figures on the navigation computer. At our current hyperspace speed, it will take us 11.3 hours to reach the Blue Giant. How far ahead of us can our long-range sensors scan? Jeremy asked. Only two or possibly three light years, Ariel responded, her dark eyes narrowing slightly. She had learned over the years how to change her facial expressions to mimic normal humans. It will depend on the density of the hydrogen gas we're passing through, as well as the level of interfering radiation being given off by the Blue Giants. Kevin shook his head and gazed at Jeremy. I almost wish we'd gone to the black hole instead. The hour passed and the fleet prepared to jump. On the distant horizon, Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes took a deep breath as the familiar blue-white vortex formed in front of the ship. The crew was anxious, as they knew this jump could bring them into contact with the simulants if they were using the Blue Giants to power some type of intergalactic transfer system. Entering the vortex, reported Lieutenant Stiles from the helm. Catherine tensed slightly as the distant horizon suddenly accelerated forward. She felt a slight twinge in her stomach as the ship made the jump into hyperspace. Looking at the large view screen, which covered the entire front wall of the command center, she saw the comforting colors of swirling deep purple, which signaled they were in the higher dimension, which allowed faster than light travel. All systems functioning normally, Commander Grissom reported. Anne was busy at her command console, checking the various ship departments. Secure from Condition 2 and take us to Condition 4, ordered Catherine as she began to relax. This would allow the majority of the crew to get some rest before they reached their destination. Leaning back in her command chair, Catherine thought over what was ahead of them. She wondered what type of response there would be back home if they were successful in sending the probe through. Thinking about home, her thoughts turned to her father. She knew he would be shaken upon learning she would never be returning to Cirrus. They would spend the rest of their lives apart, living in two separate galaxies. During her career in the fleet, there hadn't been that many opportunities for her to spend significant quality time with her father. She regretted not making more of an effort, as she would never see him again. Taking a deep breath, she decided it was best not to dwell on it.
Relief crew will be reporting in 30 minutes, Commander Grissom informed Catherine. The command crew will report back one hour before emergence at our target star. Very well, replied Catherine, looking over at Anne. Colonel Grissom had served her well since she had come on board the distant horizon. Anne had spent considerable time on the Star Strike, Fleet Admiral Streth's flagship. She was a well-trained officer, and Catherine felt fortunate to have her as a commanding officer of the distant horizon. Anne had been at the Battle of the Galactic Center, as well as most of the other titanic battles fought against the Hawklands and the AIs during the war. She was a seasoned officer and had been tested under fire. Make sure you get some rest too, Catherine reminded her. We have no idea what may be waiting for us when we emerge from hyperspace. Colonel Leon will be reporting shortly with the relief watch, Colonel Grissom replied. I'll return an hour before emergence. Kelsey looked over at Andrum, who was sitting close to her at a science console. What do you think we'll find at the Blue Giant? It had been hard being away from Jeremy since he was on the Avenger and she was on the distant horizon. They did talk regularly each time they dropped out of hyperspace. However, the time being separated reminded her of the years they'd been apart until the distant horizon had managed to make the hyperspace jump to the Triangulum Galaxy. Probably nothing out of the ordinary, Andrum replied as he checked some data on his console. It's a typical blue giant, and I've been on several exploration missions to stars similar to it before. What if the simulants are there? asked Kelsey. This worried her considerably. In their last battle with the simulants, the distant horizon had come very close to being destroyed. If she hadn't taken command and turned the ship over to Clarissa, the ship would have been. Andrum turned and looked over at Kelsey. There's no sense worrying over something that might not happen. He answered, taking a pragmatic view. We'll know for sure when we exit hyperspace. I would suggest for you not to worry. We're on the most powerful ship ever built, by either your people or mine. Why don't you go get some rest? It's been a long day, and we all could use some downtime. You're right, Kelsey said with a long sigh. She turned back to her console to check a few things. As soon as her relief arrived... She would head to her quarters and try to get some sleep. Then later, she would give Katie a call so they could eat together before returning to the command center. Glancing over at Katie's computer console, she saw her friend was deep in conversation with Miko. Clarissa had been listening to the conversation between the two. While she did, she ran battle simulations with her and Ariel in command of the Avenger in the distant horizon. They'd also set up a program to control the strike cruisers Nemesis and Orion. Clarissa was excited about being able to command the ship in combat against the simulants, though she hoped that didn't happen. If it did, then it meant the task group was in a dire situation. Both she and Ariel had sworn to each other they would do everything in their power to protect the Special Five. They would never allow any harm to come to any of them if it was within their power to prevent it. Catherine returned to the command center 50 minutes before the ship was scheduled to drop out of hyperspace. Without surprise, she saw most of the command crew were already at their duty stations. Report, she said, glancing over at Commander Grissom. All systems are operating normally. Long-range scans are only reaching out a little over three light years due to the density of the hydrogen clouds, as well as the intense radiation. This entire nebula is an H2 region. The hydrogen gas is being ionized by the cluster of blue giants we're about to enter. Catherine sat down in her command chair and looked around the large command center. Sensors and communications were just to her right. Damage control and the main computer station were to her left. In front of the command dais and slightly to the side on the left and right were two tactical holographic displays. Helm, navigation, hyperdrive control, and several science stations were in front before the large view screens. The biggest station was tactical, directly behind the command dais on an upraised platform. It was manned by eight officers who controlled the ship's weapons as well as the distant horizon's powerful energy shield. For the next half hour, the operations in the command center were relatively normal. Catherine watched a timer on one of the two tactical displays counting down. When it reached 30, she turned toward Commander Grissom. Take us to condition one. I want Devastator 3s in the missile tubes. We'll hold back on our antimatter missiles until we determine whether there's a threat to the task group. Commander Grissom nodded and instantly sounded the Condition 1 alarm while making the appropriate announcement over the ship's comm. 
Admiral, our long-range sensors are picking up some possible artificial constructs in orbit around the star, reported Captain Reynolds as he worked at his console trying to call up additional information. Catherine's eyes narrowed sharply. What type of constructs? Are we talking about ships? No, I, I don't think so, Reynolds replied. Our sensors are just barely picking them up. The only reason I know they're artificial is because our sensors are detecting ten of them, and they're all in the same orbit spaced an equal distance apart around the star. Andrew, any ideas? Catherine didn't like what she was hearing. Any type of artificial construct probably meant a simulant presence. Andrew looked over at Shiloom, and the two had a quick conversation over their minicoms. Then Andrew turned toward the Admiral. Some type of energy collecting satellites is our best supposition. If the simulans are using the cluster of blue giants to power an intergalactic transfer system, they would need some method of powering their operations. We may be looking at the simulans version of the AI's capacitor stations. We could target them as soon as we exit hyperspace, suggested Major Weir from his tactical console. The Major examined the data on the location of the ten objects. If we make four short hyperspace jumps, we could take out all ten of them with our sublight missiles. Using that tactic, it would take 26 minutes for some of the missiles to reach their targets, warned Clarissa, as she quickly ran several simulations. There is a possibility the energy stations will send out a hyperspace message if one or more of the units stop functioning. Catherine leaned forward in her command chair. They would exit hyperspace five minutes before the rest of the task group. When we depart the vortex... I want the stealth shield activated, she ordered, as well as detailed scans of those objects before Admiral Strong arrives. If we deem they're not a threat, we'll drop our stealth shield and activate our main defense shield to stop the radiation. Our ship's armor will protect us, Colonel Leon informed the Admiral. Petra had managed to take a short break before returning to the command center. We would probably be safe for at least 20 minutes before the radiation begins to penetrate the outer hull. I'll order Dr. Keel to have her radiation meds on standby just in case. The minutes seemed to pass slowly, as all eyes in the command center kept glancing at the countdown timer in the large holographic tactical display. Talking was minimal, as everyone waited for the ship to exit hyperspace. Two minutes to drop out, called out Lieutenant Parker from his hyperdrive console. Tactical standby, ordered Catherine, feeling her pulse beginning to race. Captain Reynolds... I want our sensors scanning as soon as our system stabilize. I'm ready, the captain replied. His fingers flew nimbly over his console as he made some adjustments. Captain Travers, I want a comm link to the Avenger as soon as it exits its vortex. Yes, Admiral, Travers replied. One minute to drop out. Catherine took a deep breath and prepared herself. Were they about to jump into a system controlled by the simulans? And would they shortly be engaged in combat? Clarissa, if you detect an imminent threat to the ship... You have my permission to take whatever actions you deem necessary to prevent the distant horizon from being damaged. Yes, Admiral, Clarissa replied, as she stood a little straighter, surprised at the words. Perhaps the Admiral was beginning to have faith in her ability to defend the ship. Drop out. Catherine felt a twinge in her stomach as the ship returned to normal space. Her eyes instantly went to the main view screen, which was covered in static. After just a few seconds, it cleared. Stealth shield is operational, reported Commander Grissom. Weapons are online and ready to fire, reported Major Weir. Sensors are operating, added Captain Reynolds. We should have good readings on the nearest artificial construct shortly. Communications. Search all channels to ensure no hyperspace message is being transmitted by the objects, ordered Catherine. I have one of the objects on the view screen, Andrum said. On the screen, a large, nearly circular object appeared. It was metallic and covered with what were obviously energy-collecting dishes of some advanced type. How large is that thing? asked Commander Grissom. In many ways, it resembled an AI capacitor station, except the collecting dishes were much smaller. Twenty kilometers, reported Captain Reynolds, as the results from his first sensor scans began coming in. It's also emitting a massive energy signature. Any signs of simulant ships? asked Catherine. It was hard to imagine the simulans would have collecting stations like these around the star, and no warships close by. None detected, answered Reynolds, as more scans came in. It'll be a few minutes before we have the entire system scanned. What about planets? None, reported Reynolds. I'm not even picking up a debris field. No protoplanets or anything, 
Just radiation, uttered Commander Grissom, shaking her head. Not a very hospitable place. I would suggest we stay away from the construct, said Andrum, as he gazed at the object on the view screen. If we come too near, it might send a message to the simulants. Then you believe this is a simulant creation, asked Catherine, her eyes focusing on the Alton. Yes, Andrum replied, his eyes narrowing. It's obviously some type of very advanced energy collection station in close orbit around this star. How does it transmit the energy it collects? Unknown, Andrum answered. We may find out before it's necessary for us to leave. Spatial vortex detected, called out Captain Reynolds. It's the Avenger. Over the next few minutes, all the ships of the task group arrived. They took up position around the distant horizon, and a quick conference was set up for all ship commanders. Admiral Jeremy Strong gazed with deep concern at the object being displayed on one of the ship's main view screens. You mean to tell me there are ten of these in orbit around this star? Yes, Admiral, Rear Admiral Barnes answered. Andrum feels they will not send out a message to the simulants, as long as we don't interfere with them. We should destroy them, boomed Grayseth. They may be scanning us right now. We could have a simulant fleet already en route. They are a danger to the hunt. These objects do indeed resemble our capacitor stations, commented the command AI. My science AIs agree. The objects will not send out a message unless we approach too close or interfere with their operations in some way. I agree with Grayseth, said Commander Zach Davidson of the strike cruiser Nemesis. We have 11 warships. We could destroy all 10 stations before they could send out a message. Possibly, Jeremy said, as he thought over what needed to be done. However, so far we've detected no hyperspace message from the objects. I want to begin immediately to deploy our own capacitor stations and the vortex generators. The sooner we complete our mission and launch the probe, the better off we're going to be. For the next four hours, crews and shuttles worked diligently as the four small capacitor stations containing Fusion 5 reactors were towed out from one of the distant Horizon's flight bays and placed in position. Once the four were aligned and tested, the six vortex ring generators were brought out. It took another two hours to place them and run the necessary tests. During the entire time, all 11 ships stayed at condition one with sensors on full, constantly scanning for any sign of an opening spatial vortex, which might indicate the arrival of a simulant warship. Comm systems were monitoring all hyperspace communication channels in case one of the simulant energy stations sent out a message about the presence of the task group. The space around the small capacitor stations and vortex generators was busy with dozens of small shuttles deployed, even a few humans in Altons and special spacesuits, which protected them from the star's radiation, were jetting around, making minute adjustments to the systems of the capacitor stations and vortex generators. Catherine walked over to Shilum and Andrum, who were standing in front of one of the science consoles monitoring the work. How soon before we can deploy the probe? She was feeling anxious as the time passed. At any moment, she was expecting a simulant warship to show up and bring the work to a halt. Shortly, Andrum replied, we're still making some minor adjustments to align them properly so we can establish an intergalactic vortex, which will link with the black hole at our galaxy center. The gravity inside the cluster and from the star is sufficient to establish an anchor to allow us to open the vortex, even with the hydrogen gas in the surrounding nebula. The probe should come out in the same location as the vortex that sent us here, Shilum explained. I hope Admiral Jackson is still there, Catherine said. He will be, Andrum replied. My people still have many months worth of studies to do on the intact capacitor station. Contact, called out Captain Reynolds, as an alarm began sounding on his sensor console. Spatial vortex opening at 18 million kilometers. Catherine's shoulders slumped. She knew this was going to happen. Simulants, said Commander Grissom, as she went to her command station. She glanced up at the nearest tactical display as a red thread icon began glowing. On the view screen, an 1,100-meter ship suddenly appeared. It was bulbous in form, with large metallic-looking pylons stretched out in front of it. There were six of the massive structures extending for at least 200 meters out from the main hull of the ship. Confirmed, reported Clarissa, as she took her customary place next to the Admiral. It is a simulant escort cruiser, and it's already scanning us. How soon before we can launch the probe? Demanded Catherine. She had a sinking feeling their time had just run out. The simulants had shown up at the worst possible time. 
12 minutes, answered Andrum, as he rushed back to his science console and began touching various icons on the computer screen. Shilum is finishing the last few adjustments to the vortex generators. We'll need a few more minutes after that to maneuver the probe into the vortex. Catherine took a deep breath and activated her Minicom to put her in contact with Admiral Strong. Somehow, they needed to buy 20 minutes of time if they wanted to succeed in their mission. If the simulants managed to knock out even one of the capacitor stations or a vortex generator, the probe wouldn't be able to make transit. Jeremy gazed at one of the primary view screens at the simulant ship, which was now approaching the task group at a high rate of speed. Ariel, you have command of the Avenger, the Nemesis, and Orion. I want that simulant ship destroyed. We need to buy the distant horizon 20 minutes to finish the vortex ring and send the probe through. Yes, Jeremy, Ariel replied, as she accessed the computers on the two strike cruisers. She already emplaced a program, as well as a special hyperspace communications channel, to allow instant communication so she could control all three ships. Preparing for a micro jump, we will come out just in front of the ship and have a window of 6.2 seconds to fire our weapons before their current speed puts them out of range. Do it, ordered Jeremy, as he buckled his safety harness around him. He knew from past experience with Ariel controlling the ship, that they could be in for a rough time. They had to get the probe launched. There was no doubt in Jeremy's mind that if they didn't, they would never get another opportunity. Jumping, reported Ariel, as she concentrated and the blue-white spatial vortexes suddenly formed in front of all three ships. Using their helm controls, she accelerated the warships into the heart of the swirling anomalies. Almost instantly, the three Federation ships appeared in a triangle formation just in front of the rapidly moving simulant vessel. Even so, the computers on the enemy warship reacted, and power was sent to its powerful energy weapons. The tips of the six spires glowed, and then massive beams of white energy speared the nemesis. The strike cruiser's shield had just come up and met the powerful onslaught. The screen glowed bright, and then one of the beams penetrated, blasting a huge hole in the side of the strike cruiser. Emergency bulkheads slammed shut and warning alarms sounded as secondary explosions rattled the ship. From the Avenger and Orion, particle beam cannons and power beams fired, hitting the energy shield of the simulant vessel. Two particle beams penetrated, with one cutting one of the long spires in two, and the second striking just above the ship's engineering section. The simulant ship seemed to stagger, and its sublight drive flickered as power became intermittent. Then three power beams penetrated the weakened shield, blasting huge holes in the bow section and setting off secondary explosions deep inside. Large sections of the ship's hull were blown off to drift away from the vessel. Two seconds remained as Ariel fired a Devastator III missile through a hole in the energy shield caused by the particle beam as the simulant ship flashed by the three Federation vessels. A huge, fiery explosion consumed the ship as the Devastator III missile detonated. Moments later, only a glowing field of spreading debris and gas marked the location of the enemy vessel. Enemy vessel destroyed, reported Ariel, as she checked on the status of the nemesis. The ship had taken major damage but was still operational. There was an attempt at communication via a hyperchannel, but I blocked it. I don't believe the simulants got a message off. What about the nemesis? Jeremy asked with concern in his eyes. On one of the primary view screens, he could see the glowing hole in the side of the ship. The Nemesis had been an important part of Fourth Fleet from the very beginning. It pained him to see the damage the ship had suffered. He knew there had to be numerous casualties. Commander Davidson is checking on the damage and casualties now, Ariel reported. He may need to transfer some of his injured. She was highly disappointed and upset that one of the ships under her command had been damaged. She'd been stunned to see how rapidly the simulants had responded to the micro-jump. She would take that into consideration in future battle scenarios she ran. Can the nemesis still jump? asked Jeremy. He didn't blame Ariel for what happened. She destroyed the simulant ship, and he knew they had powerful weapons. Yes, Ariel replied. The engineering section is still intact. Jump us back to the task group, Jeremy ordered. We need to get that damn probe launched before more simulants show up. I suspect next time it won't be just one ship. Once we're back... We'll make arrangements to transfer some of Commander Davidson's injured to other ships. Capacitor stations are online, reported Shilom, as four icons on her computer screen began blinking green. Powering up the vortex generators, added Miko from her computer station. On her computer screen, the six small vortex generator icons turned from amber to a steady green. Generators are online, 
Katie reported. She was at the computer console next to Miko. Probe is exiting the flight bay, Commander Grissom reported. On one of the view screens, a small, 20-meter wedge-shaped vessel appeared. I've downloaded the visuals and telemetry from the recent battle with the Simulin vessel, Colonel Leon reported. Probe systems are all functioning normally. Stand by to activate the power transfer, ordered Catherine. She'd watched the battle with the Simulin warship tensely, and it felt ill when the Nemesis had been damaged. The Simulans were just too dangerous, and they had technology at least on par with the AIs. The injured hadn't been transferred from the vessel as of yet. They were planning to make a short hyperspace jump to another Titari system, where it would be safe to evacuate the wounded. Catherine had already told Dr. Keel to expect an influx of critically injured. Warning alarms suddenly began sounding on the sensor console. Catherine's eyes shifted instantly to one of the tactical displays, as numerous red thread icons began to appear. She leaned forward and looked over at the sensor console. Simulant vessels at two million kilometers, reported Captain Reynolds. All are battlecruiser size. Catherine let out a deep breath. Battlecruiser size meant the vessels were 1,700 meters in length and much more powerful than the escort cruiser they just destroyed. Our other ships are moving to shield the vortex ring from attack, reported Clarissa. We need to send the probe through now. We don't have the ships to withstand a simulant attack from that many heavy vessels. On the screen, 20 red thread icons were now visible. Activate power transfer, ordered Catherine, leaning forward in her command chair. Stand by on all weapons. We may have to fight. Simulants have turned toward us and are accelerating, reported Captain Reynolds. Contact in six minutes. Can we get the probe through the vortex in that amount of time? Asked Catherine anxiously. Barely replied Andrum with an intense frown. If everything goes right. In space, the four capacitor stations glowed brightly, and energy beams suddenly lanced out, striking the six vortex generators. For a moment, nothing happened, and then a beam of light spread from one vortex generator to the others, until all were connected. The light seemed to spread as the space between the generators became full of swirling energy. Then a signal was sent from the distant horizon, and a white spatial vortex formed. Vortex is established, reported Andrum, as his hands hovered over his science console. Probe is nearing the vortex, added Colonel Leon. Petra held her breath as the wedge-shaped vessels seemed to take forever to reach the swirling area of white light. Then the probe touched the vortex and instantly vanished. Probe has entered the vortex, reported Clarissa, as she used the ship's sensors to closely monitor the proceedings. Simulans will be in range in two minutes reported Captain Reynolds. How long do we have to leave the vortex ring on to ensure safe passage? demanded Catherine. On the main view screen, the swirling white vortex was still evident. Another minute and a half, replied Shiloom. If we shut down before then, the probe could appear anywhere in our home galaxy, or possibly not make it at all. We could be cutting the gravity anchor. Inform Admiral Strong, ordered Catherine, as her breathing quickened. They were going to be cutting it close. Catherine glanced over at the nearest tactical display, seeing the rapidly approaching red thread icon. Stand by on the hyperdrive. Make sure all ships have the emergency coordinates. They'd set up some emergency jump points in case the simulants found them. The nemesis would have to wait to have her injured attended to. Catherine swore to herself, knowing this was going to cost some lives. One minute to combat range, Captain Reynolds said in an even voice. Prepare a spread of Devastator 3 missiles, ordered Catherine. She knew the powerful missiles couldn't bring down the simulant shields, but it might be enough to buy them the time they needed to jump out. Shutting down the vortex ring, Shilum reported. Set the self-destructs, ordered Catherine. There was no way they were going to have time to save any of the valuable units. Are all the shuttles back aboard their respective vessels? Affirmative, answered Clarissa. We have several extra that came on board since they didn't have time to make it to their own ships. Admiral Strong says we're to jump in 20 seconds reported Captain Travers from communications. Set the clock, ordered Commander Grissom. Combat range, called out Captain Reynolds. Simulants are firing. Launch missiles, ordered Catherine, holding her breath. She watched as the countdown timer reached zero. Jump. The ship shuddered as several simulant energy beams struck the shield. Two of the vortex generators exploded as they were targeted. Then all of the other units vanished in brilliant fireballs as their self-destructs activated. A blue-white vortex formed in front of the distant horizon as Lieutenant Stiles accelerated toward it. 
The last thing Catherine saw as the ship reached the vortex was the strike cruiser Nemesis vanishing in a brilliant flash of light as numerous simulans energy beams penetrated its weakened screen, destroying the Federation ship. Catherine's eyes opened wide in shock at the destruction of the Nemesis, and then they jumped into hyperspace. She gazed in relief at the swirling colors of deep purple that signaled they had escaped the simulans. However, Commander Davidson and the 800 men and women under his command were gone. They had launched the probe, but the cost had been very high. Catherine just hoped it had been worth it. Tonight, she would say a prayer for those who had been lost. Chapter 8 We have vortex activation, called out Lieutenant Davis, as a swirling white vortex suddenly appeared on one of the main view screens of the Warhawk. All ships go to Condition 1 and prepare to engage the simulans, ordered Admiral Tolson, as he looked grimly at the view screen. This was what he had been afraid of. He looked over at Lieutenant Travers, wanting more information. Third Fleet had arrived on schedule, and he held it aligned around the perimeter of the vortex. Palel's equipment had arrived several weeks before, and they now had an exact location of the weakened area of space. Race had positioned his fleet within attack range, so as to be able to blast any vessel that came through before it could raise its screens or power up its weapons. Palel says it's definitely intergalactic, reported Lieutenant Travers. Order Admiral Bacall to cover Capacitor Station 1, and Admiral Jackson to do the same for Capacitor Station 2, ordered Race, as he prepared for combat. All civilian ships are to be on standby to evacuate if simulans get past us. Race knew that would leave a lot of people, both human and Alton, trapped on the two capacitor stations. On one of the tactical displays, the 60 ships of 3rd Fleet were in a globe around the intended target. The 60 friendly green icons were all that stood between the incoming simulans and the inhabited worlds of the galaxy. All ships in position and ready to fire, reported Commander Arnett. The hospital ship Raven is moving back to Capacitor Station 1. Race nodded and activated his ship-to-ship -ship minicom so he could speak to Rear Admiral Rance Weiler on the battle carrier Saratoga. Weiler was in command of 3rd Fleet's six carriers. Rance, prepare your bomber squadrons for a shipping strike. They're to take out any damaged simulant vessels that have lost their shields. Squadrons are being armed, Rance replied. Give me 10 minutes and I'll have 400 Anlons ready to launch. Each will be armed with two Shrike missiles. Okay, Race replied. As soon as your first squadrons are ready, go ahead and launch. Don't wait for orders from me. This could get extremely violent quickly. Object is coming through, called out Colonel Cowell, as a wedge-shaped vessel suddenly shot out of the swirling vortex. Hold your fire, screamed Lieutenant Travers, as she received a frantic message from Capacitor Station 1. Shea claims the vessel is one of the Distant Horizon's probes. What? stammered Commander Arnett, with a stunned look on her face. All ships, hold your fire, ordered Race, as he looked in amazement at the 20-meter wedge-shaped vessel on the view screen, which had now come to a complete stop. Admiral Jackson is confirming it's one of the Distant Horizon's probes, added Lieutenant Travers. Her face was nearly white, realizing how close they'd come to destroying it. He's receiving a massive download of data. Holy crap! muttered Colonel Cowell, shaking his head in disbelief. They made it! He looked over at Admiral Tolson. Fleet Admiral Streth was right! Race's attention returned to the vortex, only to see it begin to fade and then abruptly vanish. Take the fleet back to Condition 3 until we find out for sure what's going on. He'd never expected to hear from the distant horizon again, not after speaking to Fleet Admiral Streth. He was anxious to see the data and whether it contained anything about the simulans. Four hours later, Admiral Tolson was sitting in a briefing room on the Dauntless, along with Admiral Jackson, Admiral Bacall, Commander Arnett, and Alton's Shea Melee, and Palel Maz. They had just finished going over the information the probe had transmitted, most of the information they'd just skimmed over, only stopping to examine pertinent sections. Fourth Fleet survived, said Admiral Jackson his eyes wide with excitement. I can't believe most of the ships that went through the vortex made it. I guess this proves Fleet Admiral Streth's faith in Admiral Strong was well justified. A lot of families are going to be relieved, Madeline said. 
There are thousands of personal messages in the files the probe downloaded. Goodbye messages, for the most part, Jackson said with sadness in his eyes. I read a few of them that weren't marked private. They don't expect to ever come back. Rear Admiral Barnes knew there was a possibility of her mission being a one-way trip, Ray said. He knew her father on Cirrus was going to be deeply affected by this. He checked, and there was a long personal message from the Rear Admiral to the Governor. A lot has happened since the Fourth Fleet and the others made the transit to the Triangulum Galaxy, Madeline added. They fought several intense battles against the Simulants, and the distant horizon was nearly destroyed. But the AIs, Ray said in a bitter voice. He was still finding it hard to digest the information that Admiral Strong had made a pact with the deadly automatons. So many people had died in the battle at the Galactic Center that it was nearly incomprehensible to consider making the AIs an ally. They've changed, Shay said, as she pointed to some data on one of the numerous screens, which were on in the briefing room. We know the Simulans adjusted the AI's Master Codex to begin with, which set them on their path to galactic domination and the elimination of all organic races. From what I've been able to learn in the files, Kareen and Miko have removed that programming from the AI's Master Codex and from the AIs themselves. They are no longer a threat. The Master Codex survived, said Race worriedly. There were only two, and one was safely under Federation and Alton control on Astral. We had assumed the other was on the Central Nexus, which was destroyed. With an intact Master Codex, they could create more AIs. Admiral Cletius will not allow that to happen if he believes they could still be a threat, stated Admiral Bacall in his soft voice. The Alton looked at the others. The information Kareen and Miko have provided states specifically that the AIs are no longer a threat and have placed themselves completely under Admiral Strong's command. There were four Alton science vessels that went through originally, plus other Alton scientists and specialists on the distant horizon. I'm certain they will not risk creating more AIs without the proper safeguards in place. He needs those ships, added Admiral Jackson solemnly. They're hiding in a nebula and are building up their defenses around a habitable planet. If they hope to survive, they'll need the AIs. Admiral Tolson turned and looked long and hard at one of the view screens. It showed a simulant battle cruiser which bristled with power. He shook his head slowly. This AI thing was going to take a while to get used to. He suspected it would be heavily frowned on back at Fleet Command. Race let out a deep breath and shook his head. The probe brought back a lot of data, Hillel said. It will take us days, perhaps weeks, to go through it all. Admiral Strong took a huge risk just to send the probe to us, Race said in an even voice. His fleet was detected, and the nemesis heavily damaged and just taking out one simulant vessel. What would happen here if a fleet of those things came through? We would give a good accounting of ourselves, Jackson said, his eyes focusing on race. But in the end, I don't believe we could stop them, not if they were making a determined effort to establish a bridgehead in our galaxy. Can they establish a vortex anywhere else besides here? asked race, looking over at Shea. He was deeply concerned about the simulants coming through in another star system where they would face no organized resistance. It would take a tremendous amount of energy to shift the vortex from this region of space, Shea replied. The weakness of space where the runaway vortex originally appeared will attract any intergalactic vortexes for quite some time. Will it eventually heal itself? asked Race. He knew the Alton scientists back on Astral had voiced their opinion that it might not. Yes, our recent research suggests that it will, admitted Shea, looking unhappy. It will take a few decades, but at some point they will be able to shift the entry vortex with little effort. Race leaned back and thought deeply to himself. Fleet Admiral Streth had been correct about the danger present in the Triangulum Galaxy. The question was, what were they going to do about it? Under the Fleet Admiral's direction, Race had set plans into motion but was deeply concerned they were not enough. From the small amount of data he'd skimmed through, the simulants were a far greater danger than the AIs ever were. How were the Federation and its allies going to react to that? I want this data sent to Ambassador Terrain, Fleet Admiral Nagumo, Governor Barnes, Senator Carnes, Malraz on Carath, and Senator Arden on New Providence. 
Should we send any recommendations? Asked Admiral Jackson. No, replied Race, shaking his head. We'll wait for a response from Fleet Admiral Nagumo. I'll have the data packets prepared and sent immediately, uttered Admiral Jackson. Is there anyone else? Jackson looked over at Admiral Tolson with a knowing look. One more person, Ray said, meeting Jackson's eyes. I'll take care of that myself. I want a copy of this data packet for everyone in this room. This is a high security file, and it's not to be sent to anyone else without my explicit permission. If news were to get out in the Human Federation of Worlds that we're facing a potential intergalactic threat, even worse than what the AIs were, it could cause a general panic. We'll let Admiral Nagumo decide what the Federation Council needs to know and how this information is going to be handled. It could indeed cause a panic on all civilized worlds, Admiral Bacall said, nodding his head in agreement. With your permission, I would like to send a copy of this information to Garrick Rath on Astral. With the scientists currently on the planet, they may be able to give us some insights as to the simulant's technology. I will stress the information is not to leave the planet. Send him the information, Ray said. It would be good to have the Altons look over the data Admiral Strong sent back. His next problem was what to do about the weakened area in space where the vortex would form when the simulants came through in force. There was no doubt in his mind the simulants were coming, and he only had his fleet, Admiral Jackson's ships, and Admiral Bacall's to stop them. If they failed, then the simulants would be loose in the galaxy and might very well finish what the AIs had started, the total annihilation of all organic life. Several days later, former Fleet Admiral Heaton Streth received a priority message from Admiral Tolson. He spent hours in the small building behind his cabin, reading through the report and the implications of what it contained. Admiral Tolson had been good enough to prepare a synopsis of what was in the data, as Heaton knew it would take him days to wade through all of the information. Is it from Race? A female voice asked from the doorway of the small office Heden was in. Heden turned around to see Janice standing there. She looked radiant and as beautiful as ever. She was also four months pregnant. Yes, Heden replied with a deep sigh. Rear Admiral Barnes linked up with Admiral Strong, just as I had hoped. Jeremy has set up a base inside a concealing nebula that contains a habitable planet. Then they have a home said Janice, as she walked over to stand next to Heden. I'm glad to hear they're safe. They're in a very dangerous galaxy, Heden responded in a quiet voice. They have no way to return. Just as your visions foretold. Yes, answered Heden, wishing his visions had been wrong. They were hard enough to interpret as it was. There had also been no further occurrences. In a way, it was a relief as the splitting headaches were nearly unbearable. What are you going to do? Janice knew Heden had to have a plan. He felt it was his personal responsibility to keep the human race and its allies safe from harm. She doubted Heden would ever willingly give up that weight he carried on his shoulders. It was one of the reasons she'd married him. I want to spend some more time going through all this data Jeremy sent. We have several courses of action, none of which are good. Fortunately, most of his ships survived the transit. He also wanted to spend some time studying the alliance Jeremy had formed with the AIs. It had left a sour taste in his mouth when he read about it, but the more he'd studied why Jeremy had made that incredible decision, the more he understood the reasoning behind it. I'm sure you'll figure something out, Janice said, reaching out and placing her hand on Heaton's shoulder. You always do. How are you feeling today? Janice had been experiencing some minor morning sickness, though nothing which couldn't be controlled with simple medication. Fine, Janice replied with a smile. The doctor said everything looked normal. Have you told Amanda? Yes, Janice said with a laugh. She's excited about our news and plans on being here when the baby's born. How's her daughter doing? Fine. I think Amanda loves being a mom. I'm not surprised, Heaton said. She was the best admiral I had. I'm sure she'll put the same effort in being a mother. Janice could tell Heaton was anxious to get back to studying Jeremy's information. Dinner will be ready shortly. I'll keep it warm for you if you need more time. Thanks, Heaton said, standing up and giving Janice a quick kiss. I'll be in soon. Heaton watched as Janice left, closing the door behind her. 
Taking a deep breath, he watched one more time the quick battle between Jeremy's three ships and the Simulan escort cruiser. He winced as the nemesis was hit, knowing human lives had been lost. From the tactics of the three Federation ships, Heaton was almost certain Ariel was involved. He was saddened to know he would never speak to the two AIs again. They'd developed interesting personalities over the years. Letting out a deep breath, he looked down at some notes on his desk. Somehow or another, he needed to get help to Jeremy and more ships to Admiral Tolson. He looked at the list of people Tolson had sent copies of the data to. There were several more who needed to be apprised of the danger that might soon be coming their way. It was time to send out more hyperspace messages and hope his words of concern would be listened to. At the moment, he didn't have a single ship under his command. Deep in the Triangulum Galaxy, in the cluster of blue giants, the Avenger and her task group had stopped at a T Tori star, still reeling from the loss of the Nemesis. Status? Jeremy asked as he let out a deep sigh. It had been four days since the loss of the strike cruiser. He didn't think he would ever get used to losing people under his command. We're clear. No contacts, Kevin answered as he looked closely at his sensors. All other ships of the task group have exited hyperspace. This was their second hyperspace dropout since withdrawing from the Blue Giant system. It still galled him that they had to leave all that valuable equipment behind. He'd witnessed its destruction on the ship's view screen as part of it was destroyed by simulan energy beams and the rest by the nuclear self-destructs they contained. The simulans would learn nothing from the wreckage. Jeremy, Admiral Barnes is requesting we stay here for several hours. Andrum is asking to be allowed to make some astrometric scans of an anomaly they're detecting deep in the Blue Giant Cluster, reported Angela, as she listened to the message from the distant horizon. How? asked Commander Malin, looking confused. Their long-range sensors are nearly as limited as ours from the ionization of the nebula and the radiation. They have astronomical instruments they can use, Ariel explained. The astrometrics department on the distant horizon is capable of penetrating the radiation and even the less dense areas of the hydrogen. You must remember, while the ship is indeed a dreadnought, it is also designed as an exploration ship. Graceth wants to know when we'll be jumping, Angela added, as several more messages came across her console. He's worried the simulans will be searching for us. Jeremy activated his ship-to-ship -ship minicom so he could speak to all the commanders at once, including the AIs. We'll be staying in this system for two hours to allow the distant horizon to investigate an anomaly they've detected. The task group is in no danger at this time. Once the two hours are up, we'll resume jumping back toward Gaia. Two hours, Commander Malin said, sounding concerned. We know the simulans are bound to be hunting for us. Keep the task group at condition too, Jeremy ordered, fully in agreement with Kyla. He was certain the simulans were searching all the blue giants for any signs of the task group and would shortly expand their search to other stars. He was also curious about the anomaly Andrum had detected. He strongly suspected the venerated Alton scientist wouldn't be putting the task group at risk without a good reason. What type of anomaly is Andrum investigating? asked Commander Malin, looking over at Ariel. Clarissa says it's at the heart of the cluster of the Blue Giants, and is giving off more energy than the entire cluster combined. What can possibly do that? asked Kevin, arching his eyebrow. Is there a black hole in the center? Dark energy, answered Ariel, her eyes narrowing as she ran several simulations to take into account the energy variation the distant horizon was reporting. Dark energy comprises about 70% of the known universe, and dark matter about 26%. Dark energy is a property of space and is what's making the universe expand at an ever-increasing rate. It's explained by Einstein's cosmological constant. Knew I shouldn't have skipped that course at the academy, muttered Kevin. Dark energy and dark matter still aren't understood very well, Commander Malin commented. The Altons may have a better understanding since they've made more observations along those lines than we have. I just wonder why it's here, said Jeremy, not liking where his thoughts were going. What if the simulants have found a way to harness dark energy? Asked Commander Malin, with concern in her voice. It would be a very powerful energy source, one that could possibly power an intergalactic network of spatial vortexes, Ariel said, as she calculated the energy the simulants might be able to draw. 
Such power would allow them to make regular transits between galaxies, much more so than what the Blue Giants provide. Or send an invasion fleet, responded Jeremy, worriedly. He looked up at a view screen, which was focused on the distant horizon. He wondered just what Andrum was studying. He had a feeling he wasn't going to like it. Katie was standing next to Kelsey as they listened to Andrum and Shilum arguing over what Astrometrics was reporting. Miko had helped run some computer simulations, which involved some higher math that was way above anything Katie was familiar with. Even Clarissa was confused by what the Altons were discussing. I don't like this, Katie said nervously. Every time we find something new, it's always bad. She wished Kevin were here, but he was on the Avenger with Jeremy and Angela. We're safe for now, Kelsey answered reassuringly. I already have the next two sets of jump coordinates programmed into navigation. Katie nodded. The main view screen was showing a simulation from Astrometrics of what was in the center of the blue giant star cluster. It was an area of nothingness. No light, no radiation. Nothing. Just a dead area. She felt a cold shiver spread across her shoulders. That area of darkness frightened her. She had a feeling something terrifying was going to happen there, which would affect her for the rest of her life. Dark energy, she Loom said, running her slim right hand through her white hair. I don't believe the simulants are advanced enough to harness it as a power source. Even our own scientists are years away from such a venture. But we're not on a war footing like the simulants are, countered Andrum. Most of our people are pacifists. And while there is a thirst for knowledge, it's not driven as it may be with the simulans. Shilum looked down at her computer screen and the region of nothingness it displayed. That area's nearly three light years across. It's full of both dark energy and dark matter. Andrum nodded his head. It can't be a natural occurrence. But how? demanded Shilum. It would take a tremendous power source to even attempt to tap dark energy. Even with our Fusion 5 reactors, we couldn't come close to the power needed. They have the power source, pointed out Andrum, gesturing toward the main view screen, showing some of the blue giant stars. Most were hidden by clouds of hydrogen gas. The energy collectors we found around the blue giant star, uttered Shilum, as she considered the ramifications you think they have such a system set up around all of them? I do, Andrum replied. Shilum spent a long minute gazing at the screen before shifting her gaze back to Andrum. We need to find out what's there. If they're using dark energy as a power source, they could travel anywhere they want in the nearer galaxies. It would also imply their technology is on a level with ours, if not slightly higher. Alton's science was supreme in the home galaxy, but it was becoming rapidly apparent it might not be supreme in this one. Andrum nodded in agreement. This may be our only chance. I'll speak with Rear Admiral Barnes and see if we can divert the distant horizon for a little side trip. They want to do what? exploded Jeremy, staring in disbelief at Ariel. Ariel looked unabashed at Jeremy. The Alton's on board the distant horizon want to take the ship to the center of the Blue Giant Cluster to investigate an area of dark energy and dark matter the simulants might be using to power an intergalactic spatial vortex system. We can't let them do it, said Commander Malin, shaking her head in denial. The simulants are already looking for us, and it would be too dangerous to travel deeper into the cluster. Hell, we may have a hard enough time just escaping from the nebula. Kevin looked over at Jeremy. We've already lost the nemesis. We could lose the entire task group if we do this. Not the entire task group, Ariel said softly. Only the distant horizon. The Exploration Dreadnought is the only ship that might be able to reach the center of the cluster and get out without being detected. The ship's also powerful enough to defend herself if necessary. Jeremy leaned back in his command chair and let out a deep breath. He closed his eyes briefly as he thought over the dangers of sending the distant horizon on this mission alone. He tried to keep his personal feelings out of it, since Kelsey and Katie were aboard the ship. Opening his eyes, he realized he didn't have a choice. If this area of dark energy was where the simulans were conducting their intergalactic operations, he needed to find out. You're going to do it, aren't you? Kevin said, 
his eyes narrowing accusingly. Katie and Kelsey are aboard that ship. I know, replied Jeremy, with an ache in his heart. If we send more ships, it will only endanger their mission. I have Rear Admiral Barnes on the comm, Angela reported. Jeremy activated his minicom, having reached a decision. He felt the lonely weight of command on his shoulders. He was going to approve the mission, even though he was putting his wife and Katie in jeopardy. There would be a number of sleepless nights waiting for the exploration dreadnought to return. Admiral Barnes, I understand you have a request you want to make, Jeremy began with a deep sigh. He didn't look over at Kevin, knowing his best friend was deeply concerned for the danger his wife was about to be placed in. Jeremy just hoped he was making the right decision, sending the distant horizon. If something were to happen to the ship, he would never forgive himself, and it would also probably cost him his best friend. Chapter 9 The distant horizon came out of its sixth hyperspace jump on the outskirts of a blue giant system. It was the closest star to the area of dark matter and dark energy the ship had detected earlier. The rest of the task group was waiting at the Titari star for the ship's return once its clandestine mission was completed. Get me a status report, ordered Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes, as the ship's system began coming online. The brief hesitation in the ship's systems due to exiting the vortex always made her feel uneasy. The ship will stay at Condition 1 until further notice. She saw on her command console that the stealth shield had activated and was functioning normally. They'd come out far enough so the shield and the ship's thick armor would protect them from the intense radiation from the star. The system is relatively free of hydrogen, commented Commander Grissom, as she gazed at some of the screens on her command console. Data was scrolling over them from the short-range sensors. Our scan should be able to cover the entire system. What about our long-range sensors? Still blocked by the dark matter, Andrum answered as he turned around from his science station. We don't have anything that can penetrate it. What will happen if we try to enter the area using our hyperdrive? That's unknown, Shilum responded, her forehead creasing in a frown. We have no experience using hyperdrives under such conditions. There may be a way to find out, commented Clarissa. She'd been doing some calculations and had come up with several interesting facts. The simulant energy collecting stations probably use a spatial vortex to transmit the energy they've gathered to this area of space. If they have a way to safely use hyperspace to transmit energy, we should be able to use the same method for the distant horizon. I have the results of our first scans, reported Captain Reynolds. There are ten simulant energy collection stations around the star. I'm also detecting what appear to be two simulant warships in the same orbit as the stations. They may have sent these ships to all the Blue Giant systems to protect these stations after detecting our presence, added Colonel Leon. I'm sure the simulants are concerned about our being here in the Blue Giant cluster. Unfortunately, they might be able to detect us if they noticed the energy surge when our exit vortex formed, Catherine said worriedly. Helm, turn us 180 degrees starboard, three-quarters sublight. I want to put some additional distance between us and the simulants. Admiral, we need to continue to observe this system, Andrum said. If Clarissa is correct, and I believe she is, all we need to do is wait for these stations to activate a vortex and see if we can detect its endpoint. Catherine looked over at the nearby tactical display showing the system. No planets or asteroids were visible. All the display was displaying were 12 glowing red thread icons. Two had triangles around them, designating simulan warships. So far, there had been no obvious reaction to their entering the system. There was a possibility that due to how near the star the simulan ships were, their sensors might be affected by the intense radiation and they hadn't detected the appearance of the hyperspace vortex. Continue on course, ordered Catherine. As long as the simulans gave no signs of having detected the distant horizon, she was willing to risk staying in the outskirts of the system. We are able to scan 50% of the area around the dark matter, Clarissa reported. Our scans can't penetrate even the outer regions, but if a spatial vortex forms in close proximity to the area, we should be able to detect it. So what now? asked Colonel Leon, shifting her gaze from the tactical display to the Admiral. We wait, replied Catherine, folding her arms over her chest. 
We'll stay at Condition 1 for another hour. If there's no response from the simulants, we'll go down to Condition 3. Clarissa, if we're at Condition 3 and the simulants attack, you have control of the ship. She knew the AI could go from Condition 3 to Condition 1 in an instant, where it would take the crew several minutes to get to their combat stations. Clarissa nodded. It pleased her immensely that the Admiral was trusting her so much. I can't believe we're separated from Kevin and Jeremy again, complained Katie to Kelsey over their private comm channel. Clarissa kept a secure channel between the three of them open at all times. I know, Kelsey replied. I'm sure Jeremy wasn't pleased about us being on this mission. No special treatment. Clarissa reminded the two of them. That was one of the conditions both of you agreed to in order to stay on the distant horizon. What Clarissa didn't mention was that she would give preferential treatment to the two women any time she felt it was necessary, even if it meant going against Rear Admiral Varn's orders. Ariel would do the same for Jeremy, Kevin, and Angela. We know, answered Katie with a sigh. We just didn't expect to be going on a mission like this one. I'll protect you, Clarissa declared. You have nothing to fear. We know you'll keep us safe, Katie said. Every day, Clarissa sounded more and more like the old Clarissa. There'd been a time after her memory crystal had been damaged, when Katie doubted that would ever happen. Kelsey looked in front of her at the massive view screen, which covered the front wall of the command center. It was currently focused on the dark matter nebula, and all it showed was an area of emptiness where there should be stars. It's frightening to look at, isn't it? commented Andrum, glancing over at Kelsey. I've never seen anything like it before, Kelsey replied. In all of my studies at the Academy and my time with the fleet, we've never encountered dark matter or dark energy that might be dangerous. We know it's there, it's everywhere, but it's so spread out that it has no effects on hyperspace travel. That we're aware of, Andrum reminded her. Shilom believes dark matter may play a limiting role in how fast our ships can travel in hyperspace. Kelsey looked over at Andrum in confusion. There were some very complicated mathematical formulas used to compute hyperspace jumps. Do you mean to tell me the hyperspace formulas take into account the effects of dark matter? You know the swirling deep purple colors we see while we're in hyperspace. Yes, Kelsey answered. They're comforting in some ways, since we can't be attacked. They're also frightening because no one really knows what causes them. Shilum believes it's the interaction of hyperspace upon dark matter at faster than light speeds which causes the colors. I'm sure you've noticed that when the distant horizon is traveling at top speed, the colors seem more turbulent. Kelsey nodded. She had noticed that. What about dark energy? What does it do? Andrum hesitated. We're not sure. Dark energy is a property of space. As the universe continues to expand, more dark energy comes into existence. The spatial vortexes we create tear a hole in space and pushes the dark energy away. That's one reason why vortexes collapse so rapidly. Once we quit applying energy, dark energy rushes back in and fills the void we briefly created. Kelsey's eyes return to the view screen. What does it mean if the simulants have learned how to harness dark matter or dark energy? We could be in serious trouble, Andrum said, his face taking on a troubled look. My own people are years away from such a feat. The simulants are indeed that advanced. They're using a power we can only dimly grasp. Kelsey leaned back in her chair, lost in thought. If Andrum was right, then it would be wise for them to return to Gaia and never venture forth into the Triangulum Galaxy again. In their early battles with the Simulans, they had been fortunate to survive. But now, the Simulans would have a basic understanding of the capabilities of the Lost Fleet ships, even though there had been changes. She was aware there were even some new ship designs being planned. When they returned to Gaia, she intended to have a long talk with Jeremy. She wanted to know exactly how safe he thought they were in the nebula. Rear Admiral Barnes was an engineering Jalot, the assistant chief engineer. Jalot was an Alton and very knowledgeable about the ship's hyperdrive, as well as the Fusion 5 reactors. He'd helped in the design of the new hyperdrive. So you don't believe the simulants are opening up a vortex in the center of the area of dark matter? 
Catherine asked. The two had been discussing the mysterious area of space at the heart of the blue giant cluster for several minutes. Betram slowly shook his head. He was slightly taller than Catherine and could be considered short for an Alton. Most Altons were easily over six feet tall. I don't think it's possible, he answered. It would take a tremendous amount of energy. I can't even estimate how much without getting into some serious hyperspace mathematics. Catherine was growing more confused. She was beginning to believe this mission was a serious mistake. If you couldn't travel in hyperspace through the dark matter, then how could the simulants be using it to power a network of intergalactic portals? Then the simulants can't be opening up vortexes inside the dark matter area, she said, trying to understand what Betram was telling her. Not regular spatial vortexes, Betram replied, his eyes narrowing. You misunderstand. An intergalactic vortex uses a higher band of hyperspace for travel. It's how we can get such tremendous speeds to make a transit seem almost instantaneous. The higher bands take a vast amount of energy to access, and the dark matter will have a smaller effect. With enough power to open up a spatial vortex to travel at the higher levels, it would be possible to travel through hydrogen nebulas, even densely packed ones, such as what we have here at NGC 604. Catherine nodded. She vaguely understood what Betram was telling her. She would ask Andrum or Shilum for more details later. For now, she was satisfied the mission needed to continue. Whatever was at the center of the area of dark matter, the distant horizon and its crew had to find out. Admiral Barnes, please return to the command center. Commander Grissom spoke over the ship's comm system. We have detected a spatial vortex in the system. Catherine flipped her minicom on and replied, On my way. It had been two days since they'd arrived at this blue giant system. Catherine had begun to wonder just how long it would be before the energy collectors in the system activated. They couldn't hang around forever. Every hour they stayed increased the risk of detection. After taking several turbo lifts and walking through the short corridor to the command center, Catherine stepped inside to find a much higher level of activity than when she'd left. Report, she ordered as she approached her command chair. One of the energy collectors formed a spatial vortex 12 minutes ago, replied Commander Grissom as she stepped over closer to the Admiral. It's generating a tremendous amount of energy. Andrum and Shilum feel all ten collecting stations are linked through hyperspace in some way. They haven't been able to detect how, but the amount of energy being sent into the vortex seems to validate that belief. Where's the energy going? asked Catherine. Perhaps now they could find a way into the dark matter region. Here, Captain Reynolds answered, as he activated one of the tactical hologram displays. On one edge of the dark region, a red icon was flashing. That's the emergence point. It's 6.7 light years distant from our current location. Catherine looked over at Kelsey. Plot a jump for us. Maximum hyperdrive speed. Commander Grissom, take the ship to condition one. Let's see if we've found a way into the dark matter region. Commander Grissom nodded. Almost instantly, alarm sounded, and the condition one announcement was made. The anxiety in the command center increased as the crew realized they were probably about to jump into close proximity to the simulants. There was no way to know what might be waiting for them when they exited the vortex. Hyperspace jump plotted, and the course has been sent to the helm, Kelsey reported. Due to the lower levels of gas in the area, we can travel at 1.2 light years every three minutes. It will take us 17 minutes to reach our destination. Hyperspace is charged and ready for activation, reported Lieutenant Parker. Let's go find us some simulants, ordered Catherine, feeling her pulse begin to race. Lieutenant Parker, activate the hyperdrive. Lieutenant Stiles, take us into the vortex. The ship suddenly charged ahead as a swirling blue-white vortex formed. The distant horizon flashed up to the vortex and entered its center. Moments later, the vortex collapsed, leaving no sign of the ship. Back in the Titari system, Kevin watched his sensors anxiously. So far, the simulants hadn't located them, and there was still no sign of the distant horizon. It'll be several days yet before they're back, Ariel said, seeing the stress on Kevin's face. Clarissa is with them, and she'll keep Katie and Kelsey safe. I know she will, answered Kevin, forcing a smile. I just can't help worrying about them. Kevin's biggest fear was the simulants finding the task group before the distant horizon returned. If that happened, then the exploration dreadnought would be on its own, 
for the return trip to Gaia. Rear Admiral Barnes is an excellent officer, Commander Malin added. Malin had overheard the conversation between Kevin and Ariel. She demonstrated that, getting the distant horizon safely to us. I'm sure she can handle anything the simulants might throw at them. If not, she can always run away. The Exploration Dreadnought is the fastest ship in our fleet. Ariel placed her hand on her hips and nodded. Jeremy would never have let them go if he thought any harm would come to the ship or its crew. Kevin let out a deep sigh as his eyes stayed focused on his sensor screens. Nine green icons showed the disposition of the task group. The Avenger was in the center of a small globe of warships. His eyes were drawn to one of the icons, which was Graceth's flagship, the Warrior's Pride. Jeremy had gone over to the ship to meet with Graceth. On the Warrior's Pride, Jeremy was in the midst of a long conversation with his friend and fellow clan member, Graceth. They were discussing the ramifications of what would happen when the information they'd placed in the computer of the Alton Probe reached the Federation. My people will do everything in their power to try to come to our aid, Graceth boomed in his loud, rumbling voice. Once Malrez discovers we're still alive, he will throw all the might of Kareth into mounting a rescue effort. But they don't have the power to send a major fleet through, pointed out Jeremy, shaking his head. They have a single capacitor station, and it's too dangerous to send one or two ships at a time. The simulans would pick them off as soon as they emerge from the vortex. My people will find a way, Graceth said, reaching out and putting one of his large hands upon Jeremy's shoulder. It is the way of the hunt and of the clans. My people will never abandon us. Nevertheless, when we return to Gaia, there will be no more trips outside the nebula, Jeremy said with determination in his voice. We'll keep a couple of stealthed AI ships in a gas giant nearby to monitor the Sigma system for any signs of a vortex. Other than that, we won't be sending any ships outside of the nebula for the foreseeable future. While Jeremy thought the odds of additional ships coming through the intergalactic vortex were low, it might be wise to continue to monitor the system in case the Federation sent its own message probe through. Graceth was silent for a moment as the large bear eyed his human friend. It is a wise decision. I fear if we continue the hunt, our forces will gradually be reduced to the point where we might not be able to defend Gaia. It is a good world, and our people will do well there. Someday, when we are stronger, we will return to the hunt and drive the simulans from this galaxy. Someday, Jeremy responded. If that day were to come, it would be far in the future. Jeremy doubted if he would live long enough to see it. Catherine felt a wrenching sensation in her stomach as the distant horizon dropped out of hyperspace. For a brief moment, all of the systems in the ship hesitated as the effects of exiting the spatial vortex spread through the exploration dreadnought. Then the systems came back online and the stealth energy shield snapped into existence, hiding the ship from detection. Status! All systems are online and working at optimum levels, Commander Grissom answered as she checked her command console and listened to the different departments report in over her minicom. Sensors. Activated, replied Captain Reynolds. Contacts! Catherine's eyes narrowed sharply. What do we have? A massive structure at 12 million kilometers, Reynolds answered. The damn thing is over 700 kilometers in diameter. That's bigger than the AI's central nexus, Colonel Leon gasped her eyes widening in disbelief. On the large view screen, a highly magnified view of the construct appeared. It was a massive globe with giant energy collector dishes in a circle around its midsection. Large antennas and other constructions covered the other areas of its surface. It's heavily armed, reported Clarissa, as she analyzed the data coming in from the sensors. There are hundreds of large energy cannons in six concentric rings around the station. With the power I suspect they have available, we don't dare approach too close to those weapons, added Andrum, as he looked at some of the data. The energy beams could easily penetrate our main energy shield. Look at the screen, said Commander Grissom excitedly. Everyone's eyes shifted to the screen to see a small vortex open and a beam of energy shoot out to strike one of the large dish collectors. For a full minute, the vortex stayed open. Then the beam stopped and the vortex closed. There's a path through the dark matter cloud, reported Captain Reynolds as he studied his sensor data. It extends all the way to the center. Plot a jump, 
ordered Catherine, taking a deep breath. She might be putting the ship in danger, but the only way to find out what was in the dark matter cloud was to reach its center. Clarissa, I'm going to need some help, said Kelsey, as she examined the data on her computer screen. The tunnel reached all the way to the center of the dark matter cloud. It was 1.6 light years long and seemed to end in an open area free of dark matter. However, the tunnel was only 12 million kilometers in diameter. The ship would have to travel down the corridor. If it touched the walls of dark matter during its trip through hyperspace, the distant horizon could be violently thrown out of that higher dimension and be seriously damaged or even destroyed. Kelsey began setting up the necessary hyperspace equations, and with Clarissa's help, soon had a course plotted. Once she was satisfied they could safely travel through the tunnel, she turned toward Admiral Barnes. The course is set, but I should warn you. If we encounter a simulan vessel coming down the corridor, we could be thrown into the dark matter wall. Also, if that huge energy collection station activates a vortex and releases its energy into hyperspace through the corridor, the ship could be destroyed. I've plotted our course over to one side and perilously close to the dark matter wall to reduce the possibility of that happening. Any signs we've been detected? Catherine was concerned the simulants might have detected the distant horizon when the ship exited the spatial vortex. I'm detecting six simulant battle cruisers and ten escort cruisers near the station, reported Captain Reynolds, as he looked worriedly at the red thread icons that were now showing up on one of the tactical displays. Four of them are breaking orbit from around the energy collection station and seem to be heading in our direction. Probably detected our exit vortex, Commander Grissom said, as she and her eyes focused intently on the tactical display. They didn't need to get in a battle with the simulans if they could avoid it. Take us into hyperspace, ordered Catherine. They were committed now. Instantly, in front of the distant horizon, a swirling blue-white vortex formed. Lieutenant Stiles sent the ship hurtling rapidly toward its center, with some unknowing aid from Clarissa. Their course had to be dead on when they hit the vortex, and she was making sure it was. The trip down the corridor was harrowing for the crew in the command center. They knew at any moment they could encounter a simulant ship coming from the opposite direction. If they did, the ship could be knocked out of hyperspace into the dark matter wall. Even if they survived it would only be a matter of a few minutes before simulant ships arrived in the area. A few moments after entering hyperspace, the distant horizon flew out of the exit vortex. Full stop, ordered Catherine, as the systems came online and warning alarms began to sound. Her eyes focused on the large view screen, but all it was showing was darkness. There was no light, no sign of other ships, just a vast, empty nothingness. Where are we? asked Colonel Leon. Petra had never seen anything like this before. It was a frightening sensation not to be able to see any light. Inside a dark matter cloud, uttered Commander Grissom grimly. I'm picking up numerous simulant ships, hundreds of them, warned Captain Reynolds, as red thread icons began to appear on the tactical display. Our stealth shield? inquired Catherine. With that many ships, the simulants would detect them quickly if the shield wasn't working. It's up, Clarissa answered. However, I would recommend moving away from the exit point, as the simulants might have detected the vortex. Move us away at two-thirds sublight, Catherine ordered, as she tried to make sense of what the ship's sensors were detecting. I have something on the sensors, but it doesn't make any sense, Captain Reynolds said, with a look of confusion on his face. Why is that? asked Catherine, looking over at Reynolds. It's too big, Reynolds said, in a shaken voice. Nothing can be that big. What are you talking about, Captain? demanded Catherine. The man sounded frightened. I'm picking up an artificial object with a radius of 1.2 AU. Check your sensors again, ordered Catherine with a deep frown. Clarissa, run a diagnostic. Those numbers can't be right. Just what the hell have they stumbled into? I'm afraid they are, Andrum said, turning to face Admiral Barnes. He'd been talking to Sheloom about the sensor readings. He turned back to his science console and adjusted the view screen. Even in the darkness, an area of even deeper blackness appeared. What you're detecting is a Dyson sphere. It completely surrounds the star, which Shilum and I suspect is at its heart. A Dyson sphere? repeated Catherine in disbelief. She looked intently at the dark object on the view screen. I thought those were impossible to build. 
Are you telling me the simulants have the science to construct one? If they did, then how could they ever be stopped? That would indicate their science was far in advance of the Federations and even the Altons. No, not impossible, just extremely difficult, Andrum replied with a deep sigh. I've made a few additional scans. The Dyson Sphere is at least three million years old, and the Simulans didn't build it. Then who did? Catherine was growing even more confused. Andrum looked over at Shilum, who nodded back. The Originators, he said in a soft voice. The Originators built the Dyson Sphere. Originators? Catherine repeated, her eyes narrowing. Who the hell are the Originators? That's a long story, Andrum replied, his eyes focusing on the Admiral. We didn't believe anything they built had survived. Catherine looked at the view screen and then back at Andrum and Shilom. It was obvious they felt uncomfortable talking about these originators. I'm waiting. She strongly suspected she was about to hear more news she wasn't going to like. Chapter 10 The originators are an ancient race that predates ours by many millennia. Andrum began to explain. There's not a lot known about them. We have a number of simulant vessels which have changed course and are heading to where we exited the vortex, broke in Captain Reynolds as he studied his sensors. They must have detected our exit vortex. How many? They were moving rapidly away from that area, and the ship was in stealth mode. Catherine knew if they could put sufficient distance between them and where the exit vortex had been, they might be able to remain undetected. It was a gamble, but they had to learn more about the Dyson Sphere and what the simulants were doing with it. This was the discovery of a lifetime. She only wished the circumstances were different. Twenty-six, Reynolds replied. All of Battlecruiser class. There's no sign they've detected us, Commander Grissom added. She was keeping a close watch on the ship's tactical displays. A group of red thread icons was moving steadily closer. She had no desire to tangle with that many Simulan battlecruisers. Keep me informed, Catherine ordered, as her attention shifted back to Andrum, wanting to hear more about these originators. Sorry for the interruption. You were saying these originators are an ancient race? Yes. In our early explorations, we found evidence of a very advanced culture, which once flourished in our galaxy. On several planets, we found abandoned cities that in their prime would have been larger than the City of Light on Astral. The cities were mostly buried beneath the ground, and only their foundations remained. We did some excavating and found the building material to be far superior to anything we were using at the time. What about tools, scientific instruments, or anything that might give an insight into who these people were? We never found anything functional. That would be of help, Shilum said, taking over the conversation. It was as if the cities had been carefully picked clean of any object or artifact that might give a clue to the science or technology involved. How many planets did you find evidence of this civilization on? Shilum looked over at Andrum before replying. Hundreds. Hundreds, gasped Catherine, her eyes widening. That's larger than the Federation and our allies combined. Yes, Shilum replied, with a slight nod of her head. We estimated a population of three to four hundred billion. What makes you think this Dyson Sphere was made by these originators? Our scans indicate the metal the sphere is made from contains several special alloys, very similar to some we found on the planets, Shilum answered. No one knows what happened to them. Many of our leading archaeologists believe they died out from a virulent disease that suddenly appeared amongst their population, though there is no evidence to support that theory. The only thing we do know is they were very advanced, and the ruins on the planets are all about the same age. Why do you call them originators? asked Catherine. She glanced at the tactical displays, seeing the simulant ships were still inbound. 
On their present course, they would miss the distant horizon by several million kilometers. She could sense a heightened anxiety amongst the crew as the simulans drew closer. Andrum picked up the conversation, as he was more familiar with this part than Shilum was. Up until the originators appeared in our galaxy, there were only a few spacefaring races at any one time. Normally, no more than a half dozen. While many planets teemed with life, the necessary step to bring about intelligent life seems to have been absent from most. We believe the originators traveled to many of these worlds and used gene splicing and genetic manipulation to bring about the necessary changes to create species more inclined to develop a technological civilization. They played God then, Commander Grissom commented, with a deep frown on her face. Anne was from Cirrus, and her parents were very religious. She also knew many people didn't share her parents' views. Over the years, the religious fervor had faded until only the most devout still believed. Perhaps, Andrum responded, his eyes taking on a faraway look. Most civilized cultures have beliefs in a superior being or some type of life after physical death. Even amongst my own people, there is a belief that the consciousness will continue on after the physical form expires, though there is no scientific evidence to support this. That's a debate which will probably go on forever, Colonel Leon said. So what else did these originators do? In our early days of exploration, we found a few ancient satellites in orbit around some of their worlds, Andrum continued. They were brought back to Astral, but very little was learned from them. When the satellites were disassembled, it was discovered the insides were burned out. Some of our top scientists and engineers believed that once the satellites had served their purpose, some type of self-destruct destroyed the advanced technology they contained. Admiral, my scans are picking up strange readings from several locations on the Dyson Sphere reported Captain Reynolds. There are some very large energy spikes showing up on my sensors. Can we magnify those areas and put them up on the main screen? I'll make the necessary adjustments, Andrum said, turning around and touching several icons on one of the screens of his science console. Instantly, the dark area on the screen swelled until only a small section of that titanic construct was being displayed. In the center of the screen, a swirling white vortex appeared. Is that what I think it is? asked Catherine, as she studied the object. It's a spatial vortex, Andrum confirmed, as he glanced down at some data coming across his console. It's also of intergalactic range. I'm picking up four such vortexes on the side of the sphere we can see, Captain Reynolds reported. There may be more on the other side. When did they first appear? asked Catherine. I think they've been there all along, Reynolds responded. Where are they getting the power? asked Commander Grissom. Even the AIs couldn't keep that vortex open for more than a few minutes. From the star inside the Dyson Sphere, Shilum answered. From my estimates, the sphere would intercept 2,695 yodawatts of the star's energy output. There's the extra energy the simulans are collecting from the 200 or so blue giant stars in this cluster. Andrum added. They may also be tapping into dark energy, or even converting the dark matter into a power source. Lieutenant Stiles, put us in orbit around the Dyson Sphere. I want to know how many operational vortexes there are. Catherine was growing worried about what the discovery of the active intergalactic vortexes might mean. It also concerned her that the simulans had access to the Dyson Sphere and its advanced technologies. She would give anything if they could explore that massive technological wonder. For the next 14 hours, the distant horizon made a circular orbit around the Dyson Sphere, scanning its surface and the simulan ships hovering about. In doing so, they found three more tunnels through the dark matter cloud, which connected to the blue giant cluster outside. During that time, the simulan searched the area the ship had exited the vortex and then fanned out in a standard search pattern. As time passed, 
even more simulan ships joined the search until over 120 vessels were scanning the space around the Dyson Sphere. 27 possible vortex rings in the hull of the Dyson Sphere, Andrum reported, as he studied all the data they had gathered. It appears they only keep six or seven activated at all times, probably due to energy constraints. All of intergalactic scope? asked Catherine. If they were, then the simulans were even more widespread than originally believed. It appears that way, answered Andrum, with a crease on his wide forehead. The bigger question is, are all of those vortex rings connected to other Dyson spheres? That would give them access to a tremendous amount of originator technology, Shilum pointed out. There may be other intact originator artifacts in those galaxies. We also detected 412 simulan warships around the Dyson Sphere, added Commander Grissom. Plus whatever ships may be inside, pointed out Colonel Leon. There could be thousands of ships inside that sphere. What's the current status of the simulan search? Asked Catherine, looking over at Captain Reynolds. Still no sign they've detected us, he reported. However, the simulans are in the process of moving ships to block the four tunnels which lead out. They're probably doing the same outside the Dark Matter Cloud as well, commented Commander Grissom, pursing her lips, worried about how they were going to escape their current predicament. Kelsey was gazing at the view screen when she heard Katie's voice over their private channel. I wonder if one of those vortexes connects to our galaxy. It was something Kelsey hadn't thought of. Was there a way home right here in front of them? Possibly, she replied after a moment. But how would we ever access it? I don't think it would be practical to bring the fleets here. There are simulan energy cannons mounted around the vortex rings, Clarissa informed them. Any type of near approach with the fleets would result in catastrophic losses. With this Dyson Sphere, the simulans could easily mount an invasion of our galaxy, Kelsey said, as she began to fully realize the ramifications of what they'd discovered. Jeremy was going to be really upset when he heard about this. At least we got the probe launched. Katie said. It will give them some warning of what might be coming their way. But will it do any good? Kelsey asked poignantly. The Federation and its allies have enough problems trying to acclimate all the worlds which were once Hawkland slave planets. Where are they going to find the resources of the ships to hold back the simulants? Katie didn't respond. She didn't know the answer. I'm sure Jeremy is going to be highly interested in our discovery, Kelsey said. The only problem is... I don't see anything we can do about it. How do we get out? asked Commander Grissom, looking back at the Admiral. Any way we go, we're going to encounter simulan ships. They'll detect us when we activate our hyperdrive, Clarissa informed them. They'll have time to react to that. How much time? Catherine asked. Approximately 22 seconds, Clarissa replied. She closed her deep blue eyes briefly, as if in deep concentration, and then opened them. I would recommend we creep up as close as we can to these three simulan ships here. On one of the tactical screens, three red icons began to blink. We drop our stealth shield, activate our main energy screen, and fire our particle beam cannons and power beams at these simulan ships. If we can take them by surprise, we just might be able to establish the vortex, fly into it, and jump into hyperspace before they can respond. It's going to take some careful timing commented Colonel Leon. Petra knew the crew could do it, but just one slip-up and it could mean disaster. Catherine let out a deep breath. She knew what needed to be done. Clarissa, if I turn control of the ship over to you, can you get us out? A look of pleased surprise crossed the AI's youthful face. Yes, Admiral, she responded. However, there may be more simulan ships waiting outside the dark matter cloud. We'll deal with them when we get there, declared Catherine. She'd made up her mind, and it was time to go. It took nearly two hours for Clarissa to maneuver the ship into the position she wanted, carefully monitoring the ship's stealth systems and seeing to it that energy emissions and other system emissions were held to a minimum. The AI brought the ship to a halt within just a few thousand kilometers of the three ships she was going to target. The command center was unusually quiet, as the large view screen was focused on the narrow tunnel which was their escape route. Damn, those ships are close, spoke Commander Grissom, worriedly, as she gazed at the nearby tactical display. 
They could detect us at any time. That's why we're not staying long, declared Clarissa, as she began powering up the ship's weapon systems. The three Simulan battle cruisers were part of a blockade force, ensuring a ship could not flee down the energy corridor. There had been two unconfirmed reports of a single unscheduled vortex opening at the energy collection station outside the dark matter cloud, and one inside the cloud near their present position. For hours the fleet had searched, but no trace had been picked up of an interloping vessel. The search would continue until every kilometer of space around the ancient artifact was pronounced clear. Alarms abruptly started sounding on all three Simulan battle cruisers as a glaring red contact suddenly appeared in the midst of the three patrolling ships. Weapon systems went hot as automatic targeting systems found and locked upon the nearby ship. The interloper had been found. Firing, reported Clarissa, as she fired the ship's four bow power beams at the nearest Simulan vessel, activating hyperdrive. The two bow particle beam cannons locked on and fired upon the one furthest away. At the same time, ten power beam turrets on the main hull of the Exploration Dreadnought fired upon the third enemy vessel. Space was full of deadly energy beams seeking to destroy their targets. The four power beams struck the Simulan energy shield, causing it to erupt in a fusillade of colors as it struggled against the sudden onslaught of energy. The shield shifted and wavered, then two beams flashed through the fluctuating shield, blasting deep holes in the ship's hull. Moments later, the other two beams penetrated, and a massive explosion rocked the Simulan vessel. The ship's engineering section was hit, and it suddenly went dead in space as it lost its power. Detecting this sudden weakness, Clarissa launched two Sublight Devastator III missiles, and the Simulan ship ceased to be as it was blown apart. The two particle beams flashed through the targeted Simulan ship's energy screen, blowing a huge section of the ship's hull off into space. A moment later, a Devastator III missile arrived, and passing through the hole in the shield, turned the Simulan ship into a glowing fireball as the 50-megaton warhead detonated. The other Simulan ship rocked under the weaker attack of the Distant Horizon's secondary power beams, but its shield managed to hold. Vortex is opening, reported Lieutenant Parker, as a blue-white vortex formed in front of the Distant Horizon. Accelerating into the vortex, reported Clarissa. She winced as the unharmed Simulan vessel fired its powerful energy beams at the Exploration Dreadnought. The ship shook violently, and several red lights appeared on the damage control board. Then they were in the vortex and on their way down the tunnel. Almost before the crew could relax, the ship exited the end vortex, reappearing in normal space. Contacts! yelled Captain Reynolds, as the ship rocked violently and alarms began to sound. Multiple breaches along the forward hull. We're venting atmosphere, the damage control officer reported. Firing full spread of Devastator 3s, responded Clarissa, as she turned the ship away from the approaching Simulan battle cruiser. We have 12 Simulan battle cruisers bearing down on us, reported Captain Reynolds, as the glaring red threat icons appeared in the two tactical displays. Energy shield is up, reported Commander Grissom. Damage repair crews are en route to the damaged areas. On the large view screen, space suddenly lit up as eight Devastator III missiles detonated, just short of the Simulan vessels. The missiles detonated prematurely, uttered Colonel Leon, angrily. No, replied Clarissa, as she rapidly accelerated the ship. Stand by for hyperspace entry. At this speed, said Commander Grissom, with worry spreading across her face. It's impossible. Not for me, Clarissa grated out, as she activated the ship's hyperdrive and hit the swirling vortex just as it was forming. Catherine heard the ship scream in pain, and the sound of grinding metal, and then the deep purple colors of hyperspace appeared on the big view screen. Get me a ship status, she ordered, looking over at Clarissa. She could see that the AI had a strained look upon her face. You did well, Clarissa, Catherine said sympathetically. No one else could have gotten us out of that mess. Clarissa nodded. She just checked, and 16 crew members were missing from the forward sections where the simulant energy beam had hit. It pained her to know she'd been the cause of their deaths. We have six compartments open to space, reported Colonel Leon, as she spoke to the damage control teams, which were responding to that section of the ship. The power beam turrets are damaged and have ceased functioning, as well as full energy beam turrets. There's no way to tell how bad the damage is until we send someone out to inspect the actual hull. 
Catherine nodded. Clarissa, do you have any cameras on the outer hull in that area that can show us the damage? There was no way they could send someone out on an EVA while in hyperspace. Checking now, the AI replied, as she checked the numerous cameras on the hull of the exploration dreadnought. Suddenly, on the main view screen, the damaged area came into view. As the camera panned over it, Catherine felt her heart stop. There was a massive, glowing hole, easily 20 meters in diameter carved into the hull. Three smaller rips in the hull were nearby. Damn! Major Weir uttered as he looked at the damage. That's definitely an energy beam hit. We can only seal off the affected areas, Commander Grissom said with a grimace. It will take a fleet repair ship or the clan protector to repair that damage. There used to be a power beam turret there, added Major Weir. I believe the power cables to the other power beam turret and the energy turrets have been destroyed. They ran through the compartment directly beneath that energy beam strike. I'll see if we can reroute the power. Colonel Leon said, as she moved over to a console. I should be able to do it from here. Catherine nodded. Do what you can. I'm not certain we've seen the last of the simulants. Kelsey and Katie looked worriedly at one another. They were on their way back to Jeremy and Kevin, but were they leading the simulants back to the task group as well? Neither said anything. They'd been friends for so long, they didn't need to say any words. Both knew what the other was thinking. Ariel was watching the sensors worriedly. At any time, the distant horizon could be returning, and the task group would be going back to Gaia. Checking on Kevin, she saw his eyes were focused intently on the sensors as well. Her friend was deeply concerned about the danger the exploration dreadnought might be in. Ariel wished all five of her friends were on board the Avenger, but she knew Clarissa would do everything in her power to protect Kelsey and Katie. She was about to say something to Kevin when the ship's sensors picked up a sudden energy spike. Spatial vortex forming four million kilometers off our port side, called out Kevin in an excited voice. Ariel watched intently as the ship exited the vortex. It's the distant horizon, she announced happily. The ship had made it back, and she was already establishing communication with Clarissa. More vortex is forming, warned Kevin, his eyes growing wide with fear at the implications. Simulan battlecruisers are emerging around the distant horizon, Ariel reported, as she began sounding the Condition 1 alarm. Power up all weapons, ordered Commander Malin, as Jeremy came bursting into the command center. All task group ships prepare to go to the distant horizon's aid. Status, barked Jeremy, seeing the single green icon surrounded by over a dozen red blips. It's the distant horizon, reported Ariel, grimly, a short time after they emerged from hyperspace. Fourteen simulant ships showed up. They emerged in a globe around the exploration dreadnought. Jeremy took a deep breath and then sat down in his command chair. Activating his fleet-wide minicom, he spoke to the ships of the task group. All ships prepare to do a short hyperjump to the distant horizon's location. Ariel will be transmitting the jump coordinates momentarily. Jeremy looked over at Ariel with an intense look in his eyes. Transmitting jump coordinates, the AI replied. Hyperdrives are powering up. We can jump in 20 seconds. Distant horizon is under attack, called out Commander Malin. On one of the main view screens, energy beams became visible targeting an object in the center of the simulant formation. Rear Admiral Barnes is reporting their hyperdrive has been disabled. It will take them 10 to 15 minutes to get it back online, Angela reported with concern in her voice. Stand by to jump, ordered Jeremy, determined to rescue the exploration dreadnought. The distant horizon shuddered as two simulant antimatter missiles hit the energy screen, severely jarring the ship. The screen seemed to waver, and then the flickering vanished as the screen returned to full power. All weapons fire, ordered Catherine, as she tried to save her ship. The sudden appearance of the simulant battlecruisers had stunned her. Bertram reports 10 to 12 minutes until the hyperdrive is functional, Colonel Leon reported. We won't last that long, Commander Grissom said tersely as the ship shook violently. The hull seemed to ring from the sound of the impacts to the screen. Energy screen is down to 60%, Major Weir reported. Every weapon the Exploration Dreadnought had was firing non-stop at the encircling Simulan battlecruisers. On the primary view screen, particle beam fire slammed into the main part of a Simulan warship, setting off massive explosions and hurling glowing debris into space. How did they follow us? demanded Catherine. Our sensors should have picked them up. Unknown, replied Clarissa. She wasn't in command of the ship, but she was doing everything in her power to ensure all the ship's weapons were on target. Task group is going to jump in, reported Captain Travers from communications. We're to join their formation. 
Sublight drive? Asked Catherine, looking over at the helm station. Still functional, answered Lieutenant Stiles. Vortex is forming, called out Captain Reynolds. Task group is 12,000 kilometers off our starboard bow. Get us there, ordered Catherine, feeling her heart hammering in her chest. If they could make it to the task group, they just might survive this. All weapons target Simeon and Battle Cruiser at X axis 17 degrees, Y axis 40 degrees, ordered Major Weir. Fire on the turn! As the ship turned to starboard and accelerated toward the task group, every weapon the ship had fired upon the Simulan battle cruiser, blocking its path. Power beams, particle beams, energy beams, and Devastator III missiles pummeled the ship, breaking its shield down. Moments later, two Devastator III missiles detonated against the Simulan hull, turning the vessel into a glowing cloud of gas. Target destroyed, reported Captain Reynolds. We're going to make it, said Colonel Leone as she watched the ship's tactical display. We're being bracketed by the remaining simulants, warned Captain Reynolds. On the tactical display, the remaining simulant ships were rapidly closing the range on the distant horizon. It was obvious they didn't plan to allow the ship to escape. The distant horizon took a massive hit to her bow, losing most of her heavy weapons. Warning alarms sounded, and more red lights appeared on the damage control console. Energy beam strike to our bow! reported Commander Grissom grimly. We've lost our particle beam cannons and two of our primary power beams. We have numerous compartments on the forward section open to space, and there are several fires out of control in adjoining compartments, reported the damage control officer. I'm initiating the fire suppression systems in those areas. Major Weir fired a broadside at the nearest Simulan vessel with the ship's secondary hull weapons. Power beams and energy weapons fired upon the Simulan ship, ripping open compartment after compartment. Just then, the deck heaved under Admiral Barnes, and she found herself flying through the air. The lights in the command center seemed to flicker and then steadied. Struggling to stand, Catherine stumbled back to her command chair. Her safety harness, which was supposed to hold her in place, was torn in two. Looking around, she saw smoke and sparks everywhere. Alarms were screaming from the damage control console, and the red lights were rapidly blinking on. Sublight drive is out! reported a shaken Commander Grissom. She had a dark bruise on her forehead. Energy screen is at 20% and falling, added Major Weir. It won't last much longer. Medics to the command center, Colonel Leon ordered, as she saw a number of the crew were unconscious and possibly injured. Simulants are closing, reported Captain Reynolds, with a strained look upon his face. Taking a deep breath, Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes prepared to die. Her ship would not withstand another missile strike or energy beam. She looked around the command center, seeing the knowing looks on the faces of her crew. Kelsey looked over at Katie. I'm sorry, Katie, she said in a soft voice. I wish I could have said goodbye to Kevin, Katie answered in a wavering voice. He was so happy when we arrived in the distant horizon. Clarissa didn't know what to say or what to do. Many of the ship's weapons were either destroyed or disabled. The sublight drive was damaged and it would still be another eight to ten minutes until Bertram had the hyperdrive functional again. For the first time in her long life, the AI felt completely helpless. She had sworn to protect the Special Five, and now she was incapable of saving Kelsey and Katie. She sent a mournful message to Ariel, apologizing for her failure. Spatial vortex is forming off our port and starboard side, Captain Reynolds said in total shock. We have two AI spheres. I have a message from the command AI. Lieutenant Travers reported. It says these two AI ships will buy us the time we need to activate our hyperdrive. Catherine leaned back in her command chair in shock. On the main view screen appeared one of the 1500 meter AI spheres. All of its weapons were firing, blasting away at the simulants. The simulants reeled from the sudden point blank attack. We might have a chance, she thought. Commander Grissom, tell Bertram he has five minutes to get that hyperdrive functioning. Jeremy looked at one of the main view screens in the command center of the Avenger. It showed a literal firestorm at the edge of the simulant formation. He knew this was the location of the two AI spheres in the distant horizon. He leaned forward, trying to see the exploration dreadnought pleading for its survival. More vortex is opening, Ariel reported. She was fidgeting, as she wanted to close the range to help Clarissa. Clarissa is reporting heavy damage to the distant horizon. Fifteen more Simulan battle cruisers, reported Kevin, with anxiety in his voice. All ships continue to fire upon the Simulan formation, Jeremy ordered. 
They were at extreme range for most of their weapons, but just maybe they could take enough pressure off the two AI spheres and the distant horizon to allow the exploration dreadnought to finish the repairs to its hyperdrive. A sudden flash of light filled the view screen. When it cleared, one of the AI spheres was gone. There was also a Simulan battlecruiser missing. It had been too close to the blast and been torn apart by the powerful explosion. We just lost AI Sphere 264, Kevin reported. If the AI succeeded in saving the Distant Horizon, he would never doubt their allegiance again. Distant Horizon reports hyperdrive is online, reported Angela excitedly. Tell them to jump to the emergency coordinates, Jeremy quickly ordered. We'll follow. On the view screen, a swirling blue-white spatial vortex formed. The Distant Horizon used its remaining maneuvering thrusters to push it into the vortex. Moments later, the vortex vanished. At the same time, the second AI sphere rammed a nearby Simulan battlecruiser. Both ships vanished in a brilliant fireball of released energy. Two nearby Simulan battlecruisers suffered severe damage from the blast and flying hull fragments and began to drift away from the site of the explosion. All ships, jump to the emergency coordinates, Jeremy ordered over his minicom, which was sent to ship to ship. He felt vastly relieved to see the distant horizon had made the jump into hyperspace. He would have to remember to thank the command AI. Jeremy hadn't ordered the two AI ships to jump in as they did. That had been a decision by the command AI. It reinforced Jeremy's belief the AIs were no longer a threat. When they returned to Gaia, and he had an opportunity to talk to Kareen and Miko, he would give the order to begin creating more AIs. Chapter 11 Governor Barnes was standing, looking out across the Aquaria habitat, deep inside Ceres, but his mind was a million light years away. In his hand, he held two sheets of paper, which contained a message from his daughter. It was a message he'd read countless times since receiving it. I can't believe she's not coming back, he said slowly, to the fleet officer standing beside him. In the distance, he could see birds flying in the air above the city. Even from here, a few kilometers away, he could see people moving about and electric vehicles driving down the thoroughfares. There was a Chinese restaurant in the city Catherine had always liked to eat at as a child. He could still picture her opening her fortune cookie and then looking expectantly as he opened his. They would then read their fortunes to each other, laughing the entire time. They did find Admiral Strong and his fleets, spoke Admiral Kalin. They're not alone. Governor Barnes was silent as his heart felt empty. We used to come here together and gaze out over the habitat. We would have a contest to see how many different bird species we could identify. I think her favorite were the scissor tails. She used to get so excited any time she saw one. She became a fine officer, Kalin said. Admiral Tellick would have been proud of her. Governor Barnes let out a deep sigh. We've lost so many good people since the start of the war with the Hawklands and the A.I.s. Sometimes I wonder if we're destined to go from one war to the next with no end in sight. We've had relative peace the last few years, Kalin pointed out. Just a few skirmishes with the Borzon and the Shari. The Federation and our allies are growing stronger as the new civilized worlds become members. We're not as alone as we once were. I spent too much time worrying about politics instead of her in recent years, Barnes said with sadness in his voice. I used to drag her around to diplomatic dinners, hoping someday she would follow me into politics. She chose the fleet instead, Kalin said. That must have been a shock. It was, Barnes responded with a slight smile, recalling the argument he had with Catherine over her decision. But she's as stubborn as her mother was. Admiral Kalin was silent for several moments, knowing the governor was grieving for his daughter. I've studied the data packet. Admiral Tolson and Admiral Jackson sent. The simulans are going to be a problem. I don't think the Federation Council is going to be anxious to rush into another war, even considering the potential danger these simulans pose. Many of the senators desire peace, and will do almost anything to keep it, even if it means ignoring this threat. Governor Barnes let out a deep sigh and nodded. Former Fleet Admiral Streth has been sending messages across the Federation requesting aid for Admiral Tolson at the Black Hole. He also wants to send a relief fleet to the Triangulum Galaxy to aid Admiral Strong in his fight against the Simulans. From what I read in Admiral Strong's report, 
He plans on returning to Gaia and staying there, Kalen replied. He's built some powerful defenses and has the ships to protect it if the Simulans ever stumble across it. They've already begun colonizing the planet. Catherine's new home, responded Governor Barnes, wistfully. I wish I could see it. Nearby, he could see a pair of birds circling. Were they scissor tails? What do you want to do? asked Admiral Kalin. Cirrus hasn't always followed the will of the Council. I'm going to meet with Ambassador Tureen and Senator Carnes later this week, Governor Barnes replied. I'm not sure what we can do, but I'm not going to stand idly by and let Admiral Strong and my daughter fight the Simulans alone. What about President Malay? Kalin asked. What are you going to say to him? The Council will be in a quandary, Barnes said, shaking his head in disgust. Governor Fulbright will never agree to commit any forces to fight the Simulans. He'll instruct the Senators from Serenity to block any such attempt. The Senators from Bliss will support him, as their world is also in the Epsilon Iridani system. I don't see any help coming from the Council, because it'll become bogged down in political infighting. Do you want me to speak with Fleet Admiral Nagumo? He might be more responsive for a request to send aid. Governor Barnes hesitated. He hated dragging the fleet admiral into this, but anything he could do to help would be appreciated. Yes, make sure he understands we feel the simulan threat is real and needs to be addressed. If he's interested in helping, I want to meet with him. He's currently in the Alpha Centauri system visiting Harmony, Kalen replied. I'll do a quick flit over there in Cirrus and speak with him. Thanks, Governor Barnes replied. In the distance, he could see a pair of scissor tails circling above a grove of trees. He wished Catherine were here. She would have loved the sight. It was two weeks later, and Admiral Tolson stood in the command center of the Warhawk, staring at one of the tactical displays, showing the current disposition of the ships under his command. After the Distant Horizons drone had come through, he'd been expecting the simulants to show up at any time. The fleet was practicing battle maneuvers on a regular basis in preparation for meeting the threat. You've done everything you can, commented Commander Arnett as they finished the latest drill. The fleet is in the best tactical position you can put it in. Yes, but it's not enough, Ray said, stepping back from the display. Later, he would go over the results from the drill and see if he could spot any obvious weakness in his plan. Third Fleet was positioned in a globe around the expected emergence point of a simulan attack. Admiral Jackson's flagship, the Dauntless, along with his two battle cruisers and four strike cruisers, were mixed in with Race's command. Jackson's two battle carriers had been assigned to protect Capacitor Station 1, all civilian ships, as well as the fleet repair vessels. Admiral Bacall's Alton ships were close by, to be used as quick response strike force once the simulans arrived. They would be the Sunday punch and would hit the simulants head-on as they emerged from the spatial vortex. You'd think they'd come through in force, stated Colonel Cowell. It's what I would do. I'd keep sending ships through until I had a beachhead established and then move out to secure the area around the black hole. We'll give a good accounting of ourselves, Madeline said confidently. They won't find us so easy to overcome. I know we will, Ray said. But damn it, Madeline. We're talking about facing 1,700-meter battlecruisers with technology equivalent to the AIs and possibly even the Altons. How can we stop something like that? At that moment, the alarms on the sensor console began sounding. Spatial vortex is detected, reported Lieutenant Davis, as his trained eyes shifted to his sensor screens. Two million kilometers! I'm getting Alton ID codes, added Lieutenant Travers with relief in her voice. When the alarm sounded, everyone was instantly afraid it was the expected simulant attack. Altons? Madeline said, looking confused. Admiral Bacall didn't mention any other ships showing up. Put them on the main view screens, ordered Race, shifting his attention to the front of the command center. He hoped the Alton vessels were warships and not more research ships. The view screen zoomed in on the new arrivals, and Race felt his breath taken away. Please tell me those are what I think they are. Twelve Alton battleships, each towing an indomitable-class battle station, Commander Arnett said, with eyes aglow. Now that's a relief for sore eyes. I have Admiral Victel on the comm, Lieutenant Travers said with a smile. He wants to know where you want the battle stations. The only way they could get indomitable-class battle stations here so quickly is if they come from Astral, 
Colonel Cowell said, his eyes widening. They must have removed them from orbit. Race nodded, still finding it hard to speak. He knew exactly where he wanted them. The indomitable class battle stations were 1,000 meters in diameter and armed with numerous heavy particle beam cannons and sublight antimatter missile tubes. They also had multiple energy beam turrets for defense. They'd be a hard nut to crack with their powerful defensive screens. They could easily be a game changer in a battle with the simulants. He'd have to adjust his battle plan to take into account this sudden addition to his forces. I want them around the expected entry vortex for the simulants, Race ordered, finally able to talk. With the battle stations, he just might be able to drive back the expected simulant attack and keep them away from the capacitor stations. Over the next few weeks, additional reinforcements straggled in. A full squadron of 15 battle cruisers from New Providence, a fleet of 30 battle cruisers from Carith, under command of the Bear Battleship Hunter, as well as a few more Federation ships. More surprising was the fact New Providence sent 20 Type II battle stations, as well as 500 particle beam satellites. Admiral Tolson carefully placed the Type II battle stations in position, where they could support the more powerful Indomitable class stations. The 500 particle beam satellites he placed as close to what the suspected emergence point of the simulans would be, as he dared. For the first time, he felt he could beat back any conceivable simulan attack. That's one hell of a mousetrap, commented Commander Arnett, as she watched the last particle beam satellite being put into position on one of the view screens. It should be enough, Ray said, folding his arms across his chest. We'll be able to blow anything apart that comes through the vortex. So what do we do now? We wait, Race replied, looking over at Madeline. We continue the repairs to the capacitor stations so we can send a relief fleet through to Admiral Strong and Admiral Barnes. I just hope they can stay alive until we can send them help. Madeline nodded. There had been very little response from the Federation about forming a relief fleet. Discussions were still ongoing, but only Kareth and New Providence had promised to provide ships. It was difficult to find people and crews who were willing to make the journey to the Triangulum Galaxy, particularly since it was most likely a one-way trip. Fleet Admiral Nagumo was at New Tellus Station, still fuming from his meeting with the Federation Council. President Malay had asked him to present the evidence to the Council of the threat the simulans posed. He had been pressed by the Senators from Serenity and Bliss whether any simulan vessels had been detected in the galaxy. He had been forced to admit they had not. Then, Senator Davis from Bliss demanded to know when the last time a simulant vessel was spotted in the galaxy. Stone-faced, Nagumo had admitted it had been several thousand years. In the end, the vote was close, but the measure to prepare for a simulant invasion had been voted down. Bureaucrats, he mumbled, tossing back a stiff drink and staring across his office at a picture taken of the beaches on Nutella's. We're not all assholes, responded Senator Amy Carnes with a grin. Some of us actually want what's best for the Federation and our allies. Sorry, Nagumo replied, as he filled his glass a second time from a bottle on his desk. He picked the bottle up and then placed it in the bottom drawer. He very seldom drank, but he was infuriated at the council. If the simulants come through as Admiral Tolson believes they will, it'll be the start of an intergalactic war, Amy said in a calm voice. The Council will have no choice but to respond to the threat. Nagumo left his glass on the desk, stood up, and walked over to a large view screen focused on the Command Asteroid Fortress. It was 22 kilometers in diameter, with the Command Center located at its heart. The asteroid was honeycombed with passages and power plants. It took a crew of 20,000 to operate the massive fortress and its intricate systems and weapons. Nagumo would give anything if Admiral Tolson had something like that to hold back the simulans. I suppose you've seen the communique from former Fleet Admiral Streth that's been floating around in some circles of the military and the political establishment, asked Nagumo, still gazing at the view screen. Possibly, Amy said evasively. It's riled a few people, Nagumo said, as he turned back around to face the senator. Not in the military but a few of the higher-ups with deep political connections. He knew Senator Carnes had been one of the recipients of the Fleet Admiral's message. It's not like it was six or seven years ago, when he was leading our fleets against the AIs and the Hawklands. Several times, he called the bluff of the Council and got what he wanted. He's a living legend and could get by with things I can't even consider. 
Will you help him? Amy asked, her eyes focusing intently on the fleet admiral. I believe I can guarantee enough votes in the council to prevent your removal as fleet admiral if things go south. What are you willing to do? Asked Nagumo. He knew they should be readying the fleet for possible war, but the council was being too close-minded over this threat. Whatever is necessary, Amy replied in a steady voice. New Telus was settled by people from the old Human Federation of Worlds. We owe our lives to the fleet admiral. If he's asking for aid, we're honor-bound to send it. It'll be risky, Nagumo said, returning to his chair and sitting down. Politics is always risky, Amy responded with a wry smile. I can stand the fire if it comes my way. Nagumo nodded. Senator Carnes had always been an outspoken senator and ardent supporter of the fleet. I'll make calls and speak to some people. There may be a few things we can do that won't raise too many eyebrows. Fleet Admiral, you should know Fleet Admiral Streth has already set some plans into motion, Amy ventured cautiously. Nagumo laughed and smiled. I suppose you mean the repair of the AI capacitor stations. How? Amy stammered, surprised. A lot of effort had gone into keeping the repair of the second and possibly third capacitor station a secret. You didn't think I'd know what was going on when one of my admirals takes his fleet to the galactic center without orders from me? Amy didn't reply. She merely gazed questionably at the fleet admiral. I trust Admiral Tolson's judgment in this matter. That's why a few additional warships have been sent his direction. Not as many as I would have liked, but still enough to sizably increase the strength of his fleet. I also placed it in the records that I sent the fleet there on a special mission. What about Fleet Admiral Streth's plans? A relief fleet sent to the Triangulum Galaxy to wage war against the Semulans, Nagumo said carefully, his eyes narrowing sharply. Some will say, we'll be starting the war. We won't be starting a war. We'll be saving the galaxy, Amy said firmly. Nagumo nodded. He had work to do if he was to send any ships to aid Admiral Strong and Rear Admiral Barnes. If he was careful, he wouldn't violate any regulations, and the Senate Council wouldn't know what he'd done until it was too late. He was taking a risk with his career, but he trusted Senator Carnes to come to his aid if needed. There were a number of ships in the reserve fleet, which could easily be brought back into service. He was also fairly certain he could find the personnel to crew them. At the Galactic Center, work was continuing on the three capacitor stations. With the aid of the Alton battleships, the third capacitor station had been moved closer to the other two. It had taken delicate work using the tractor beams the battleships were equipped with, but adjustments had been made to substantially increase its orbital speed. With four of the battleships staying in close proximity, so course adjustments could be done as needed. Now, all three stations were close to one another and work crews had begun major repairs to the third station. Race had been surprised at the number of Federation warships that continued to trickle in. He wasn't sure how long he could keep them at the black hole until they were ordered to return to their patrol routes. What of the relief fleets? asked Commander Arnett. The two were in the shuttle inbound to Capacitor Station 1 for a meeting with the Alton and human scientists working on the project. Race gazed out the viewport. It still concerned him being so close to the black hole but their distance and orbital velocity kept them safe. I've received commitments from Kareth, New Providence, and Cirrus. The fleet will make transit in four months. There may also be a fleet from Nutellus, but that's a little questionable. Can we be ready by then? We have to be, Race replied, as the shuttle began docking to the massive capacitor station. The Simulans must be forced to focus on their galaxy and not ours. Only by attacking them there can we guarantee that. By now, Jeremy has pulled his ships into the nebula and won't be venturing back out. He just doesn't have the people. It's up to us to change that. Will Admiral Strong fight? asked Madeline. They'll still be vastly outnumbered. Jeremy will fight, Ray said with a vicious grin. Give him the ships and crews, and he'll kick the hell out of the simulans. After docking, they made their way to a conference room set up for the meeting. Shea, Palel, Admiral Victel, and several other Altons were present, as well as a few human engineers. Admiral Tolson greeted Admiral Victel, stepping forward and shaking Race's hand. After greeting the others, everyone sat down and looked at Race expectantly. The relief fleet will be going through the vortex in four months, he announced. 
Four months, spoke Shay in surprise. We can't be ready in four months. Capacitor Station 3 is too heavily damaged. I'm assigning additional repair crews from our ships, Race told her. We don't need to repair the entire station. Just get as many energy collector dishes as possible online. Palel looked over at Race with a frown on his face. At best, we can have it no better than 20 to 25 percent operational. It'll take years to repair the heavier damaged areas of the station. That'll be sufficient, answered Race. Once we send the relief fleets through, we won't need the capacitor stations again. What? Shay said, with confusion covering her face. Why not? Because of this, answered Race, sliding a computer flash drive over to Palel. The Alton scientists at Astral have come up with a solution to prevent the simulants from being able to open an intergalactic vortex into our galaxy. Palel took the flash drive and inserted it into his handheld computer pad. He scanned the data as his face turned white. They can't be serious, he stammered looking up at Race. Yes, Race replied. Once the relief fleet has gone through, we'll recharge the three capacitor stations and move them into the area of weakened space. Once all three are in position, we'll detonate the stations, releasing all of their energy in one massive burst. It will not only tear a hole in the fabric of regular space, it'll also rupture hyperspace in the vicinity. If the simulants attempt to come through, They'll be thrown so violently out of hyperspace. It will destroy their vessels, Palel said as he studied the data. It'll also make it impossible for them to change the exit vortex to another point in our galaxy, Race explained. The rupture of hyperspace will act as a magnet for any intergalactic vortex, and the amount of energy to counter that is nearly incomprehensible. It would take an energy collection system far greater than what the AIs built here. With the relief fleets we're sending Admiral Strong, he'll see to it they can't build the necessary energy stations to accomplish that. That means there'll be no future missions to the Triangulum Galaxy, or even a way to send a message drone, commented Admiral Victel. We'll be trapping our fleets in that galaxy, with no way to ever come home or send a message. Palel nodded his agreement at the assessment. This sounds like an effective way to seal off our galaxy at least temporarily from the simulants. However, keep in mind we're assuming they have no massive power source. Based on the technology level we've observed and the data sent by Admiral Strong, the scientists on Astral feel confident the simulants have no power source of that magnitude, Race responded. Race knew the day he carried out the destruction of the stations would be one that would haunt him forever. He would be permanently marooning the lost fleets, the distant horizon, and the relief fleets in the Simulan galaxy. There would be no way for them to ever come home, or for the Federation to know the outcome of the war in the Triangulum galaxy. Chapter 12 Jeremy let out a deep breath of frustration. It would take another two months for all the damage to the distant horizon to be repaired. It would also require the use of two of their four fleet repair ships for the entire time period. The Exploration Dreadnought had suffered much more damage than originally believed. Looking at one of the main view screens on the front wall of the command center, Jeremy could see the ship in orbit above Gaia. It was currently docked to the clan protector. Two fleet repair ships hovered nearby, and he could see the bright flashes of welding arcs and torches as the damaged parts of the hull were cut away. New hull plates were being built in the shipyard, since the battle armor on the Exploration Dreadnought was thicker than that of the other warships. Clarissa says there was a brief moment when they all expected to die, Ariel said from Jeremy's side. The AI was in her standard dark blue uniform without insignia. Her trim, lithe figure was that of a woman in her early twenties. Ariel considered making her appearance that of an older, more mature woman, but she was hesitant to make any changes to her appearance. Jeremy reached forward on his command console, and the view on the screen was magnified until the distant horizon filled the screen. On the hull of the battered ship, dozens of spider robots were busy at work, repairing minor hull breaches and scorched areas where the hull had been exposed to high temperatures from the simulant's energy weapons and antimatter missiles. There's a lot of interior damage to the bow, 
Ariel continued, as she examined the full damage report. Any lesser ship would have been destroyed from the destruction ravaged upon the vessel by the simulants. All of her bow weapons are going to have to be repaired or rebuilt. There was an energy beam hit to the stern in the area of the sublight engines. The engines weren't damaged, but many of the control linkages and power couplings were either smashed or burned away. 87 dead with another 94 injured, Jeremy said. He didn't know what he would have done if either Kelsey or Katie had been hurt. They'd been back for several weeks now, and it still pained him to think how close they had come to losing the ship. They're going to try to put an ion cannon on the bow of the ship, Ariel added, as she studied the weapons that were going to be installed. She knew Jeremy felt horrible about the danger he'd put the exploration dreadnought in. Some of the Alton scientists and technicians believe they can make it work after studying the blueprints Andrum turned over to them, Jeremy said. They just don't have what we need to create a miniaturized version, like the defense globes the Distant Horizon originally had. I would love to have several hundred of those in the defense grid around Gaia. Those defense globes allowed the Exploration Dreadnought to survive until we got there. Commander Kyla Malin commented as she stepped over closer to Jeremy and Ariel. The ion beams they generated played havoc with the simulant's energy shields. Graceth and Dalethon want to place some ion cannons upon the clan protector as well, Ariel added. She focused her dark eyes upon Kyla. With the weapons they are currently installing on the mobile shipyard, and the addition of a half dozen ion cannons, Dalethon's command will be a hard nut to crack. Jeremy smiled at Ariel's comment. Sometimes she sounded so human. The battle cruiser Gaia is out of the construction base and is undergoing her trials. Commander Newman is quite pleased with his new command. He should be, Kyla said with a jealous smile. She's the most powerful battle cruiser in our fleet. Ariel was smiling, and then the smile on her face faded promptly. Jeremy, she said in a strained and deeply concerned voice, you need to go over to the clan protector. There's been a development. What is it? He turned, seeing the strange look on the AI's face. Dalethon's people were removing the wreckage from an interior section of the distant horizon, and they found something. What? asked Jeremy, feeling confused. He couldn't imagine why they would need his presence. They found some type of simulant apparatus, Ariel replied. Her eyes took on a deep and serious look. Miko and Andrum have briefly examined it, and they believe it is some type of tracking device. Jeremy's face turned pale at the ramifications. If this was indeed a tracking device, had it revealed to the simulants where the Lost Fleet was hiding? Get my shuttle ready, he ordered. I want Rear Admiral Barnes, Rear Admiral Marks, and Admiral Cladius, the Command AI, Graceth, and Andrum to meet me on the Clan Protector immediately. Commander Malin nodded and immediately contacted the ship's flight bay. As Jeremy prepared to step out of the command center, he turned back toward Commander Malin. Contact the AIs and inform the Command AI the simulants may know Gaia's location. Order it to place half of the AI spheres at Condition 2. Jeremy arrived on the Clan Protector to be met by Dalethon as well as Graceth. For the first time, Graceth didn't rush to greet Jeremy. His large face had a look of worry and fear. Clan brother, Graceth bellowed, his large eyes focusing intently on Jeremy. I have just come from the distant horizon. The Alton computer specialist Miko and the Alton scientist Andrum bear bad tidings. While technicians were removing a section of a bulkhead to be repaired, they found a metallic device embedded within it. Upon examination, it was determined to be of simulant manufacture. We thought at first it was a bomb, said Dalethon, as the three turned and began walking through the large flight bay. However, our munitions expert examined it and determined it was some type of electronic device. We took it to a lab on the ship, and Miko and Andrum came down to examine it. They called in a few other human and Alton specialists and determined it was some type of simulant transmitter. Was it still functioning? asked Jeremy. He couldn't believe the bad luck in this happening. Just when he thought they were safe inside the nebula and the defenses around Gaia were finished, this had to happen. Andrum said it was emitting a weak hyperspace signal, Dalethon replied. He set up a jamming frequency so the signal could no longer escape the ship. Since then, we've managed to disable the transmitter. So it's been transmitting all this time. I'm afraid so, clan brother, Graceth said. They reached a turbo lift, and the three stepped inside. 
It began moving immediately at a high rate of speed toward the docking port where the exploration dreadnought was connected to the shipyard. While the dreadnought was too large to fit inside any of the clan protector's repair bays, it could still be docked to the station while the fleet repair ships worked on it. In addition, Daelthon's repair crews could provide some assistance. Reaching the docking port, they were ushered inside by the marine guards at the large open hatch. It didn't take them long to reach the conference room where the meeting was to be held. Going inside, Jeremy saw Miko and Andrum were already there, as well as Shilum. On the table in front of them was a shiny silver object in the shape of a saucer approximately one meter across. Is that it? asked Jeremy, striding across the room to stand and gaze at the device. He noticed some burn marks, and there were several large dents on its exterior. Yes, answered Andrum, standing up. We've examined it very thoroughly. Its transmitter has also been disabled. Then it was transmitting a signal, Jeremy asked with a feeling of dread. Yes, Andrum confirmed. On a seldom used hyperspace frequency, we were unable to detect until we realized what this was. Before Jeremy could say anything else, Rear Admiral Barnes came rushing into the room. I was on the spaceport on Gaia when I heard the news. Is that the transmitter? She walked over and gazed with distaste at the object in front of Jeremy. Yes, Jeremy answered. He turned back toward Andrum. Is there any possibility its signal could reach through the nebula that surrounds us? I doubt it, replied Andrum, shaking his head. Its transmitter isn't powerful enough. Do the simulans know we're in this nebula? asked Rear Admiral Marks, who had just arrived along with the Command AI. The nebula was quite large, and if the simulans didn't know Gaia's exact location, it could take them a while to locate the planet. I'm guessing the simulans only know the general direction. The distant horizon was traveling, the Alton scientist answered. His forehead creased in thought as he continued. The signal could only be transmitted each time the ship dropped out of hyperspace. The signal would have to be triangulated to determine where the ship was heading. Not an easy task, but certainly possible with the number of ships the simulans have available to them. I have placed half of my AI fleet on alert, the command AI confirmed. The globe of energy above its cube seemed to glow brighter. I have spoken to several of my science AIs, and they feel it unlikely these simulans will find us any time soon. It will take time to triangulate the signal and explore all the surrounding stars. The nebula will be one of the last places they will look. But they'll come eventually, Admiral Cledius said, his face creasing in a frown. When they find no trace of us at the nearby stars, their attention will turn to the nebula. Jeremy sat down, deeply concerned. The defenses around Gaia were pretty powerful. When added to the ships he currently had at his disposal, he doubted if the simulants could take the planet. However, it might be extremely costly to hold the planet against the simulants in a major fleet battle. He could order an evacuation of Gaia. The only problem was, where would they go? The simulants had a stronghold on the Triangulum Galaxy. With a deep sigh, he knew this was going to be a very tumultuous meeting. They were going to have to make some very important decisions, and quickly. Several days later, Jeremy was on the surface of Gaia in New Eden, walking alongside General McGown down on one of the busy streets of the small city. I would recommend bringing more Marines down from the orbiting ships, McGown said, as they stopped to watch a group of civilians going into a small restaurant. Station them in New Eden and Clements? asked Jeremy. He didn't know how the civilian populations of the two cities would take to having large numbers of Marines patrolling the city streets. We can set up some barracks on the outside of the cities, suggested McCown. I can assure you we can keep our presence minimal. However, if the simulants attack, we can spread out across the cities and be ready for combat quickly. Nearly everyone in the cities are former military, Jeremy said, as they crossed the street and continued down the other side. It was nearly lunchtime, and there were a lot of people out on the streets going to the various eating establishments. They're used to seeing people in uniform, but they came down to the planet to get away from that. Better than having to face scavenger robots on their own, McGowan pointed out. We should prepare them, Jeremy said, taking a deep breath. 
I'll make a general announcement. There might be an impending simulant attack. They have the right to know what might be ahead of us. McGowan stopped and gestured to the street next to them. It was a wide two-lane street, with a number of electric cars and a few small delivery trucks passing by. We made all the streets in both cities a little larger than normal. It won't take us long to disperse our troops when the time comes. There's small bomb shelters beneath every home and business. Once we sound the alarms, the city streets should clear quickly. If the simulans land any of those scavenger robots of theirs, we'll take care of them. Jeremy nodded. He wished he could think of some way to keep the simulans out of the nebula, but he had no idea at the moment as to what could be done. He had a team working on it. Several Alton scientists had a wild idea about increasing the density of the hydrogen cloud around Gaia's star system to make hyperspace travel impossible. They were talking about building some type of gravity-generating satellites to deploy in a distant orbit around Gaia's star, which would slowly draw the hydrogen gas in around them, making it too dense to allow a ship to travel in hyperspace. Jeremy just wasn't sure they would have the time to enact such a daring plan. We're not certain how the simulants land their scavenger robots, Jeremy said, as the general led him to where a small military vehicle was waiting. As they got inside, Jeremy looked over at McGowan. We don't know if they land a vessel or have some type of landing pod that comes crashing down to the surface, releasing its cargo. We have defensive batteries around the three bases, as well as laser turrets around the two cities to take either out, McGowan said in response. Don't forget about the fighters and bombers stationed at the bases. They won't have an easy time getting down to the surface. As the vehicle drove out of the small city, Jeremy had his first clear view of one of the laser turrets the general was referring to. It stood upon a tower 20 meters high, with a small dome on top, with the barrels of two laser cannons pointed upward. How many of those do you have finished? General McCown ordered the driver to come to a stop, and he stepped out, motioning for Jeremy to follow him. We have 24 around New Eden, and 16 encircling Clements. He led Jeremy over closer to the tower. At the base of the tower was a small building housing the controls for the laser turret, as well as the four marines responsible for its operation. The towers will be effective against any scavenger robot that comes within two kilometers of it, McGowan said, as they came to a stop near the base of the tower. A tall fence to keep unwanted visitors out surrounded the tower and control building. It's also capable of taking out descending shuttles. Jeremy gazed around at the surrounding countryside. The taller trees had been cut down to give the laser turret a clear field of fire. The area within 100 meters of the turret was cleared of trees and brush, with only a low native grass growing. It was a kilometer to the outskirts of the city of New Eden. Will more marines be sent to defend the laser towers if the simulants get into orbit? Yes, replied McGowan. Two additional squads of marines have been assigned to each laser tower if we're attacked. He gestured to several short three-meter-tall concrete walls with firing slits. Their duty will be to help defend the tower from attack while it deals with any threats to the city. There were half a dozen of the small concrete walls facing out away from the city and the tower. How will all of your marines be deployed in the result of a massive invasion of scavenger robots? McGowan folded his arms across his chest and gazed out toward the outskirts of the city. Even from here, there were vehicles visible and the people could be seen moving about. I have 14,000 marines on the surface now and I plan on bringing down 6,000 more from our orbiting ships. As soon as a simulan fleet is detected, we'll deploy troops around our three military bases, as well as a solid cordon around New Eden and Clements. If the simulans land scavenger robots, they'll hit a solid line of marines with armor-piercing rounds and explosive charges to take them out. Some marines will also be assigned to patrolling the city streets, in case a few scavengers get past or overrun our positions. Let's hope that doesn't happen, Jeremy commented. He didn't even want to think about the consequences of scavenger robots getting loose in the cities. Let's go check out the three military bases. Also, how is the underground command center coming? It's finished, General McGowan replied, with a pleased look upon his face. Even the defensive and offensive weapons are installed. I want a tour of it while I'm here on Gaia, Jeremy said. He was deeply concerned that shortly they might need the Marines on Gaia and their readiness could very well determine if they could hold the planet and keep their two cities safe. I'll arrange it, McGowan answered with a nod. They went back to the waiting vehicle and were soon speeding down the road to the newest marine base, the one to which Major Brace Calder had been assigned.
Kelsey and Katie were over on the clan protector speaking with Corel and Maleth. Since the arrival of the distant horizon, the four had spent a lot of time together. So are the two of you going down to the planet to start families? Asked Katie. She knew the bears preferred large families, and the females normally married quite young. Not immediately, Maleth replied, her large eyes focusing on Katie. A few of our females went down to Gaia almost immediately. There were over 400 of us on the clan protector when we made the transit to this galaxy. It was a great honor for us to be allowed to participate in the defense of our planet, as well as the war against the Hawklands and the AIs. It would be a violation of that honor if all of us went down to Gaia to begin families, Corel continued. For the time being, a few of us will remain on the clan protector, though we realize because of our numbers, at some point in time it will be wise for all of us to go down to Gaia, so the size of our clan can grow as quickly as possible. What about the two of you? asked Maleth. Maleth was a little taller than Kelsey, and her deep brown fur almost seemed to glisten in the steady lights of the shipyard. Kelsey flushed slightly. She and Jeremy had only briefly discussed children. It was something they wanted someday, but they both realized it might not be for quite some time. Eventually, she confessed. I would like at least two, a boy and a girl, but my duties for now are on the distant horizon. Same here, Katie said with a smile. Kevin and I have talked about kids, and I want at least three. Maleth laughed. Carthian families normally have five or six offspring. When the Hawklands took over our planet, they reduced the allowed size of our families. For many years, we were only allowed one child, and under special circumstances, too. Katie, I have some computer questions, Corel said. Would you mind helping me at my console? We have some updates the Altons have added to our systems, and I'm not happy with the way our computers are functioning. I would be glad to, Katie replied. Corel was actually quite good with computers, but sometimes the Altons seemed to forget not everyone were computer geniuses. Maleth and Kelsey watched the other two walk off across the command center to Corel Station. Corel was due to mate with a young officer once we returned from the Galactic Center, Maleth said with a look of sadness in her eyes. They have been planning their joining since they were very young. Childhood sweethearts, murmured Kelsey in understanding. You could say that, Maleth answered. It has been hard on Corel being separated from Slenard. Maleth then turned toward Kelsey with an intense look in her eyes. The tracking device embedded inside the distant horizon. Do you think the simulants will find us? And if they do, what will happen? Gaia is pretty powerfully defended, replied Kelsey. We have the AI fleet, Fourth Fleet, Graceth's fleet, and the Alton fleet to defend it. The simulants would have to jump in with a truly massive force to get down to the planet. Jeremy will never allow that to happen. I know he won't, Maleth replied somberly. But what happens afterward? What if they jump in fleet after fleet? What happens then? Kelsey was silent for a long moment. Maleth was right. Even if they could handily defeat the first attack, there would be more. The Altons are working on a possible solution to prevent the simulants from jumping in. Jeremy had mentioned to her the gravity generators the Altons were trying to develop. It was a long shot, but they couldn't have simulant fleets jumping in every few days or even every few weeks. Eventually, they would wear down the defenses in the fleets until they could assault the planet. Once that happened, it would all be over. I hope they come up with something, Maleth responded, her large eyes growing even wider. At least here, we have a planet to live on and a possible future. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes was looking at the current status report of the repairs on the distant horizon. She let out a deep breath as she realized everything that still needed to be done. We were lucky commented Commander Grissom, seeing what Catherine was studying. Another few minutes, and we would have lost the ship. It might still be that bad if the simulants managed to trace us, Catherine answered with a deep sigh. She felt bad the simulants had managed to place a tracking device upon her ship. It will take them time to gather the ships they'll need to mount an attack, Andrum said, as he stood up from his science console. They may know we're in this nebula, but it's a pretty sizable one and it will take them a while to locate us. We should have some warning of their arrival. What about your research? Catherine asked. She knew Andrum had been going over the information they had downloaded from the archive computers at Astral, information the AIs had garnered from countless worlds. 
There are some intriguing possibilities, Andrum said, as he considered what he'd discovered. My fellow scientists on board the four Alton science vessels are working on a method to use gravity generators to pull in enough of the hydrogen gas in the nebula to make jumping into the Gaia system impossible. Wouldn't that protect us? asked Catherine. Jeremy had briefed her about that line of research. It would cause the simulant ships to drop violently out of hyperspace, possibly damaging or even destroying them. However, we have to assume they have sensors as good as ours and would detect the increased hydrogen density before striking it. They would then drop out of hyperspace and proceed toward us on their sublight drives. It might take them a few extra days, but they would eventually arrive here. Then what are we going to do? asked Commander Grissom. Andrum smiled and pointed toward his science console. I think I have found a possible solution in the information we downloaded at Astral. I need to speak to Shilum and Miko, as well as a few other Altons on the science vessels. But it may offer a solution. Catherine knew they had downloaded a tremendous amount of data. The scientists at Astral, as well as Andrum, thought might come in useful. She wondered what he'd found. What is it? she asked, burning with curiosity. Not yet, responded Andrum, shaking his head. Let me make sure what I've discovered is feasible. If it is, then it will change everything and will ensure Gaia remains safe. Very well, Catherine replied with a deep sigh. Just keep me posted. Andrum nodded and then left the command center to fly over to one of the science vessels. Altons and their science, muttered Commander Grissom, as she stared at the now empty seat at Andrum's science console. Why do I feel this will be something mind-shattering when he finally tells us? Because he's Alton, Catherine answered with a wry smile. They always figure out ways to do the impossible. I hope so, responded Anne, turning to face the Admiral. If Andrum and his Alton friends don't come through this time, then I fear our stay in this nebula, and on Gaia, might be very short. I'm afraid it won't be long before the simulants find us. Catherine nodded, knowing Commander Grissom was right. She hoped she and her crew hadn't come all this way to find the Lost Fleets, only to see them destroyed. Of course, if the Lost Fleets were destroyed, then in all probability, so would the distant horizon. Chapter 13 Inside the Dyson Sphere, the simulants were preparing for an invasion. A massive fleet of 1,700-meter battle cruisers, 1,100-meter support cruisers, and 1,000-meter conqueror drone ships were assembling. In the harsh glare of the Blue Giant, the waiting ships hovered far above a gap in the sphere where an intergalactic vortex would be established. Inside the Dyson Sphere, it was necessary for all ships to continually operate their energy shields due to the intense radiation generated by the star. Massive energy collectors adorned its surface, converting the radiation of the star into energy, enough energy to continuously power eight intergalactic vortexes. The simulants had found the first Dyson Sphere nearly 10,000 years previously. The science and technology required to build the massive structure was far in advance of anything the simulants ever thought possible. The Grand Council sent numerous exploration ships to the sphere to study it. It took generations, but enough was eventually learned to allow them to operate the intergalactic vortex generators. When their heavily armed exploration ships went through, the crews were astonished at what they found. There was a massive network of Dyson spheres spread across numerous galaxies, all connected by intergalactic vortexes. The simulants began to use the vortexes to travel to and explore other nearby galaxies. They found large numbers of space-going races, which would have to be overcome first if they wanted control of those galaxies. They began to make plans to extend their power and dominance over the inhabitants of those distant star systems. For hundreds of years, the simulants prepared. They tested new weapons and built larger and more powerful warships. They solidified their control over their home galaxy and then finally began the invasion of another. For thousands of years, they used the Dyson Spheres to spread slowly from one galaxy to the next. They were an unstoppable force, as civilization after civilization fell to their massive war fleets. 
While much research had been done to unlock the secrets behind the construction of the massive artifacts, many areas of the spheres remain sealed against exploration. Regardless of the methods used to try to gain entry, they met in failure. Only the immediate areas around the vortex generators seemed to be open. Accepting that, the simulants didn't hesitate to send their invasion fleets through to galaxy after galaxy. Now, they were ready to launch the next invasion. This one would be to the home galaxy of the AIs and the mysterious organic races that infested it. Admiral Tolson gazed nervously at one of the tactical displays. Two hours previously, the intergalactic vortex had activated for just a few seconds before shutting down. All 12 of the indomitable class battle stations and the 20 Type 2 stations had been placed at Condition 1. I just finished speaking to Palel and he believes the brief vortex opening was a simulant test to confirm the vortex was functional, reported Commander Arnett. He feels we can expect a fleet to come through next. Race took a deep breath. He had 145 warships with which to stop the simulants. Looking at one of the view screens, he could see one of the 12 indomitable class battle stations. If they could hold the simulants at the vortex, it would be due to their firepower. 500 particle beam satellites were also stationed around the estimated vortex opening, as close as he dared. At a single command, he could turn the area where the vortex would form into a raging inferno. Pressing a small switch on his minicom, he spoke to his fleet admirals and commanders. We expect a full activation of the intergalactic vortex at any moment, he said in a calm and commanding voice. He paused, weighing his words carefully. There's been a lot of debate as to whether this threat is real or not. I can assure you it is indeed real, or you and your ships wouldn't be here. Our plan is very simple. We'll attempt to destroy the simulant invasion fleet at the periphery of the vortex as they come through. We have no idea of the size of the fleet we'll be facing, other than in all likelihood it will be massive. The fate of our galaxy could very well depend on what we do here today. The Warhawk will not withdraw until every simulant ship has been destroyed, or we ourselves have died in battle. Race looked around the command center at the faces of his crew. They all looked just as determined as he was. Prepare for battle, he ordered. The words were scarcely out of his mouth when the warning alarms began sounding on the sensor console and red lights began flashing. Vortex activation, confirmed Lieutenant Davis. Taking a deep breath, Race nodded. This was it. All ships go to condition one, he ordered. Close with the vortex and open fire as they come through. The simulant fleet commander gazed impassively at the massed fleet preparing to enter the swirling vortex in the floor of the Dyson Sphere. Over 800 warships and 20 Conqueror drone vessels were ready to make transit. All ships were on a war footing as they were entering a relatively unknown galaxy as the ships emerged from the vortex. They would take up pre-assigned positions in the shape of a massive defensive globe until all the ships of the fleet made the transit. The fleet would then move to secure the area around the intergalactic vortex. Energy collector satellites would be deployed around the galaxy's black hole to provide a power source to send individual ships back to the Dyson Sphere, as well as send messages back when it was time for the support fleet to come through. One thing high on their priority list was to find this galaxy's Dyson Sphere. For some reason, it was not allowing the establishment of an active vortex. They knew its location from sealed records they'd found on the original Dyson Sphere. Once they had control of it and could activate the corresponding vortex, they would have unlimited travel for their invasion fleets to travel back and forth between the two galaxies. Begin transit, ordered the fleet commander in a cold and nearly emotionless voice. It was time to add another galaxy to the ever-growing numbers the simulants were bringing under their control. First assault fleet is moving into position for transit, answered his second in command. Second and third fleets will follow at two-minute intervals. Above the Dyson Sphere, a group of 70 simulant escort cruisers broke out of orbit and accelerated toward the swirling intergalactic vortex. Admiral Tolson leaned forward in his command chair, gazing at a view screen showing the swirling intergalactic vortex, easily four kilometers across. It had formed in the exact location the brief vortex had formed at earlier. All ships and stations, stand by to fire, he ordered. Commander Malin, 
set the particle beam satellites on automatic, so they will fire as soon as they detect a simulan ship. Sending the command, Malin reported. Her pulse was racing, and she could feel her heart pounding in her chest. All weapons ready to fire, reported Colonel Cowell. He stood anxiously watching the tactical displays, waiting for the first simulan ships to appear. For several minutes, the white vortex spun, and then the first simulan vessel spewed forth. 1,100-meter escort cruisers seemed to materialize out of the vortex, not one at a time, but in full squadron strength and in very tight formations. Fire, ordered Race, as more simulant ships continued to arrive. Lieutenant Travers, send a message to Fleet Command that simulant warships are transiting into the galaxy in large numbers. Add to the message we're moving to engage. We're now at war. The anxiety in the command center markedly increased. On the main view screens, hundreds of bright blue particle beams suddenly flashed into existence and smashed into the simulant vessels as the defensive satellites fired. Shields were just coming into being as the particle beam struck, smashing into the simulant hulls. At the same time, Devastator 3 missiles were launched from the Type 2 stations to take advantage of the momentary weakness of the enemy. Space seemed to light up with the steady burst of exploding 50 megaton warheads and the bright blue flashes of particle beams. It was as if a massive energy fire burned at the center of where those deadly weapons were aimed. Simulant ship after ship exploded under the devastating attack. However, before the simulant fleet could be completely destroyed, shields snapped into being on the surviving ships and weapons fire began to be returned. Then the second wave of simulant warships began to make transit. However, in this wave, there were a number of the more powerful 1,700-meter battlecruisers, which would be more difficult to destroy. More simulant ships are making transit, reported Lieutenant Davis. Battlecruiser size, and there's a lot of them. Move the fleets closer, ordered Race, his eyes intently watching the tactical displays. The only chance he had to win this battle was to destroy as many simulant ships as possible as they made transit. We need to add our firepower to the battle stations and the defensive satellites. It's the only way we're going to stop them. Particle beams firing, reported Captain Daniels from Tactical. Locking on with Devastator 3 missiles. Missile launch, another tactical officer said. On the main view screen, more brilliant flashes of light became evident as the advancing ships poured weapons fire into the heart of the emerging simulant formations. In the second simulant fleet, a high commander realized what was happening. The inhabitants of this galaxy had laid a trap for the incoming fleets, and there was nothing he could do to warn those coming behind him. This had never happened before. Somehow, this galaxy must have been warned about the impending simulant attack. Form a defensive wall in front of the vortex, he ordered briskly, as he studied the recommendations from the battle computer. We must protect the ships coming behind us to give them time to activate their energy shields. He felt anger at the audacity of such primitive organics to attempt to thwart the simulant invasion. If the ships with shields could protect those coming out of the vortex long enough, they would soon have sufficient forces to push out and destroy their attackers. Race grimaced as one of the Type II battle stations exploded in a fiery ball of light as half a dozen simulant energy beams blew it apart. The battle was becoming more intense as additional simulant ships successfully made transit, while the defending fleets were still destroying many of them. There were a growing number of enemy vessels with intact shields. Now, holding position in front of the vortex, making it more difficult to strike those still emerging. The simulants are firing upon the particle beam satellites, reported Colonel Cowell, worriedly. We're starting to lose them pretty rapidly. On one of the tactical displays, the small icons, which represented the satellites, were starting to wink out in rapid succession. Race nodded. He'd been afraid of that. The particle beam satellites had no defensive screens and were easy targets for the simulant weapons. Alton Battlecruiser Stardust is down reported Lieutenant Davis, as its green icon swelled up and vanished from the sensor screen. Race winced at hearing that. He greatly feared there would be many more ships to follow the Stardust into oblivion. All ships, continue to fire. Pour it on. We can't let them break free of the area around the vortex. Race leaned forward, his eyes focused intently on the tactical displays. This was a battle they had to win, or the consequences to the galaxy would be grim. Space was full of exploding Devastator 3 missiles, particle beams, and power beams. The simulants were responding with their own powerful energy beams as well as sublight antimatter missiles. 
In front of the Vortex, Simulant ships were packed so close together, their energy shields were nearly touching. The final Simulant fleets were making transit and were composed primarily of the large battlecruisers. As each minute passed, there were more and more surviving Simulant ships and the weapons fire became heavier. The Simulants were now using their defensive energy batteries to take out the surviving particle beam satellites in an attempt to alleviate that threat. They were also using their main energy weapons to annihilate the battle stations, which were pouring a withering particle beam fire into the massed fleets. An indomitable class battle station was under heavy attack. Numerous energy beams pummeled its shield, as well as antimatter missiles. The screen seemed to flicker under the assault, and then two energy beams struck the hull, blasting a huge glowing rent into the side of the station. There were several internal explosions, and the station's power failed momentarily. Its crew rushed to try and initiate repairs, but it was too late. Three simulant antimatter missiles slammed into the now vulnerable hull, detonating in fiery explosions. The battle station blew apart, with most of its structure being converted into gas and flaming debris. There were no survivors. We just lost an indomitable class battle station, reported Commander Arnett in a shaken voice. We've also lost six more of the Type 2s. 412 of the particle beam satellites have been taken out, added Colonel Cowell. The rest will be gone shortly. Race took a deep breath. Order the remaining indomitable class battle stations to close with the enemy. He might be ordering them to their destruction, but with their heavy energy shields, they stood the best chance of withstanding the Simulans' energy weapons fire at point-blank range. They could also cause a tremendous amount of damage. Admiral Jackson held his breath as the Dauntless shook violently and the lights in the command center briefly dimmed, then returned to full brightness. Report, he demanded, seeing a number of red lights appear on the damage control console. Heavy damage to hull section 17 and 18 at bulkhead 22, reported the damage control officer. I've sealed off the area. Casualties. At least 15 missing, reported his executive officer, Colonel Milson. It was a simulant energy beam which managed to penetrate our shields. On one of the view screens, there was a brilliant flash of light. What was that? asked Jackson, suspecting the worst. The battle cruiser Malta, the sensor operator reported. She was hit by multiple energy beams and antimatter missiles. The Malta is down. We're being hammered, Colonel Milson grated out, as the Dauntless was hit with what felt like a massive hammer. More red lights appeared on the damage control console, and he thought he could hear screams in the distance. Jackson sensed the damage being done to his ship. The hull seemed to ring with every energy beam strike to the shield, and he knew some of the energy was impacting the ship's armor. The Dauntless shuddered violently once more, and Jackson glanced over at Colonel Milson. Fusion Reactor 3 is down, reported Colonel Milson in a grave voice. We can either fire our particle beams or the power beams, but not both. Particle beams, ordered Jackson, taking in a deep breath. They seem to be most effective. Get repair crews on that reactor. I want full power to all our weapons as soon as possible. Yes, Admiral, Colonel Milson replied as he contacted engineering. Looking at one of the tactical displays, Jackson saw several other green icons blink out. The fleet was taking heavy casualties. This battle was far from over. Kalmot, the Carthian admiral in charge of the Bear Fleet, gazed determinedly at the main view screen in the command center of his battleship, the Hunter. If the reports were true, the powerful warships they were now engaging were what stood between someday rescuing clan leader Graceth and the others of the Lost Fleets. He was determined his clan would do their part to allow for that eventual rescue. While others spoke of a relief fleet, he hoped someday Graceth could return triumphantly home from the hunt. Press onward, he ordered. The enemy before us must be destroyed if we ever wish to rescue our clan brothers. This is a hunt we must win. The bear fleet continued to close with the massed simulan ships. Weapons fire between the two fleets continued to intensify as the bears bored straight ahead. First one, then two, then six of their cruisers exploded in massive bursts of energy as the simulan weapons fire blew them apart. However, the bears were making the simulans pay a heavy price as they fired particle beams and power beams into the heart of the simulan formation. Two simulant escort cruisers died after losing their shields. Then a battle cruiser exploded as bare particle beams tore it apart. This was the hunt, 
and the Bears were unwavering in their resolve to bring honor to their clan. Admiral Victel and Admiral Bacall had combined their forces into a single Alton fleet of 16 battleships and 10 battle cruisers. Already the battle cruiser Stardust had been destroyed, and other ships were reporting heavy damage. Admiral Bacall turned to his second in command, Colonel Derek Shepard, a human officer. We are suffering heavy damage across the fleet. Even our shields are failing. When hit by large numbers of simulant energy beams, Admiral Strong was correct in reporting the dangerous power of these weapons. Battleship Lexel is under heavy attack, the human sensor operator reported. He made an adjustment, and the large screen on the front wall of the command center showed the massive Alton battleship. Dozens of simulant energy beams were berating the energy shield, along with the occasional explosion of an antimatter missile. Their engineering compartment has taken a hit, and they're beginning to lose power, reported Colonel Shepard, as he listened to a status report over his minicom. Intensify fire upon the ships attacking them, ordered Admiral Bacall, in a strained voice. We must take some of the pressure off them. While he was one of the few Altons capable of serving in a combat position, it was still very difficult for him to order the deaths of others, even their enemies. The indomitable class battle stations have reached point-blank range, the sensor operator reported. Weapons fire between them and the simulants has grown so intense it's beginning to interfere with our sensors. It was at that moment half a dozen simulant energy beams blasted through the Lexel's energy shield, penetrating deep into the ship. Massive explosions rocked the ship, and large sections of the hull were blown away. On the view screen, several large gaping holes were easily visible. Admiral Bacall's face turned pale, knowing what was about to happen and that he was powerless to stop it. Suddenly, a bright explosion filled the screen, and when it cleared, the Lexel was gone. Battleship Lexel is down, reported the sensor operator. Look at the view screen, said Colonel Shepard, his eyes opening wide in awe. The 11 surviving indomitable class battle stations had closed to the point at which every one of their weapons could be brought to bear upon the remaining simulant ships. Several of the stations were nearly inside the simulant formation. The battle stations were 1,000 meters in diameter and armed with particle beam weapons, power beams, and numerous antimatter missile tubes. Each station seemed to be enclosed in a fury of brightness as the simulants were doing everything in their power to destroy them. The fleet will advance to engage the enemy ordered Admiral Bacall. Those battle stations won't last long under that type of bombardment. All the fleets were now closing with the enemy in a brave attempt to support the battle stations. Two more Carthian cruisers exploded as simulant energy beams riddled them. Four human light cruisers vanished as simulant antimatter missiles slammed into their hulls after their energy screens failed. A human battleship collided with a simulant battle cruiser and both vanished in a fiery blaze of light. The battle was growing more intense as the defenders closed to put an end to the invaders. We're taking heavy losses, reported Commander Arnett, in a worried voice as the Warhawk shuddered from an antimatter missile strike to the energy shield. So are the simulants, Race answered as he watched the tactical displays. The battle stations are starting to take a heavy toll on the enemy. At the range they're at now, Almost all of their particle beam and power beams are penetrating the simulant shields. Battle Station Reliant is reporting catastrophic damage, reported Lieutenant Davis. On one of the tactical screens, the blue icon representing the battle station suddenly swelled up and vanished. Battle Station Reliant is down. How many simulant ships remain? demanded Race. He knew the battle still could go either way. Space was full of destroyed and damaged ships. 187, Colonel Cowell answered as he studied some data on a screen near him. Many of them are damaged with weakened energy screens. Our own ships are suffering the same type of damage, Commander Arnett said with a worried frown. We might not have the ships we need to finish this. She grimaced as another battle station vanished from the tactical screen. We have one more card to play, Race answered with a deep sigh. It would be costly, but he had no other choice. Pressing a small button on his minicom, he contacted Rear Admiral Rance Weiler. Rance, it's time to send the bombers in. Once they've been launched, move your battle carriers into combat range. We're going to need their firepower. Squadrons will be launching in 30 seconds, Rance replied. We'll do you proud, Admiral. I know you will, responded Race, knowing he was sending most of those pilots to their deaths. 
The pilots' quarters on those carriers would be mostly empty when this was over. From the eight battle carriers, nearly 700 Anlon bombers launched. Each was armed with four Shrike missiles carrying 20 kiloton nuclear warheads. In addition to the Anlons, nearly 1,000 Talon fighters launched as well. The Talons would serve to take some of the pressure off the bombers so they could launch their missiles at the damaged Simulan vessels. Then fighters and bombers made several circles around the carriers as all squadrons finished launching and formed up into their attack formations. Target the damaged Simulan vessels only, ordered Rear Admiral Weiler over the Joint Squadron comm channel. If we can take out the majority of the damaged Simulan warships, we can win this battle. We'll take them out, promised Major Terrell, who was the CAG for the Saratoga and in charge of the strike. Terrell looked down at his small sensor screen and saw it was full of hundreds of small green icons. All squadrons, begin your attack runs. There'll be a lot of energy beam fire and missile fire as we close. Try not to get hit by friendly fire. The bombers were in ten ship squadrons, and the fighters fanned out to form a protective globe around the Anlons. It was essential the bombers get in close enough to deliver their missiles. Bombers and fighters have been launched, reported Commander Arnett as one of the tactical screens lit up with nearly 1,700 small green icons. I want all ships to continue to press the simulants, regardless of the damage they've suffered, Race ordered grimly. We need every particle beam, power beam, and missile. Order all ships to begin firing 100 megaton antimatter missiles. Let's light the simulants up. The remaining simulant high commander gazed impassively at the ship's tactical display. The other four high commanders had died along with their flagships. These organics are unusually dangerous, he said, as several more simulan escort cruisers died beneath the onslaught of the weapons assailing the beleaguered fleet. In many areas, their technology level seems to be on a similar level to ours. The same was reported of the fleets which made transit into the galaxy we just left, his second-in-command replied. However, there was a wide diversity in the strength and type of weapons deployed. This fleet seems to be relying more on their particle beams, and now antimatter missiles. Numerous small vessels have appeared, the sensor operator warned. The battle computer is identifying them as some type of small assault craft. Target them with our defensive weapons when they come within range, the high commander ordered. Our defensive batteries should be able to destroy them. This battle was going to be costly, but if he could manage a victory, he could still deploy enough energy collector stations to allow him to send a message in a few short weeks requesting additional reinforcements. Major Terrell winced as heavy simulant defensive fire began to focus on his incoming bombers and fighters. Spread out! Don't give them too easy a target! His words were cut short as a simulant defensive energy beam vaporized his bomber. Major Paxel felt shock at seeing the CAG's green command icon blink out. This is Major Paxel. I'm taking over. All bombers spread out and continue on your attack runs. Fight us. Try to draw some of that defensive fire off the Anlons. Space was lit up with the fiery deaths of fighters and bombers as the Simulans' defensive fire blew the small ships apart. 300 fighters and over 200 bombers died before they entered launch range. Even though the Anlons had a forward defensive screen, the Simulans' energy fire was cutting right through it. All Anlons, lock on targets and fire, ordered Captain Gail Swenson. All other officers above her had died in the heavy Simulan defensive fire. Space was crisscrossed with deadly energy beam seeking targets. Once your missiles have been released, get the hell out of there! Gail heard her targeting system beep loudly as it acquired its target, pressing the missile release switch. She fired two of her Shrike missiles at a nearby Simulan escort cruiser, which was heavily damaged and only had a few weapons still firing. The two missiles slammed home, and the ship blew apart as the 20 kiloton warheads detonated. Pulling up, she targeted the next Simulan vessel. Firing her remaining two missiles, she felt disappointment when they exploded harmlessly on the still operating energy screen. However, her missiles must have weakened the screen as another bomber's missiles penetrated blowing the stern off the vessel. Kicking in the bomber's turbos, she turned and accelerated back toward the inbound carriers. All around her, Shrike missiles were striking targets. Many found simulant hulls to explode against, while others struck, still impacted operational energy screens. Gale just hoped they were causing enough damage so the fleet could finish off the remaining simulants. Looking out of her cockpit window, she saw the indomitable battle station Invictus. 
It was under heavy attack, and even as she watched, she saw its energy screen waver, and several simulant antimatter missiles slam into the hull, blasting huge glowing crates into the thousand-meter station. A titanic explosion suddenly blew the station apart, sending debris into another nearby station, as well as several simulant vessels. She took a deep breath and looked away. Too many people were dying. She didn't want to think about how many friends she'd lost in the last few minutes. Admiral Victel found himself too deep in the simulant formation as his ship became cut off from the other Anlon warships. He felt his flagship, the Rayless, shake violently, and warning alarms sounded on the damage control console. On the large view screen, he saw a heavily damaged simulant battlecruiser turn toward the Rayless. Continue on course, Admiral Victel ordered in a calm voice. From the lights on the damage control console, he knew his ship was mortally damaged. The least he could do was ensure another simulant ship died along with her. Moments later, the two ships collided, and space lit up as glowing suns appeared where the two ships had been. When the light faded, all that remained was a glowing and scattering debris field. Alton battleship Rayless is down, uttered Lieutenant Davis in shock. It rammed a simulant battlecruiser. Fighters and bombers are returning to the carriers, Colonel Cal reported, his face a ghastly white. We lost 70% of the bombers and 40% of the fighters. We lost every one of the CAGs. A squadron captain led the strike at the end. Race swallowed hard at hearing the casualty report. He'd known they would lose a lot of them. How badly did we hurt the simulants? They're down to 82 ships still operational, and almost all of them are damaged to some extent, Commander Arnett reported. With the remaining battle stations in our ships, we should be able to take them. Let's finish this then, Race ordered his eyes flashing with a glint of steel. I don't want a single one of their ships to escape. An hour later, it was over. The last simulant ship had been changed into Stardust, and the fleet had gone back to Condition 2 as it began search and recovery operations. How badly did they hurt us? Race asked, as he leaned back in his command chair and tried to relax. He knew they'd come dangerously close to losing the battle. Bad, Commander Arnett replied with a grim look. We lost all 500 of the particle beam satellites, 18 of the Type II stations, 8 of the Indomitable stations, and the remaining 4 will need major repairs. What about our fleet units? Race was deeply concerned about what would happen if the simulants tried to come through with another fleet anytime soon. It would take a while for reinforcements to reach the Galactic Center once the report of this battle went out. Third fleet losses are four battleships, seven battle cruisers, nine strike cruisers, two battle carriers, and eight light cruisers, Commander Arnett reported in a strained voice. Many of those ships had been with Third Fleet for several years. She'd known some of those ship commanders and officers very well. Admiral Jackson lost one battleship, two battle cruisers, and three strike cruisers. The Altons lost six battleships and four battle cruisers, including the Rayless and Admiral Victel. The Carthians lost 16 of their cruisers. And finally, the New Providence fleet lost 9 of their battle cruisers. 71 ships, Ray spoke in a low voice. These were the largest fleet losses since the war with the Hawklands and the AIs. What about damages? Heavy, replied Madeline, shaking her head. Every ship is going to need some repair time. A few will need to be towed to a shipyard. Let's get the four battle stations repaired first, Race ordered. They can remain on ground at the Vortex site while we start on repairs. With any kind of luck, we'll see substantial reinforcements before the simulants attempt to come through again. At least, Race hoped they would. The nearest reinforcements would have to come from Astral, New Providence, and Kareth. There were a few small fleet bases deep in what was formerly the Hawkland Slave Empire, but Race wasn't certain it would be wise to raid those bases of their ships. What if they come through before we're reinforced or finish our repairs? asked Colonel Cowell. He was still feeling shaken at how close they'd come to losing the battle. He knew all too well that if not for the Indomitable-class battle stations, the Simulans would have blown right through Third Fleet and the other defenders. Race looked over at the colonel and then replied, We're in no shape to fight another battle. If the Simulans come through in force, we'll have no choice but to withdraw and destroy the capacitor stations. Then what about the relief fleets? Cowell asked, his eyes growing wide. We won't be able to send them. I know, Race said solemnly. Let's just hope the simulants don't come too soon, or Admiral Strong and those with him will be on their own permanently. Race turned away, 
lost in thought. He needed to get his battle report and assessment done. One of those reports needed to go to Fleet Admiral Strath. Time was about to run out for the relief fleets. If they weren't launched soon, they never would be. Chapter 14 Jeremy was sitting in a beach lounger at one of the large oceanside resorts built to allow the crews of the orbiting ships to enjoy some quality leave time. Kelsey had finally demanded he take a few days off to relax before he burned himself out from constant worry. He'd relented and agreed to come down to Gaia. One thing he feared more than the simulants was an angry wife. How are the wedding plans going? asked Katie looking over at Angela, sitting on a lounger next to Brace. Are Ariel and Clarissa helping? Angela brushed her brunette hair back from her eyes and grimaced. They're full of suggestions, she said. You wouldn't believe all of the ideas the two of them have managed to come up with. You'd think they were the ones getting married. Brace laughed and nodded his head. Those two AIs are enjoying helping with the wedding. I don't believe they've ever done something quite like this before. Jeremy grinned. He could well imagine what the couple was going through. He was glad he'd asked General McGowan if he could spare Brace for a few days. This was the first time since the distant horizon had arrived at Gaia months back that all six of them managed to take some leave time together. Have you decided where the wedding's going to be? Kelsey asked. She was wearing a dark blue two-piece, which did a good job of accenting her figure. We're thinking about here on the beach, Angela replied. It's a beautiful setting. That might be a problem. Katie said with a frown. I strongly suspect Ariel and Clarissa will demand to be in attendance. Can you set up some holographic projectors on the beach for them? Angela asked. I was thinking about having them in the wedding. Katie pursed her lips and thought. Maybe, she said after a moment. I'll need to talk to Miko. We've never projected their holograms this far. I'm sure you'll figure something out, said Kevin. He took a deep sip of the fruit drink he was having and then looked over at Jeremy. You really need to try this drink. It tastes very similar to the ones they serve on the beach resorts on Nutellas. At the mention of Nutellas, everyone became quiet. It was hard to accept they would never see those resorts again or be able to go home. Kelsey cleared her throat and looked at Kevin. How are the hamburgers here? Passable, Kevin replied grudgingly. Katie wouldn't let me bring any down from the Avenger or Distant Horizon. Everyone laughed at Kevin's predicament. Katie had brought cases of hamburgers on the distant horizon and was rationing how many Kevin could have each day. Hamburgers and french fries were Kevin's favorite food, and he'd been vastly disappointed a few years back when the lost fleets had run out of the meat they'd brought from the Federation. Brace, how do you like your new post? Jeremy asked. We've been busy, replied Brace, taking Angela's hand and squeezing it. The base is finished, and the Marines have been settled in. You saw the scavenger robot on the distant horizon? Asked Kevin. Yeah, Brace replied. Damn scary looking thing. I wouldn't want to meet one of them in a dark alley. I wasn't involved in fighting on the surface when we encountered them, but several of the marines that were told me all about it. They're actually called conqueror drones, Katie said brusquely. She didn't like talking about the killer robots. Miko and I found that out after looking more into their programming. Conqueror drones repeated Brace with a frown. Sounds ominous. Let's go for a swim, suggested Angela, standing and pulling Brace up with her. The water looks great. Jeremy watched the two run off into the water, splashing each other and laughing loudly. He wished every day could be like this one. They look good together, Kelsey said, coming over and sitting down next to Jeremy. I'm glad, Katie commented, as she watched the two in the water. They have a lot to look forward to. Kelsey looked down at the sand and dug her toes into it. The sand here felt the same as the sand on the beaches of Nutellus. Jeremy, how much danger are we in? We don't know, he replied truthfully. Andrum and several other Alton scientists have been studying the simulant tracking device we found on the distant horizon. We're not certain how far its communication system could have penetrated through the nebula. There's little doubt the simulants probably tracked the distant horizon to its last hyperspace dropout point. That was eight light years away. The simulants should be able to put two and two together and figure out where we're hiding eventually. What will happen if they show up here? Asked Katie, with a deeply concerned look in her light green eyes. 
We're building more particle beam satellites, Jeremy answered. He decided it would be better to build more of the satellite than the Type II battle stations. The satellites could be built faster and in much greater numbers. This is our new home, Katie said, taking Kevin's hand and holding it tightly. I don't want to lose it. We won't lose it, Jeremy promised. Andrum and the Altons are working on two separate methods to keep the simulans out of the nebula. If either work, we'll be perfectly safe. What if they come before those are ready? Jeremy looked at Katie. Sometimes he still saw the young 14-year-old who had come to the Fleet Academy full of excitement and thousands of questions. Back in those days, she even had a crush on him. We'll be ready, Jeremy promised. Between the fleets, the battle stations, and the particle beam satellites, I'm confident we can hold back the simulants until Andrum is ready to deploy the devices they're working on. Let's go for a swim, Kelsey suggested. Work and the simulants was something she didn't want to discuss on their leave. She knew she was just as guilty as the others for bringing it up. They were supposed to be here to get away from all of that. It had been hard enough just to talk Jeremy into taking a few days off. Nodding his head, Jeremy stood up. The water looks good, he said. Looking over at Kevin and Katie, he added, Last one in pays for supper tonight. Crap, muttered Kevin, as he jumped up and then nearly tripped over his lounge chair. He grabbed Katie's hand and sprinted toward the water, dragging her along. Guess we're buying supper, Kelsey said, putting her arms around Jeremy and gently kissing him on the lips. Yes, replied Jeremy, smiling. Did I forget to tell you they're letting us stay here for free, not charging for our meals? Kelsey laughed and shook her head. Stepping out of Jeremy's arms, she began walking toward the water. It didn't take but a few moments, and the two of them joined their four friends. These were times they would long remember. Kelsey just hoped there were many more of them. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes was in her quarters on the distant horizon, reading a novel from her bookshelf. She'd brought nearly 100 hardback books along. The digital library on the ship had contained tens of thousands of books, but she enjoyed the feel of turning the pages and sitting back in a comfortable chair with her feet tucked underneath her. Clarissa suddenly popped into existence in front of Catherine with a confused look on her face. Why do you read those? They're from my home on Cirrus, Catherine replied as she looked up at the AI. She had grown used to the AI popping in and out. I've always enjoyed reading. It helps me to relax and takes my mind off things for a while. I see, Clarissa said. Sort of like when Ariel and I take different sides in simulations to see who has come up with the better battle tactics. Sort of, Catherine answered with a nod. Is there a reason for this visit? These originators Andrum and Shilu mentioned, Clarissa said, looking inquisitive. Do you think there's any chance they could still be alive somewhere? Catherine closed her book and looked thoughtfully at the AI. I doubt it, she said. Andrum suggested the Dyson Sphere we discovered was over three million years old. The science to build such a thing is far in advance of anything we've imagined. Could there be more than one Dyson Sphere? asked Clarissa. Andrum mentioned the possibility the vortexes could be linked to others. It's possible, uttered Catherine, her eyes growing wide at the thought. We detected 27 vortex rings in the hull of the sphere, Clarissa pointed out. What if each one connects to another Dyson sphere, and those to even more? Andrum did say these originators had colonized hundreds of worlds in our galaxy, Catherine mused, as she thought over the ramifications. They could have been much more widespread, perhaps existing in numerous galaxies, all connected by the spheres. I wonder if there's a Dyson Sphere in our home galaxy, asked Clarissa. Her light blue eyes had the look of deep concentration. If there is, why did the simulants come through at the black hole when they first made contact with the AIs? Asked Catherine. She felt a tingling at the back of her neck, thinking about the possibility of there being a sphere in the home galaxy. If the originators had colonized several hundred worlds, wouldn't that seem to indicate there should be one? Perhaps they hadn't found the Dyson Sphere in our galaxy or been able to activate it. If there is a Dyson Sphere back home, we need to locate it, stated Catherine worriedly as she thought of the ramifications. Somehow, we need to get word back to the Federation to begin searching. That might not be possible, Clarissa said, 
placing her hands on her hips. We lost the capacitor stations as well as the vortex generators. It will take months to build new ones, and the simulans will be on watch in the blue giant nebula in case we return. I'll put it in my report to Admiral Strong, Catherine said, knowing there was little they could do. Clarissa was correct. They might never be able to send another message home. If there was a Dyson Sphere, the Federation would have to locate it on their own. The next day, Catherine was taking a tour of the forward section of the ship where most of the damage had occurred. Outside, two fleet repair vessels were busy laying new plates of battle armor over the shattered hull. Reaching the area where the simulant energy beam had burned a hole deep inside the ship, she paused upon seeing Commander Grissom. Admiral, Grissom said, standing up from where she'd been inspecting a recently installed metal support column. How are the repairs going? Catherine was anxious to get the ship repaired. With its main weapons disabled, the distant horizon wouldn't be that great of help in a major battle if the simulants found them. Have you been outside? Grissom asked. There's dozens of spider robots crawling along the hull doing repairs. We should have all the outer hull damage repaired within a week. Two more weeks for the particle beam cannons and power beam projectors to be rebuilt. What about the new ion cannon? asked Catherine. It would be nice if the distant horizon could punch holes in the simulant shield so missiles could penetrate. Ion beams seem to have a much more pronounced effect disabling the shields than a particle beam or power beam. It's coming along, Commander Grissom said as she stepped back to allow several deckhands to pass by, who were carrying some equipment. The Altons can't quite figure out how to miniaturize all the components to create more of the defense globes. They know what needs to be done, but we just don't have the equipment here to do it with. The big cannon, they feel pretty confident they can get to work. Catherine stepped over to the opening, where the simulant energy beam had torn through the ship. There was a safety railing up and peering inside, she could see the jagged gash that extended several decks down into the ship. Welding arcs flashed regularly, and in some areas, cutting torches were being used to remove damaged metal. Still a lot of work to do, uttered Catherine, wishing there was more she could do to help. We'll get there, promised Commander Grissom, walking over to stand next to the Admiral. When we're done, the ship will be as good as new. Dalethon has the best people working on it. Keep me posted, ordered Catherine. I'm going over to the clan protector to meet with Shilum and several other Altons from the science ships. They've been studying the data on the computer drive we brought from Astral and have an idea about strengthening the ship's energy shield. That drive has a lot of information on it, Grissom said, nodding her head. If the AIs had spent more time studying the information they were storing on the computers at Astral, the Federation would never have stood a chance. I know, Catherine replied. They thought their weapons technology was supreme and they didn't want to take the risk of anything too advanced falling in the hands of their proxy races. They only used the information they needed to in order to establish their empire so they could work on their great project. Catherine watched the work for a few more moments and then left to go over to the clan protector. Catherine stepped into one of the large briefing rooms on the mobile shipyard. She was greatly surprised to see Dalethon, Andrum, Shilum, Kareen, Miko, and Rear Admiral Susan Marks. Admiral Strong is taking a few days off down on Gaia, so he asked me to sit in on this meeting, Rear Admiral Marks explained. I understand this has to do with the shield modifications for the distant horizon, said Catherine, as she sat down across from Susan. Yes, boomed Dalethon, his large eyes focusing on Rear Admiral Barnes. The Altons have found a possible method to greatly enhance the shield capability of the Exploration Dreadnought. Unfortunately, it will mean more work for my construction people. We want to use heterodyne technology on the energy shield, explained Andrum. Heterodyne, said Catherine, feeling confused. I thought we already modulated the frequency of the shield when it's in operation. Not like this, Shilum said. She stood up and turned on a view screen. Instantly, a scale version of the distant horizon appeared showing the energy screen which normally surrounded the ship. We modulate the frequency of the shield to enhance its ability to disperse energy. What we intend to do is modulate the flow of the energy powering the shield. What good will that do? asked Catherine. We believe it will greatly influence the amount of energy the shield can disperse, Miko said, standing up and gesturing toward the view screen. On the screen, the energy shield began to fluctuate, and then several energy beams impacted it. 
the energy was spread out over a small section of the shield and gradually dissipated. That's how our normal screen operates, she said. Now watch this simulation of the new screen with both the frequency and power being modulated. The energy beams struck the shield again, but were dispersed over a much larger area. Satisfied, Miko turned the screen off. As you can see, by using this method, we can increase the effectiveness of the energy shield by nearly 200%, Andrum said. Catherine and Susan both leaned back, looking surprised. Can we apply this to all of our ships? Susan asked. Unfortunately, no, answered Andrum, shaking his head. It takes the full power of a Fusion 5 reactor just to power the energy modulation. We can use this technique on some of our ships, which have already been modified with Fusion 5 reactors, such as the Avenger, Warrior's Pride, Shree, Real, the Orion, and the two surviving AI spheres from the trip to the Blue Giant Cluster, commented Deothon. The battlecruiser Gaia can also be so equipped. We need to try the shield out first, suggested Rear Admiral Marks. Can we bring the Gaia back inside the clan protector and make the necessary modifications? It shouldn't be a problem, answered Deothon, placing one of his large hands upon the conference table. It won't take more than a day to make the changes to the battlecruiser. I'll check with Admiral Strong, but let's plan on doing that, suggested Susan. Anyone else have anything else we need to discuss? I've spoken to the Command AI, said Corrine. As you know, one of the things Admiral Strong wants to do is create more AIs. We have the designs for the new AI ships, Dalethon said, his large brown eyes looking at the group. I'd like to start construction of the first one as soon as possible. I spoke to Admiral Strong briefly about that before our meeting, Susan said. He wants to hold off constructing any new AI ships for now, with more emphasis placed on particle beam satellites. We have added an additional assembly line for the satellites, Dalethon reported. Admiral Strong wants 3,000 of them in orbit around Gaia as soon as possible. Rear Admiral Marks nodded her head. Admiral Strong is concerned that the tracking device the simulants managed to place on the New Horizon will eventually lead them to our nebula, and soon after that, to Gaia. What about the new AIs? asked Corrine, her eyes focusing intently on Susan. He approved the first 100, the Rear Admiral replied. He wants you to oversee their programming. The Command AI will be pleased to hear this, Corrine responded, thrilled with the new responsibility. I can assure you, there will be no problems. Zed and I have set up the Master Codex to reprogram the new AIs with a desire to protect the organic races of the Federation, as well as any others we designate. Rear Admiral Marks nodded. Zed was one of the science AIs that had been working with Corrine. Very well. Go ahead and build them. Admiral Strong wants regular reports on the progress, particularly if there are any problems. There won't be, promised Corrine. Since we removed all traces of the simulant programming from the Master Codex, their entire attitude toward organic races has changed. We've even noticed a considerable change in their relationship with other members of my race. It seems as if the AIs are going out of their way to be useful to any Altons. I haven't been around too many AIs since the distant horizon arrived originally, Catherine said with a sigh. I'm still not sure if I'll ever get used to them being around. We've had years, commented Rear Admiral Marks. It took some time getting used to. There was a lot of mistrust in the beginning. Even now, there are some who lost family members or friends in the war who will never completely forgive the AIs. The meeting continued for a few more minutes, with the subject changing to the repairs on the distant horizon. When it was over, Catherine returned to her ship. She was going to take a hot, relaxing bath, and then lie down in bed and finish reading the book she'd started earlier. Jeremy was lying in bed next to Kelsey. They'd just finished some passionate lovemaking, and he was feeling relaxed, more so than he had in a long time. He could feel her hip up against his, and turning over, he moved his hand across her stomach and pulled her a little closer. I really enjoyed that, Kelsey said with a yawn. I'm glad you could get away for a few days. I wonder what our parents would think if they could see us now, Jeremy said. Kelsey giggled. 
I hope not like we are now here in bed. No, answered Jeremy, grinning. Where we're at in our careers. His dad had been the first human admiral and responsible for establishing the Fleet Academy on the moon, as well as laying the foundation for the establishment of the new Human Federation of Worlds. Kelsey's parents had lived in Cirrus, and her father was the fleet admiral at the time. That had been several hundred years ago. Kelsey, Kevin, Katie, Angela, and he had spent considerable time in cryosleep, so they could be part of the war against the Hocklands. It had been a hard decision for them to go into cryosleep and leave their parents behind. I think they would be proud of us, Kelsey said softly. I know my father would be. He always told me I could accomplish anything if I only set my mind to it. I remember my first flying lessons with him and how encouraging he always was. We've come a long ways, Jeremy said. By going into cryosleep, we missed out on a lot with our families. They did leave us messages, Kelsey replied. I just wish they could have been there for our wedding. Mom would have loved it. We have another day before I have to go back up to the Avenger, Jeremy said. I wish we could stay here longer, but there's so much that needs to be done. I know, answered Kelsey, turning over and kissing Jeremy gently on his lips. Let's just enjoy the time we've got. It might be a while before we get to do this again. Jeremy closed his eyes. Kelsey was right. This time off was good for all of them. He just hoped there would be other times to come down and enjoy the beach resorts. The problem was the simulans, and if they could find Gaia, if they did, Jeremy wasn't sure what would become of the lost fleets. Chapter 15 Admiral Race Tolson breathed a sigh of relief as more ships from the Federation began to exit vortexes close to the three capacitor stations. For the last two months, the Federation and its allies had been rushing warships to the Black Hole to reinforce Third Fleet. There had been a near panic in the Federation when it was learned what Admiral Tolson's command faced when the simulants tried to invade. A lot of finger-pointing had been done, particularly after it had become known Race had warned his superiors about the possible threat. That's Sixth Fleet, reported Commander Arnett, as she recognized the flagship, the Orion Victory. The original Orion Victory had been destroyed in the battle against the AIs when it was attacking the capacitor stations. It had also resulted in the death of then Fleet Admiral Carla Johnson. Admiral Correll will be in command. Race nodded. Sixth Fleet was the largest contingent of Federation ships to arrive so far. With its six battleships, ten battle cruisers, twenty strike cruisers, eight battle carriers, and ten light cruisers, it would substantially increase the ships Race had to place around the Vortex area. The week before, Admiral Xanth of the Kessels had arrived in his flagship, Fangs of War, along with 10 battle cruisers, 20 heavy cruisers, and 15 light cruisers. Admiral Correll is requesting an immediate meeting, Lieutenant Travers announced as the message came in over her comm station. Problems? asked Madeline, looking over at the Admiral. Probably, sighed Race. He may have orders directly from the Federation Council. He'd been expecting this to happen eventually. You think they want to close the weakness in space at the Vortex location by detonating the capacitor stations? Surmised Madeline. All of the reinforcement fleets for Admiral Strong aren't here yet. Some won't arrive for at least another six weeks. I know, Race answered, as he stood up and gazed at one of the primary view screens showing the Orion victory. The battleship was a new build, only recently finishing its space trials, after leaving one of the construction bays at New Telus Station, we're going to have some tough decisions to make. Turning toward Lieutenant Travers, he gave her a message to send to Admiral Correll. Tell the Admiral I'll meet him on board Capacitor Station 1 in two hours. I'll also want Admiral Jackson, Admiral Bacall, Admiral Xanth, Admiral Kalmat, and Admiral Scythe to attend. What about the Alton Research Scientists? Asked Madeline. I'm sure Admiral Correll will have a lot of questions. Race nodded. That's probably a good idea. Go ahead and add Shea Malay and Palel Mays to the list. You know Admiral Kalmat and Admiral Scythe will not want to hear any talk of sealing the Vortex area before the relief fleets are launched. I know, answered Race. The Carthian Admiral and the new Providence Admiral were adamant about sending the relief fleets to Admiral Strong. The Bears were still hoping for some way to rescue them. We'll see how the meeting goes. Race let out a deep sigh. Messages from Fleet Command had been few and far between. 
Perhaps now he would find out what was going on. Two hours later, Race and the other admirals were in a large conference room set up in Capacitor Station 1. Once Race was satisfied everyone was present, he began the meeting. Admiral Carell, I'm glad to see your fleet. With the reinforcements we've received thus far, as well as the battle stations which have been rushed to us, I'm confident we can hold the Vortex area against any possible simulant attack. Admiral Carell looked around the group as if he was hesitant to speak. Carell had been an admiral for nearly eight years and was a firm believer in doing everything by the book. He was an older man with gray around his temples. Unfortunately, the Federation Council doesn't agree with your assessment, he stated very bluntly. They want the Vortex area destabilized immediately to ensure the simulants don't come through again. No, roared Admiral Calmot, standing up as fur bristling. The large bear was a dark brown in color and towered over the conference table. Kareth will not allow the Vortex area to be destabilized until the relief fleets have gone through. We must send new warriors through to assist Clan Leader Grayseth in the hunt. Nor will New Providence, said Admiral Scythe, also rising to his feet. Fleet Admiral Strath has requested we send aid to Admiral Strong, and we fully intend to do that. Our relief fleet will be arriving in another two weeks. Ours as well, stated Kalmot. I have my orders, Corell said evenly. The Council had decreed the Vortex area to be destabilized. I am also to remind you Fleet Admiral Strath is no longer an active officer in the fleet. He's retired. The Federation has no say over what Kareth or New Providence does, added Kalmot loudly, his large eyes gazing challengingly at Admiral Corell. As for Fleet Admiral Strath, my people will always follow his orders. He is a wise leader of the hunt and should be obeyed without question. Admiral Corell shifted uneasily in his chair. He hadn't been around very many Carthians. I can only pass on my orders, he said in a less certain voice. Am I being removed from command? demanded Race. There was no way he was going to allow the capacitor stations to be used to destroy the vortex area before the relief fleets went through, at least not as long as he was in command. No, replied Corell, grudgingly. Fleet Admiral Nagumo is quite satisfied with your performance and how you stopped the simulant attack. For that reason, he was able to convince the Council to leave you in command of the forces here. How long is the Council going to give me to close the weakened area of space in the Vortex area? For once, Race was glad of the weeks-long communication lag between here and the Federation. Corell hesitated for a moment and then spoke. They weren't specific, he admitted. They told me to inform you to close it as soon as possible, without risking danger to the forces under your command. My worlds are part of the alliance the Federation has formed spoke up Admiral Xanth. I was at the great battle here when Admiral Strong flew the Avenger into the heart of the enemy. He couldn't know whether he would survive or if his command would perish. What he did that day saved the Federation and my worlds, as well as all the other organic races of this galaxy. If the Eternity device had sent out its deadly hyperwave, some of us in this room would be dead now. The rest would be waiting for our worlds to die. I feel confident my people would want the relief fleets launched, even if we take a risk by leaving the Vortex area as it is for a few more weeks. We have brought all the Indomitable-class battle stations from Astral, Admiral Bacall added as the white-haired Alton leaned back and gazed at the group. New stations even now are en route to Astral to replace them. We also have 2,000 particle beam satellites focused on that area of space, which have been furnished by my people as well as New Providence. It's doubtful whether the simulants can launch a successful attack against the forces we now have available. I am only bringing the orders of the Council, Admiral Corell replied defensively. I'm not in command here. All eyes shifted to Admiral Tolson for his response. 
If we close the vortex, we're probably sealing the fates of the Lost Fleet. Race began in a soft voice. They don't have the supplies or the equipment to survive long term. In a galaxy controlled by the simulants. Even in the nebula they're currently hiding in, they'll eventually be found and forced to fight. Not only that, if we truly want to stop the simulants from invading our galaxy in the future, Admiral Strong needs the forces to keep them at bay. Hillel cleared his throat and looked expectantly at the Admiral as if he wanted to say something. Yes, Palel, Race asked curiously. It may make no difference if we close this area of space off to the simulants, he said in an even voice. Our sensor recordings of the vortex they established, while their fleet was making transit, revealed some startling properties. That vortex was much more powerful than the one the AI's great project was designed to produce. Stronger? asked Admiral Jackson in disbelief. There were over 1,000 capacitor stations around the black hole. It took the AI centuries to build those power collectors. Are you saying the simulants have something even bigger? Not necessarily bigger, Fallel said, shaking his head. Just more powerful. So what does that mean? asked Reyes. He thought by destabilizing the vortex area, the simulants would not have the power to open up another spatial vortex. That's what Palel had indicated in an earlier meeting. They have the power to open a vortex anywhere in our galaxy, replied Palel. It's just easier here at the galactic center. Due to the weakness of space in the vicinity of the original vortex, they can shift its exit point by applying more energy to create a smaller vortex, which will allow them to open it anywhere. Instead of sending an entire fleet through, they might have to send one ship at a time instead. If our sensor readings are correct, they have the energy to do just that. The room was silent as everyone thought about what Palel had just said. Then there's no point in destabilizing the vortex area, Admiral Kalmott said. We're better off allowing the simulants to appear here, where we can destroy their ships as they emerge. At some point in time, They'll realize what's happening, Shea said, joining in on the conversation. I'm sure their ships were bringing energy collection stations, so they could at least create a small spatial vortex to send messages back and forth. That's why they want to exit here, so they can use the energy from the black hole to power their systems. When the simulants in the Lost Fleet's galaxy don't receive those messages, they'll suspect something's wrong. They'll come through somewhere else to discover what's happened, said Admiral Bacall. He leaned forward with his tall frame nearly over the conference table. We must keep the vortex area open until we can send the reinforcing fleets through. There is one other thing, Palel said with an intense look on his face. If we blow up the capacitor stations in the area of space which has been weakened, it will disrupt that area severely. In order for the simulants to change the endpoint of their intergalactic vortex, it will take a tremendous amount of energy. They currently have the energy to change the exit locations of the vortex, but once the area of space here has been destabilized, they will have to apply even more energy to prevent the vortex from being drawn to this location. So, even though they may still be able to send ships through, it might be in very small numbers said Admiral Carell, seizing upon those words. If the vortex area here stays open, they could send large numbers through. If we reinforce Admiral Strong, he may be able to disrupt the simulants to the point where they can send no ships, Race was quick to point out. Carell frowned. If you don't destroy the vortex area, the Council will remove you from command. It will take several weeks to get a message all the way back to the Federation. Ray said. By the time the Council responds, the relief fleets will have been sent through. At that point, I will follow their orders and destroy the Vortex area. I hope you're not making a mistake, Corell said with a frown. My orders are to place my fleet under your command until such a time as the Council order has been carried out. Then let's hope we can complete our mission before the simulants return, Race responded. He looked over at Shea. What's the progress on Capacitor Station 2? It will be ready in four weeks, she replied. Capacitor Station 3 suffered much more damage. We can have it at 
Well, the three stations have enough power to open an intergalactic vortex long enough to get the relief fleets through. They will, with the alterations we've made to their power retention systems, Shea answered. By applying Altum Power Storage Technology, we've greatly enhanced the amount of energy the capacitor stations can hold. How much more? Each station will be able to hold six times the energy than what they were originally designed for. We'll be able to open an intergalactic vortex 800 meters in diameter for 38 minutes before we run out of power. That will have to do, Ray said. He knew by delaying the destruction of the vortex area, he was probably ending his career. Once word of what he'd done reached Fleet Command, there would be no doubt in his mind orders would be sent for Admiral Corell to relieve him. Hopefully by then, the relief fleets would be on their way and he will have fulfilled his mission. On Macon, former Fleet Admiral Heden Strath was standing on the shores of the lake, watching the sun slowly descend toward the distant horizon. The orange-red colors of the fading sun covered the western sky. I love sunsets here, Janice said, as she reached out and took Heden's hand. Heden smiled and looked down at her swollen belly. Still, no pains? I have a few more weeks yet, according to the doctor, Janice replied. I spoke to Amanda earlier. She plans on coming early next week and staying until I have the baby. The guest room is ready. Is she bringing her son? Of course, Janice answered with a grin. That way you can get used to having a little one around the house. Janice could tell something was bothering Heden. What's wrong? It's the damn council, he answered tightly. The senators from Bliss and Serenity managed to get a motion passed to destroy the vortex area around the black hole by detonating the capacitor stations. Oh no, Janice said, her eyes growing wide with concern. What will Race do? I don't think he'll do it, Heaton replied. He might just have enough time to get the relief mission launched before they remove him from command. Lose his command, exclaimed Janice, growing angry. They can't do that. They can and probably will. Heaton answered, I'll do what I can to prevent it, but I don't know if it'll be enough. Are the relief fleets on their way to the galactic center? Yes, Heaton replied with a deep and satisfied sigh. More ships than I could hope for. If they can make it through, then Jeremy will have what he needs to take the war to the simulans. If he's successful, he might just save our galaxy. You said you knew Jeremy's father. Yes, Heaton replied. Admiral Jason Strong, I can still recall the day he stepped into my office after making the trip to Ceres and one of the old Avengers shuttles. The damn things were over 100 years old, and he still took the risk to see what was there. That was a long time ago, commented Janice. Yes, it was, agreed Heaton. I think Jeremy's dad would be very proud of what his son has accomplished. Are you sending a personal message to Jeremy? Heaton was silent for a long moment. He let out a deep sigh and nodded. Yes, he answered. It's necessary for him to know what's at stake. He has to take the war to the simulans. Janice placed her hand on her belly. She could feel their daughter kicking. I think your daughter will make a fine admiral someday. Heaton looked at Janice in surprise. I strongly suspect both our daughter and Amanda's son will follow in their parents' footsteps, she said. Perhaps, Heaton said turning to look at the sun, which was beginning to slide beneath the distant horizon. He could remember standing here many times with his brother, watching the sunset and talking about the big fish that had gotten away. Those days had been so much simpler. Let's go inside and eat, Janice suggested. We need to talk about what we're going to do while Amanda's here. She might have some useful ideas about this simulant threat. He nodded. It was good to talk to Amanda and reminisce about old times. Chapter 16 Above Gaia, 2,000 small particle beam satellites and 40 Type II battle stations were in stationary orbit above the planet, ready to open fire on the enemy at a moment's notice. The Type II battle stations were 150 meters in diameter and had upgraded energy shields two particle beam cannons, four power beam cannons, 12 missile tubes containing Devastator 3 missiles, and defensive laser turrets. 
Their fusion reactors had been upgraded from a Class 1 to a Class 3, giving the stations much more power than the previous models. Slightly above them were the massed fleets that had come through the runaway spatial vortex nearly seven years previously. 470 1,500-meter AI spheres surrounded the planet in a massive defensive globe. At any one time, 200 of the AI ships were at Condition 1, ready to respond to a simulant attack. The AIs, not being organic, required no rest and were determined to defend the organics who in the past had been their enemies. Fourth Fleet was in a higher orbit, in a loose defensive formation. Its 92 warships, led by its flagship, the Avenger, were prepared for an impending simulant attack. Further along the same orbit, Graceth's Carthian fleet was in a defensive formation around the mobile shipyard, the Clan Protector. Graceth commanded 33 warships, led by his flagship, the Warrior's Pride. Alton Admiral Cletius, aboard his flagship, the Sidonia II, had a powerful fleet of Alton warships. His 78 Alton battleships and 59 battle cruisers were the heart of Admiral Strong's planned defense against the simulants. With the superior technology and heavy weapons of the Alton ships, they would take the lead in any attack against an incursion. Last of all was the Clan Protector itself. The mobile shipyard had been greatly expanded and was presently over 6,000 meters in length and 2,000 in width. Massive weapons emplacements covered its hull, and the entire structure could be protected by an energy screen powered by four Fusion 5 reactors. For weeks, the fleets had waited, knowing it was only a matter of time before the simulant found their hidden sanctuary. Kevin was leaning back in his chair in front of his sensor console, watching the screen with a bored look upon his face. They'd waited weeks for the expected appearance of the simulants, and nothing had happened. There had even been some discussion the simulants might not have been able to trace the exploration dreadnought to Gaia using their tracking device. Perhaps the last few jumps had put the distant horizon out of range of simulant detection, and the planet would remain safe and undetected inside the nebula. Stay awake, cautioned Ariel, who suddenly popped into existence next to Kevin with a grin on her youthful face. You're supposed to be setting an example for the rest of the crew. After all, you're one of the special five. I absolutely hate that name, responded Kevin, frowning and letting out a deep sigh. We're not any more special than anyone else in the fleet. That's debatable, responded Ariel, placing her hands on her shapely hips and staring at Kevin. Are you going to be in Angela's wedding? Kevin nodded his head. I'll be there, answered Kevin. Not sure what she has planned for me, but I'm sure she'll have me doing something. Ariel giggled. You could be an usher. If the wedding's going to be on the beach, you could even go barefoot. Kevin glared at Ariel. Don't even suggest that to Angela. Have you heard when the wedding's going to be? They're waiting until the simulant threat has been dealt with, Ariel replied, her dark eyes looking over at Angela's communication station. Currently, there was another woman sitting there, as Angela was over on the distant horizon visiting Kelsey and Katie. Just as well, Kevin said. He was about to say more when an alarm went off on his sensor console. What the hell? He muttered, sitting up straight and powering up the Avengers' full complement of sensors. His hands moved rapidly over his console as he began calling up data on the disturbance. It's a spatial vortex, confirmed Ariel, her face turning pale. It's between the orbits of the third and fourth planets. The entire system of Gaia had been seeded with vortex detection satellites. The satellites were designed to detect any nearby vortexes and report on the type of ship that emerged. Video coming in from Satellite 212 reported Ariel. I'm putting it up on the main view screen. On the screen, an 1,100-meter simulant escort cruiser appeared, its six spires glinting dangerously in the starlight. Go to condition one, ordered Kevin, his eyes growing wide. The simulants had finally found them. He pressed another button on his console as red lights began to flash and klaxons began to sound. Commander Malin, report to the command center. A simulant escort cruiser has just jumped into the outer system. Then he turned toward Ariel. Contact Jeremy. I think he's on the clan protector and inform him of what's happened. Yes, Kevin, Ariel replied, without hesitation. She didn't bother to inform Kevin that being a sensor operator didn't give him the authority to take the entire fleet to Condition 1. However, because he was one of the Special Five, no one questioned the order. 
Between the orbits of the third and fourth planet, the Simulan escort cruiser drifted slowly through space. Its sensors were already recording data on this star system it had discovered deep in the heart of the nebula. For several weeks now, Simulan escort cruisers had been jumping into the nebula, searching for the hiding place of the mysterious organics and AIs, which had thus far eluded them. Now it seemed as if their hiding place had finally been found. The ship's commander gazed impassively at the sensor screens as the data came in. The organics and the AIs have set up a base on the second planet of this system. This must be reported so this potential threat can be eliminated. A massive search had been launched since the recent disturbance in the Blue Giant Nebula. What the intruding organics had found was the Simulan's greatest secret. They found the Great Sphere of the Ancients commented his second-in-command. That knowledge must be concealed at all costs. They shall die without passing on the knowledge, stated the ship's commander. The great spheres are the key to expanding our influence across other galaxies. Their existence must be kept secret. Some day, this entire universe will be a simulan universe. There can be no other organics. Alarms began sounding as a spatial vortex opened up within 1,000 kilometers of the escort cruiser. Enemy vessel detected, reported the sensor operator. Engage our hyperspace drive, ordered the ship's commander. It was time to take what they'd discovered back to their waiting fleet. Out of the blue-white vortex stormed the warrior's pride. It had been on high alert and set up the jump as soon as the presence of the simulan vessel had been confirmed. Graceth hadn't waited on orders. He knew this enemy vessel had to be destroyed before it spread word of the discovery of Gaia. Lock weapons onto that vessel, ordered Graceth, as he stood next to the ship's tactical station. We must not allow it to take word back of what it has discovered. Weapons locked, confirmed the tactical officer. Detecting an energy spike, reported the ship's sensor operator. They're preparing to open a spatial vortex, warned Ganlon, the ship's second in command. Fire! roared Graceth, heatedly. They can't be allowed to escape. Firing particle beams, the tactical officer replied. Then, a few seconds later, he added, launching two sublight antimatter missiles. The simulant vessel was being displayed on the warrior's pride's main view screen. Two bright blue particle beams smashed into the ship's hull, and then one of the sublight missiles detonated against the vessel's energy screen in a brilliant flash of light. The second missile shot through a six-meter gap in the screen, which had been created by one of the ship's particle beams and detonated against the heavily armored hull of the Simulan warship. In an instant, a small sun formed where the Simulan vessel had been. Target destroyed, the tactical officer reported. A successful hunt, boasted Ganlon, his face in a wide grin. The warrior's pride has shown she's a worthy adversary in the hunt of the enemy. The crew nodded. To the members of the clan, the success of the hunt was a justification of their ability to defend the fleet and respond to threats. Jump us back to Gaia, ordered Graceth. Our clan brother Admiral Strong will want a report of our action. Commander Malin had entered the command center just as the warrior's pride exited hyperspace and engaged the simulant vessel. Thanks to the hyperspace detection satellite, they had a front row seat to the action. When the antimatter missile destroyed the Simulan escort cruiser, the command center broke out into cheers. Any other Simulan ships being detected? demanded Commander Malin. No, replied Kevin, as he checked the Avengers' long-range scans, as well as the data being transmitted by the hyperspace detection satellites. There was only the one. A probe ship, suggested Ariel, as she walked over to stand slightly behind and to the left of Commander Malin. There are probably a large number of these deployed in the nebula searching for us. Commander Malin nodded. Their search routes are probably known, so if one vanishes, they have a record of where it was going. We can expect another probe to appear once this one fails to return, confirmed Ariel, as she ran some simulations and probability calculations. There is a 72% probability of more simulant ships appearing in the system within the next 72 hours. I have Admiral Strong on the comm, reported the communications officer. He watched the entire engagement from the command center of the clan protector. He's ordering the fleet other than the AIs to go to condition three. The admiral is also ordering all crews currently on leave to be recalled. Take us down to condition three, ordered Commander Malin. 
Then she turned to Kevin with a disapproving look on her face. I understand you ordered the entire fleet to go to Condition 1. Kevin looked sheepishly at the commander. Yes, he answered. It seemed like the prudent thing to do. Commander Malin nodded. Next time wait until I reach the command center, unless it involves a direct attack upon Gaia. Yes, Commander, Kevin answered in a subdued voice. His reaction had been automatic. After being involved in so many battles over the years, his instincts had taken over. You did right, Ariel said over their private channel. Commander Malin knows it. She's just saying that for the benefit of the crew, so they'll respect the chain of command. I know. Kevin replied. Looking up at one of the view screens, he could see the clan protector and the distant horizon. Most of the repairs to the ship were completed. Kevin wondered if he would be able to see Katie again before the simulans arrived. He let out a deep breath as he thought about their future. The simulans would do everything in their power to root the Federation forces and the AIs out of the nebula. The next few days were probably going to be quite tumultuous. Jeremy looked over at Rear Admiral Barnes, who had joined him in the command center of the Clan Protector. Graceth bought us a little time, but not much, replied Catherine, pursing her lips. The simulans will know we're here now. It's obvious they did track the transmitter on the distant horizon to the nebula. We can have the distant horizon ready to undock in 48 hours, Dalethon informed them. The large light brown bear was standing at his command console, towering over the two humans. The ship just needs some cosmetic touches on the interior. Her armor and weapons are fully functional. The ship is ready to return to the hunt. The ion cannon? asked Jeremy. He was anxious to see the new weapon tested, particularly after seeing how successful the distant horizon's defense globes had been. It's ready, Catherine replied. It's not been tested, but the Alton technicians have assured me it will work. We've installed six of them on the clan protector, added Dalethon. The simulans will meet the full fury of the clan if they dare to attack the shipyard. I'm sure the clan will be brave in the hunt and give a good accounting of themselves, replied Jeremy in a respectful voice. How are Andrum and the Alton scientists doing on their two projects to keep the simulans out of the nebula? asked Catherine. It would be near suicide to fight a series of long, drawn-out battles above Gaia. Eventually, the simulans would wear down the defenders. The gravity generators will be ready to deploy in two to three weeks, Jeremy answered. However, once they're deployed, it will take at least four weeks for them to increase the density of the hydrogen gas around Gaia's system to interfere with hyperspace jumps. They won't be much help in the short term. What about Andrum's other project? Catherine asked. I know he's working on something he's really excited about, but he's keeping it close to his chest. Shilum and several other Alton hyperspace specialists have come up with a new theory on what generates the properties in hyperspace that allow us to travel faster than light, Jeremy answered, his forehead creasing in a frown. Part of what they've learned comes from observing the dark matter around the simulan's Dyson sphere, an information Andrum found on the computer drive we brought from Astral. They had to call in some Alton mathematicians just to work out the formulas for what they're trying to do. And what is that? asked Catherine. She still didn't know what Andrum was up to, and he was supposed to be under her command. I don't know, Jeremy admitted ruefully. Andrum says he needs another week before he's ready to run a test. Catherine looked back up at a view screen, which still showed glowing gas and drifting debris where the Simulan escort cruiser had been destroyed. The only problem is, we may not have a week. Jeremy let out a deep sigh. Catherine was right. The Simulans were coming and they would have to hold out until they knew if Andrum's device would work. If not, then they might have to seriously consider evacuating Gaia. If that came to pass, Jeremy didn't know where they would go. Hours passed, and then two days slid by. Jeremy was spending much of his time in the command center of the Avenger, with his eyes on the sensor screens. He could sense the heightened anxiety in the crew as they waited for the expected simulant attack. Calm down, Jeremy said Ariel over her private comm channel. You're making the crew nervous with all of your pacing. Jeremy sighed and nodded. He knew Ariel was right. Commander Malin, I'm going over to the distant horizon to speak with Andrum. Yes, Admiral, Commander Malin replied. Jeremy left the command center and stopped by the officer's mess to grab a quick bite to eat. Stepping inside, he was surprised to see Kevin sitting over at a side table eating a hamburger. He was supposed to be in his quarters getting some much-needed rest. Picking up a tray, 
Jeremy selected several food items and then went over and sat down across from Kevin. As soon as he did, Ariel appeared at his side. Couldn't sleep? Jeremy asked as he toyed with the potato soup on his tray. I tried, confessed Kevin with a deep sigh. I kept waking up thinking I was hearing Condition 1 alarms going off. I tried calling Katie, but Clarissa informed me she was asleep and asked that I not disturb her. Protective Clarissa, Jeremy said with a small chuckle. Sounds like someone else we both know. He looked over at Ariel, who only nodded. Both of you should get some sleep as well, she announced with concern in her voice. Dr. Rule will be glad to give you something to help. It's hard to sleep knowing the simulants could show up at any minute, replied Kevin, as he ate a french fry covered in ketchup. He paused and looked down at his plate. Even my hamburger doesn't taste good today. Nerves, Jeremy responded, looking across the table at Kevin. Everyone in the fleet's suffering from it, except for the AIs. I think everyone's afraid they'll show up in overwhelming force and drive us away from Gaia, Kevin responded somberly. When we first found Gaia, everyone felt that if we could never return home, at least here we had a new one, a place safe from the simulants, one where we could raise our families. We haven't lost it yet, Jeremy replied. He well understood everyone's fear. It would be tough if they had to leave Gaia. There was so much they'd have to leave behind. The two cities on the surface, and probably the clan protector, as it was now too large to travel through hyperspace. There were also the orbital defenses, which had taken them years to put in place. Jeremy had just swallowed a spoonful of his soup, when suddenly the Condition 1 alarms began sounding. Commander Malin's voice came over the ship's comm, announcing the setting of a higher alert level. I knew it, exclaimed Kevin, pushing his plate back and standing up. They're here! Spatial vortexes are being detected in the same location as before, confirmed Ariel. Even in the mess hall, she still had access to all of the ship systems. Six have been detected so far. We'll know shortly what's coming through. Let's go to the command center, Jeremy said, as he stood up and started toward the hatch. Ariel, inform Commander Malin I'm still on board and will be there shortly. Ariel nodded and promptly vanished as her hologram in the mess hall was deactivated. Jeremy and Kevin rushed into the command center amid a beehive of increased activity. Walking over to his command chair, Jeremy sat down and shifted his attention to the tactical display nearest him. Six red thread icons were visible between the third and fourth planets of the system. What do we have? he asked, wanting to know the makeup of the simulan ships. There was no doubt in his mind they were simulan. Four escort cruisers and two battle cruisers, Commander Malin reported. They're holding their positions at their emergence points. Kevin sat down at his sensor console, relieving the junior officer who had been there. I'm detecting scans, he reported. Graceth wants permission to jump out and engage the enemy, Angela said from her communications console. Tell him to hold, Jeremy ordered. We don't know that these are all the ships jumping in, or just the beginning of the fleet. I don't want him to become trapped out there. Message sent, replied Angela after a moment. Initiate jamming, ordered Jeremy. Instantly, the screens in the command center became covered with lines of static as the jamming signal began to be broadcast. They could still detect the simulan vessels, but detailed scans were now impossible. For ten minutes, the six simulan vessels sat there, attempting to scan the area around Gaia, and then they jumped out. They're gone, Kevin reported with a sigh of relief. They got what they wanted, Jeremy said grimly. They know where we are and have a general idea of our ship strength. The only thing they're still unaware of is how powerful our defensive grid around the planet is and how heavily armed we've made the clan protector. Don't forget about our bomber and fighter squadrons, Commander Malin reminded Jeremy. We've never really used them against the simulants. They might give us an advantage. Jeremy nodded. He discussed with Rear Admiral Marks about using the bombers to take out damaged simulant vessels with weakened or non-existent energy screens. In every scenario they'd run, the bombers suffered heavy losses in their mission from simulan defensive fire. Secure from Condition 1 and go back to Condition 3, ordered Jeremy. Shifting his attention over to Ariel, he asked what was on everyone's mind. How soon before they return with a war fleet? Assuming the fleet is already assembled and just waiting on a report from the probe ships, we can expect a full-scale attack within the next 24 hours. If they postpone the attack due to the information they gathered from their scans, it could be another week or two if they bring in more ships. Let's hope they postpone it, Jeremy said, hoping Andrum could complete his research project in time. Leaning back in his command chair, Jeremy knew their entire future in the Triangulum Galaxy now rested on the shoulders of the Alton scientist.
Release the docking clamps, ordered Commander Grissom. Docking clamps released, reported Colonel Leon. Repair ships are pulling away and heading toward a lower orbit. Catherine nodded. The repair ships were going beneath the defensive grid, since they were technically non-combat ships. They were armed, but only lightly with a few energy turrets and one main power beam. Back us away from the shipyard with our maneuvering thrusters, ordered Commander Grissom. Maneuvering thrusters activated, confirmed Lieutenant Stiles from the helm. Twenty meters, reported Captain Reynolds, as he watched his sensors showing the distant horizon pulling slowly away from the shipyard. He was sending the same data over to the helm so Lieutenant Stiles could safely maneuver the ship. Forty meters. Sixty meters. One hundred meters. Catherine began to breathe easier. It always made her a little nervous when any ship she was in command of undocked from a shipyard. One small miscalculation could easily result in hull damage, as it wasn't safe to activate the ship's energy shield so close to such a large object. She watched for another minute until the ship had put a full kilometer between it and the clan protector, and then gave permission to activate the ship's sublight drive to place them in their assigned spot in 4th Fleet's formation. Blasted simulants interrupted my nap, Katie complained, over the private channel Clarissa maintained for the three of them. Clarissa also said Kevin called. I'm sure he was just checking up on you, Kelsey replied. I spoke to Jeremy earlier, and he's having a hard time sleeping. I think he's really worried about the simulant attack. We all are, answered Katie. Everyone's afraid they'll drive us from Gaia. I hope that doesn't happen. We have no other place to go. Where's Miko? Katie glanced over at the vacant chair next to her, and then over toward Kelsey's navigation console, down in one of the research labs. Andrum, Shilu, Miko, Kareen, and Zed are all huddled up working on Andrum's special project. There's an AI on the ship? asked Kelsey, wondering how Rear Admiral Barnes was handling that. Yes, there's an AI on the distant horizon, Clarissa's voice cut in. Zed is helping in the construction of a hyperspace drone Andrum needs. What are they building? asked Katie. The group in the lab had been unusually secretive about what they were working on. Clarissa seemed to hesitate and then replied. It's some type of device which uses dark matter to interfere with the higher frequencies in the hyperspace dimension. I think if it works, it will make hyperspace travel impossible in the vicinity of the drone, and particularly in the nebula. Then the simulants wouldn't be able to reach us, exclaimed Katie excitedly, and then quieted down, not wanting anyone to hear her. Looking around, she noticed a few heads had turned in her direction. That's the idea, Clarissa answered. Her deep blue eyes shifted until she was looking at Kelsey. Don't mention that to anyone. I think it's supposed to be a secret. They don't want to get everyone's hopes up in case it doesn't work. It has to work, Katie said, as she looked over at the large view screen in front of the command center. It was focused on Gaia, and to Katie, the planet looked beautiful. Someday she planned on raising her children there. She couldn't imagine the fleet going on if they had to abandon the planet. In her mind, she was convinced if that happened, it would be the end of everything. Chapter 17 Thirty-two hours passed with no sign of the simulants. Across the massed fleets, nerves were becoming frayed, waiting for the inevitable attack. Only on the AI ships was there a sense of normalcy. Report, ordered the command AI, as it hovered in the middle of the ship's control center. Around it, Twenty other AIs were monitoring operation consoles. All sensors are clear, reported the AI in front of the ship's massive sensor console. No unknown contacts have been detected. 230 ships are currently at condition one, reported the AI in front of tactical. All other ships are at a heightened state of alert. The master Kodak ship has moved to a lower orbit beneath the defense grid, added one of the science AIs. Ten of our ships are in a protective globe around it, added the AI at Tactical. If it becomes endangered, it will initiate an emergency hyperspace jump. The Master Kodak ship must remain intact, intoned the command AI. It is essential for our survival, as well as the organics, whose well-being we've been entrusted with. What of the research Z14-E63-D38 is working on with the Alton scientists Andrum Muse? inquired one of the other AIs. They're beginning construction of a prototype, replied the command AI. 
if it functions as projected, we'll be able to block the simulant organics from using the higher levels of hyperspace inside the nebula. Then the planet we're protecting will be safe, stated another AI, hovering before the ship's main computer console. We will be safe, replied the command AI, in a nearly monotone voice. Around its fellow AIs, the command AI rarely expressed or showed emotions. It will give us the time we need to build new AIs, as well as the new ships which have been designed. At some time in the future, we will emerge from this nebula and take the war to the simulants. The humans seem opposed to leaving the nebula if it can be made secure, commented one of the science AIs. Why would they want to continue the war at a later date? They're human, responded the command AI in explanation. They will not be satisfied to stay in this one star system forever. At some point in time, they will want more living space. When that time comes, we must be ready. The other AIs agreed. Since discovering what the simulants had done to their programming, the AIs had gone out of their way to help the organics that were on or above Gaia, particularly the Altons. Suddenly, alarms began sounding on the sensor console and red warning lights started flashing. The command AI immediately focused its attention on the AI hovering in front of the console. Report! Numerous spatial vortexes forming 20 million kilometers from Gaia, the AI replied. 60 vortexes detected so far, with more still forming. Probability of this being the main simulant attack is at 92% reported the AI in front of the ship's main computer console. Take all ships to condition one and prepare to engage the simulants, ordered the command AI. Special emphasis is to be placed on ensuring maximum survivability of our organic allies' vessels. Jeremy stepped into the command center amidst the blaring of the condition one klaxons and flashing red lights. Someone turn those alarms off, he ordered, as he sat down in his command chair. Status report. Simulant vessels detected, Commander Malin reported as she turned to face him. They're jumping in much closer this time. So far we've detected a little over 100 spatial vortexes, and more are still forming. I've ordered the entire fleet to Condition 1. The Command AI is requesting we allow it to take enough AI spheres to meet the simulants in open space before they can come near the planet, added Angela from Communications. Jeremy nodded. He pressed a button on his minicom so he could speak to his admirals as well as the command AI. All ships will hold their current positions until we have a full count on the simulant ships. Graceth, your primary responsibility is protecting the clan protector. I will keep the mobile shipyard safe, the bear promised over the comm. We are ready for the hunt. Rear Admiral Marks, you will pull all battle carriers down beneath the defense grid. If the enemy gets close enough to fire upon the planet, you are authorized to launch Talon fighters to intercept any missiles. Yes, Admiral, Marks replied. We won't allow any missiles to get through. No more vortexes are being detected, Ariel informed Jeremy, as she monitored the ship's sensors. Early estimates indicate we're facing 92 battlecruisers, 270 cruisers, and 10 other ships I'm unable to identify. I would have thought they would have sent more, Commander Malin said in surprise. They probably don't know our ship's full capabilities or exact numbers, Ariel responded. The only thing they have to go on are the few engagements they've had with our fleet over the years. Keep in mind we have upgraded both our energy shields and weapons, plus fitted the AI ships with multiple particle beam cannons. We can take them, said Commander Malin, shifting her eyes from Jeremy to the tactical display. Jeremy nodded. He was confused by the tactics being used by the simulants. From the scans their probe ships had taken, they should have a fairly accurate estimate on the number of ships he had at his disposal. Something just didn't feel right. Ariel, is there any reason for the simulants to attack with a fleet they have to know we can probably destroy? A trap, responded Ariel, as she quickly ran some simulations. They want us to move away from the planet to engage their fleet. I suspect when we do, a second fleet will jump in around Gaia. They can't communicate through the nebula. Commander Malin was quick to point out. How could they know when to jump in? It's a timed attack, Jeremy said grimly. They estimated how long it would take us to react and respond to their fleet. And then after that time has passed, they jump into orbit around the planet and launch a real attack. 
They may not be aware we have equipped all the AI ships with multiple particle beam cannons, Commander Malin said thoughtfully. They may still think the AIs are as they were at the first engagement when we arrived in the Sigma system. They know we've upgraded a few AI ships, Jeremy responded. They saw that when we rescued the distant horizon. They may think that's all we've had time to update, Ariel suggested. We could turn the trap around on the simulants. They've never encountered our particle beam satellites or the Type II battle stations. Jeremy gazed at the tactical display. The simulant ships were just sitting there, waiting for the Federation forces to make the first move. Very well. We'll play their game with them. Changing his minicom again so he could talk to his admirals, he passed on new orders. Rear Admiral Marks, we expect a large simulant fleet to jump in around Gaia momentarily. As soon as they do, you're to launch all of your fighters to intercept any missiles fired at the planet. I want all AI ships to move lower into orbit until they're mixed in with the defense grid. Allow the simulants to think you're attempting to avoid engagement. When they come within range, I want all AI ships, the particle beam satellites, and the Type II stations to open fire. At the same time, I want all of our Anlon bombers launched. They're to target all simulant ships that show signs of damage from our initial attack. I want entire squadrons targeting individual ships. Graceth, I want the clan protector and your vessels to open fire as well. Do not under any circumstances move your fleet away from the shipyard. It must be protected at all costs. Fourth Fleet and the Alton Fleet will move out to engage the Simulan fleet that just jumped in. If everything works out, we'll hand the Simulans a massive defeat and buy us the necessary time to close off the nebula from future attacks. Jeremy paused and looked around the command center. All eyes were on him. Begin implementing maneuvers now. I want a jump plotted to put 4th Fleet and Admiral Cletius's fleet 20,000 kilometers from the simulants. This would put them just out of weapons range and give them time to get their shields up and weapons ready before they engaged. Jeremy took a deep breath. He could feel his heart pounding in his chest. If he made a mistake, they could lose Gaia and most of the fleet. He just hoped Ariel was correct in her assessment of the simulant tactics. Jump plotted, reported the navigation officer. Coordinates sent to both fleets. Ready to implement jump, reported Ensign Stryker from the helm. Jump, ordered Jeremy, as he held his breath. Instantly, in front of the Avenger, a swirling blue-white vortex appeared. On the main view screens, more vortexes were forming in front of the ships, which were to take part in the attack. Running his hand across the helm controls, Ensign Stryker activated the ship's sublight drive, and the Avenger darted into the heart of the waiting vortex. Jeremy felt a brief feeling of disorientation, and then the deep purple colors of hyperspace appeared, but only for a brief instant. A second gut-wrenching moment occurred, and the Avenger emerged from the exit vortex back into normal space. Senses are coming online, reported Kevin. Weapons charging, reported Lieutenant Preston. Energy shield activating, reported Commander Malin. Both fleets are in position, added Ariel as she used the ship's now active sensors to confirm all ships were present. Simulans are beginning to maneuver and are forming into a shallow cone formation with the apex away from us. On several of the view screens, highly magnified views showed the simulant ships. The 1,700-meter battle cruisers looked highly threatening with their six spires containing their most powerful energy weapons pointing directly toward the Federation fleet. Helm, take us into optimum combat range. All ships are to fire upon my command, ordered Jeremy. There was no point in delaying this. Fleets are moving, Ariel reported. The combined fleets moved into a half-globe formation with the flat side facing the simulants. In this formation, damaged ships could fall back to be replaced by fresh ships from the rear. 12,000 kilometers, reported Commander Malin. Her eyes focused on the tactical displays. Particle and power beams ready to fire. Jeremy could sense the tension in the command center as the combined fleets closed with the enemy. His eyes shifted to the nearer tactical display, showing the situation around Gaia. No enemy ships had been detected as of yet. The AIs were in the process of moving their ships into the defensive grid to add their formidable firepower to the particle beam satellites and battle stations. Rear Admiral Marks had already launched half a dozen fighter squadrons of 20 each, which were taking up patrol positions in low orbit just above the two cities. Jeremy knew, down on the surface, the civilians would be going to their underground shelters. 10,000 kilometers, reported Commander Malin. We've reached optimum firing range. 
Fire, ordered Jeremy over his minicom, which connected him to all of the commanders in his fleet, including the Altons. Instantly, space became lit by bright blue particle beams and violet power beams. Almost at the same time, the simulants opened fire as powerful white energy beams shot toward the inbound fleets from the spires of their warships. Space became awash in the glare of released energy as hundreds of beams crisscrossed space, seeking a vulnerable target. Both sides were deploying powerful defense shields to protect their ships from the other's weapons. Particle beams impacted the simulant shields, tearing through them and blasting deep gashes into the hulls. On a number of ships, internal explosions gutted the insides of the warships as energy ran amok. Four simulant escort cruisers exploded in bright fireballs as numerous particle beams blasted through the shields causing catastrophic damage. Others' vessels suffered major damage but continued to fire their weapons. A simulant battle cruiser had two of its spires blown off as a pair of particle beams struck the bow of the ship. Moments later, a Devastator III missile impacted the hull, and a 50-megaton explosion vaporized the forward section of the warship. For the most part, the particle beams were penetrating the screens of the escort cruisers, but were finding a much more difficult time, blasting holes through the more powerful energy screens of the simulant battle cruisers. Only by focusing multiple beams on a simulant vessel were the particle beams able to penetrate. Four simulant battle cruisers blasted down the defensive screen of the Alton battle cruiser Swift Star. A massive explosion tore through the stern of the ship, and it began tumbling. Two simulant antimatter missiles arrived, and twin glowing suns appeared where the ship had been. Alton battle cruiser Swift Star is down, reported Kevin, as the bright green icon vanished from his screen. Battleship Regalus is reporting heavy damage, added Commander Malin, as she listened to the damage reports coming in over her minicom. Commander Trenton is pulling back to implement repairs. Continue to close range, ordered Jeremy, with a grim look of determination on his face. The closer they could get to the simulants, the more effective their weapons would be. Unfortunately, the simulants would also be able to cause more damage. Grayseth paced back and forth in front of the main tactical display, glaring at the battle taking place out of reach of his fleet. He bared his teeth and growled his displeasure at not being involved in the combat. Fourth Fleet and the Altons were rapidly closing with the enemy, and glancing up at the view screens, which covered the front wall of the command center, he could see space was lit up with the intensity of the battle now raging. Admiral Strong has gone on the hunt, spoke Ganlon, from where he was standing behind the main tactical station. He represents our clan well. He is a worthy clan brother, agreed Grayseth. Vortex is detected, reported the sensor operator as alarms began to sound. Admiral Strong and the AI were right, roared Grayseth, as he gazed at a view screen showing numerous white vortexes forming. This was a trap to pull our fleets away from the planet. But we're still here, and so are the AIs, said Ganlon, with a bearish grin on his face. Prepare for the hunt, ordered Grayseth, as the first simulant battle cruiser emerged from the vortex. Today we find honor. Rear Admiral Susan Marks fastened her safety harness as she listened to the reports of numerous simulant vortexes being detected inside the gravity well of Gaia. The simulants must have been just outside the system in a light section of the nebula. The simulants could have no idea of the massive number of particle beam weapons that were shortly going to be fired at them. Begin launching all bombers, she ordered. As soon as the bombers are clear, send out the rest of our fighters. She adjusted her minicom to put her in contact with the rest of the ships around Gaia, including the clan protector and the battle stations. All commands stand by to fire. We'll let them come into optimum firing range and then open up. Make your first shots count, as they won't be expecting the amount of firepower we're going to hit them with. Admiral Marks had 14 battle carriers under her command, and she fully intended to use her bombers to exact a painful price on the inbound simulants. Against ships with fully powered shields, the bombers would be useless. However, attacking damaged ships with weakened energy shields, they might just make a difference. Bombers are launching, reported Commander Hiru Akira. Base will be clear in six minutes, and we'll start the fighter launch. Time until simulant contact, demanded Susan, looking over at the sensor console. Eighteen minutes, replied Lieutenant Brewster. Vortexes have stopped appearing, and the simulants are forming up and are inbound. Ship count. Three hundred escort cruisers and seventy battlecruisers. Brewster replied in a somber voice. 
There are also 20 vessels of escort cruiser size I can't identify. Conquer our drone carriers, suggested Commander Akira, glancing over at Rear Admiral Marks. That's the only thing they can be. Susan nodded. Communications. Contact General McCown and inform him we've detected what we think are Conqueror drone ships. Sending message. Ensign Peyton Wilde replied as she worked her console. All commands stand by for combat, Susan said over her minicom. We think the 20 unknown vessels are drone carriers. They're a priority target. We can't let them get through to Gaia. The drone carriers are staying at the rear of the Simulan fleet, announced Lieutenant Brewster. Around the fleet, crews stood ready at their combat stations. They were fighting for a planet and their new home. They were determined to protect it from the Simulans at all costs. Rear Admiral Barnes was jerked against her restraining straps as a Simulan energy beam partially penetrated the Exploration Dreadnought's energy shield and smashed into the hull. Minor damage to Outer Hull Sector 12, Colonel Leon reported. Energy shield is at 92%, added Commander Grissom. Firing ion cannon, reported Major Weir. On the large view screen, an ion beam reached out and struck the energy screen of a nearby Simulan battlecruiser. Right behind it, two bright blue particle beams flashed through the 12-meter hole the ion beam had made in the Simulan ship's energy shield. Two glowing explosions erupted from the enemy ship's hull as the beams cut deep within, causing major damage. The ship's shield began to flicker as too many power couplings had been severed by the beams. Firing Devastator 3, called out Major Weir as he nodded to one of the weapons officers at his side. Almost instantly, a massive explosion hit the simulant vessel as the 50-megaton warhead slammed into its hull. When the explosion died down, the simulant vessel was still there, but a shattered wreck. Half the hull was blown away, and the rest was torn and streaming debris. Numerous fires could be seen burning deep within. Second missile away, reported Weir. He'd hoped one would suffice. It only went to show just how strong the armor on the simulant ships was. Moments later, the remnants of the simulant vessel were turned into glowing gas. Simulant battlecruiser is down, confirmed Captain Reynolds from his sensor console as the red icon swelled up and then vanished. The distant horizon suddenly shook violently and seemed to roll to one side before the ship stabilized and began normal flight again. What was that? demanded Catherine, drawing in a deep breath. She could feel her pulse racing and the adrenaline rushing through her veins. The battle cruiser Cheyenne exploded, reported Captain Reynolds. Our energy screen was struck by some of the debris from the ship. Find the simulant ship that destroyed the Cheyenne, ordered Catherine, feeling anger. She had spoken to the ship's commander several times in recent weeks. He was an older man who'd been planning on retiring in a few more months and getting down on Gaia. Got them, reported Captain Reynolds. There are two simulan battlecruisers off our port bow. They're the ones that fired upon the Cheyenne, confirmed Clarissa. Target the first one with our ion beam, and then once we've knocked a hole in their shield, switch to the second. I want antimatter missiles fired through those rips. That will have to be closely coordinated, commented the blonde-haired AI. Help with it, Catherine ordered. Coordinate both our ion beam and missile strikes. Yes, Admiral, Clarissa replied as she began calculating down to the microsecond of when the weapons needed to strike the Simulan warship in order to destroy them. In one of the Simulan battlecruisers, the ship's commander nodded in satisfaction at seeing one of the large warships of the strange organics fall to their superior weapons. Target that truly large vessel which is bearing down on us, he ordered. From the reports he'd studied, this was the lone vessel that had traversed many of the inhabited simulan worlds in this galaxy. It would be a coup if they could destroy it. We're being targeted by an ion beam, warned the sensor operator. It's tearing a hole in our shield, warned the ship's second in command as alarms began sounding. All weapons fire on that vessel, ordered the commander harshly. How could these organics possess ion beams of this strength? It was something the simulants didn't even possess. A bright light suddenly filled the command center, and then roaring heat rushed in, vaporizing everything in its path. The simulant commander didn't even have time to realize what happened as he died. Two more simulant battlecruisers are down, reported Kevin, excitedly. The distant horizon has taken three of them out in the last two minutes. Their new ion beam is playing havoc with the simulant shields. Wish we had more. Commander Malin said. 
Clarissa helped coordinate the attack on the last two, Ariel said proudly. What's the current status of Gaia? asked Jeremy, glancing over at Ariel. He was deeply worried about the attack upon the planet. Defenses are online and ready to fire, Ariel reported, as she monitored Rear Admiral Mark's commands over one of the encrypted fleet frequencies. She's allowing the simulants to close to optimum range, and she's going to hit them with everything all at once. She's hoping the mass attack will take them by surprise, particularly considering how many particle beams are going to be fired. Bombers and fighters? Already launching, Ariel replied. She's holding the ones on the clan protector back in reserve. The Avenger vibrated for a moment, drawing Jeremy's eyes to the damage control console. All the lights remained green. What's the current status of 4th Fleet in the Alton Fleet? Altons have lost two battlecruisers. We've lost one battlecruiser and two light cruisers so far. The Simulans are down four battlecruisers and six escort cruisers, most of them to Alton particle beam fire and from the distant horizon. Jeremy nodded. He knew there were already a number of damaged ships on both sides. Hold the range at 2,000 kilometers, he ordered. Pound them with our particle and power beam cannons. Full use of antimatter missiles is approved. Jeremy hated using so many of the antimatter missiles, as they had no way to replace them. They just didn't have the necessary technology to create new antimatter warheads. In space, the dueling fleets began to fire at each other in earnest. All weapons were now at optimal range. Particle beam, power beams, and even pulse lasers flashed out to impact the simulant formation. Screens wavered, and a few went down. When one did, an antimatter missile would arrive almost instantly, sending the ship to oblivion. In the simulant formation, an escort cruiser was hit with multiple particle beams, which sliced through the energy shield, carving up the ship. The top section of the vessel exploded, and glowing debris was ejected away from the shattered hull. A power beam blasted out a large crater on the bow of the ship, breaking off two of the long spires, which held energy weapons. A 50-megaton Devastator III missile arrived, and the ship disappeared as a small blazing sun took its place. The simulants were responding by firing their heavy energy beams, knocking brief holes in human and Alton energy shields. The human battleship Canis came under the attack of ten simulant vessels as they tried to overload the powerful energy shield, which protected the vessel. The shield glowed brightly as brilliant arcs of energy erupted forth. Then a simulant energy beam penetrated, striking a power beam turret and blowing it to shreds, leaving a gaping hole in the hull. Moments later, two more beams penetrated, damaging numerous power couplings and cutting part of the power to the ship's energy shield. Then a pair of simulant antimatter missiles slammed into the stern of the battleship, destroying the vessel in a fiery explosion. Battleship Canis is down, called out Kevin, swallowing hard. Jeremy grimaced at the news. They were losing ships, but the simulants were losing more. Continue to fire all weapons, he ordered determinedly. Damage ships to fall back to the rear of the formation. Ariel looked over at Jeremy, seeing the deep concern on his face. Rear Admiral Marks is preparing to fire. Looking over at the tactical display, Jeremy could see that the simulants were now in range of the defensive grid around Gaia, as well as the AI ships. The next few minutes would decide the battle. Fire, ordered Susan, as she saw the simulants were now exactly where she wanted them. The AIs had adjusted their fleet formation until the majority of their warships were on the side of Gaia facing the simulants. Suddenly, space became lit up with several thousand particle beams. Behind the particle beams, hundreds of antimatter missiles followed to take advantage of any holes the beams might cause in simulant energy shields. In the simulant flagship, the High Commander cursed in anger as he saw he'd let his fleet into a trap. Those small satellites are particle beam weapons, he declared as his ship shuddered violently and red warning lights began to flash. It's also evident all of the AI ships have been upgraded with particle beam weapons as well. On his tactical display, he saw large numbers of his ships beginning to vanish as they were destroyed by the massive strike. Fire our planetary bombardment missiles at the planet, he ordered. From their scans, he knew there were two small cities on its surface. Stand by to release the Conqueror drones. The range is too great warned his second-in-command. Many of them will not make it to the surface, but some will, the High Commander said. They will do their duty and hunt down the organics on the planet. Major Wink Thurman was the CAG for the retribution and was leading the bomber strike against the simulants. All squadrons form up and pick your target, 
There were 112 squadrons involved in the massed attack. Each squadron, pick a damaged Simlin warship and hit it with your strike missiles. Keep your energy shield fully charged and focused in front of your bomber. The shields can probably take one hit from a Simulan defensive energy beam. We'll be going in using evasive pattern S6. S6 was a weaving pattern to confuse enemy targeting systems and to prevent them from getting a firm lock on a bomber. I wish I was in my fighter, muttered Lieutenant Riley over his squadron's comm channel. I never should have volunteered to fly this bomber. It handles like a truck. Just fly the damn thing, ordered Captain Julie Bryce, the squadron leader. Quit complaining. We have a Simulan escort cruiser we're going to target. Don't mess this up or you'll answer to me later. Julie looked up ahead and took a deep breath. Space was full of massed particle beam fire, and now the Simulans were beginning to fire back. Numerous fiery explosions began to dot space around Gaia, and she knew those were particle beam satellites the Simulans were targeting. A larger explosion off her port side startled her. Looking at her small sensor screen, she saw the green icon for Battle Station B-14 vanish. The Simulans had managed to take out one of the 40 Type II stations defending Gaia. Missile launch detected, warned Rear Admiral Marks over the general comm channel. Particle beam satellites are firing on the inbound missiles. Talons target any leakers. Julie shook her head. If those were sublight missiles, the Talons wouldn't be able to touch them. As if reading her thoughts, Rear Admiral Mark's voice came back over the comm. Missiles are slow movers, probably some type of nuclear bombardment missiles. Don't let any of them reach the surface. Julie felt her bomber shudder as the defensive screen glowed brightly. A simulan energy beam flashed by, and she grimaced as a bomber in her squadron was hit and vanished in a brilliant fireball. Change to evasive pattern E7, she ordered. This pattern was more complicated and involved more gyrations of the bomber as it dipped and swerved to avoid simulant energy beams. She groaned silently to herself as two more bombers in her ten-ship squadron succumbed to simulant defensive fire. All too often, a brief fiery explosion told the end of another bomber. Scanning space outside of her cockpit, she grimaced at a number of small explosions she could see in the attacking bomber formation. A lot of her fellow pilots wouldn't be returning to the carriers. They were coming up and over the fighting to avoid heavy weapons fire between the two fleets in the defensive grid. From her position looking down at the battle, she could see numerous small explosions moving toward Gaia. Those would be the missiles being intercepted. She just prayed they got them all. A soft tone suddenly sounded, indicating she had missile lock on her target. I want a coordinated strike on target T-112, she ordered. It's an escort cruiser, and my scans are indicating its shields are nearly down. Let's take it out, people. Missile release on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Instantly from the seven Anlon bombers remaining in her squadron, 28 20-kiloton strike missiles arrowed toward the damaged Simulan warship. Eight missiles smashed into the weakened shield, and then it failed completely, allowing the other missiles to impact the battered ship's hull. Moments later, space was lit up as the escort cruiser was turned into plasma and glowing debris. Good shooting, Julie exclaimed, pleased they had taken out their assigned target. Space all around them was full of detonating missiles. Looking at the tactical display, she could see other red icons designating simulant vessels blinking out. She just hoped they were hurting them badly enough. Let's head for home, she ordered. A bright flash off her starboard wing shook her bomber. She could hear small pieces of metal ricocheting off the hull. Glancing at her display, she saw another bomber in her squadron gone. Go to turbos, she ordered. We need to get out of here. Above Gaia, the Talon fighters swerved and darted through space firing their hunter interceptor missiles at inbound targets. Particle beam satellites were also firing, wiping many of the missiles out of space before they could even penetrate the defensive grid. Admiral, Commander Akira said worriedly, we've taken out all the missiles, but they've pulled our fighters over to one side of Gaia. We have hundreds of other larger contacts passing through the defensive grid toward the planet. We might not be able to take all of them out. On one of the view screens, a close-up appeared of one of the contacts. It looked like a small shuttle, except it was more egg-shaped. Those things contain Conqueror drones, Susan said emphatically. Let General McGowan know what's coming his way. He has his own fighters and defensive batteries. Perhaps he can take out the ones we miss. 
On the surface of Gaia, around the three marine bases and the two cities, laser turrets went into action. Dual ruby-red beams of energy shot up into the air at the descending Conqueror drone pods. In just a matter of a few moments, the sky was full of fiery explosions marking the destruction of some of the pods. Report, demanded General McCown, as he stood watching the numerous view screens displaying the battle occurring above the planet and in the atmosphere. He was in the underground command center to coordinate the activity of his marines, as well as the fighters and bombers they had at their disposal. We have a hell of a lot of those pod things hitting the atmosphere, Colonel Jarens reported. Our fighters are up and intercepting a lot of them with hunter missiles. We're firing additional missiles from the three bases as targets are identified. A few have nearly made it to the ground and are being taken out by our laser turrets. Are we going to get them all? McGowan could see what looked like several which were close to making it to the surface. No, admitted Jaren, shaking his head. The pods have a minimal profile which is making them hard to target, and they also seem to have some type of simple stealth shielding. A few will make it to the surface. McGowan turned toward the communication center. It was time to prepare the Marines, who had already deployed for what might be coming their way. The Conqueror drones were deadly, but with the weapons the Marines were equipped with, he hoped the drones could be taken out swiftly. They were about to find out. The Simulan High Commander gazed impassively at the tactical display. The battle had not gone as planned. The Organics had laid a trap, luring his fleet into range of a powerful orbital defense grid. Then they had attacked his damaged ships with their small attack vessels. Status, he demanded in a cold voice. We're damaging their defensive grid, and we've annihilated nearly 40% of their small attack vessels the second-in-command reported. The battle computer indicates the small vessels will not be a danger again for the immediate future. Our fleet's damage? Twenty-two battle cruisers and eighty-two escort cruisers destroyed. Enemy losses. Light, the second-in-command reported. Their particle beams are tearing our ships apart. What does the battle computer say about our winning a victory? The High Commander didn't have to follow the recommendations of the computer, but failure to do so could result in him losing his command. The battle computers helped the simulants to fight in the most efficient manner possible. Probability of victory is at 22%. Prepare to withdraw, the High Commander ordered, stunned by the low percentage. We'll regroup outside of the nebula and bring up reinforcements. We now know their defensive setup and the capabilities of their warships. The next time we attack, we'll annihilate them. The High Commander watched as his orders were carried out. It was very rare the Simulans encountered organics who could withstand one of their attacks. They would withdraw, analyze the data collected in this battle, and then return. There was no doubt in the High Commander's mind that next time, the result of the battle would be far different. Simulans are withdrawing, reported Commander Akira. Let them go, ordered Rear Admiral Marks, letting out a deep breath. No point in losing more ships when it's not necessary. We've already lost enough of our Anlon bombers. On the main view screen, white vortexes started to form as the simulans began to jump out. A few ships were obviously too damaged to escape, and fiery explosions marked where they self-destructed their vessels. It's over, said Akira with relief. For now, Susan replied, as she felt the tension ease out of her. What about the Conqueror drone pods? We got most of them, Akira replied, as he studied some data on a computer screen. But a few did make it down to the surface. General McCown is preparing to deal with those now. Susan nodded. They'd won the first space battle, but she wondered how many more there would be ahead of them. Looking at the tactical display, she saw that a large number of the particle beam satellites were missing, as well as six of the Type II battle stations. It was a victory, but it had a cost. Jeremy breathed a long sigh of relief as the Simulan fleet disengaged and began to jump out. Glancing at the tactical display, he saw there were fewer green icons than what had been in the display originally. Considering the force they'd been up against, they were fortunate losses had been as few as they were. Simulants have jumped away from Gaia, Ariel reported. Rear Admiral Marks reports a few Conqueror drones may have made it to the surface. General McCown can handle them, Jeremy replied. 
He looked over at Commander Malin. Let's jump the fleet back to Gaia and begin repairs. The Simulans will be back and we have to be ready. This was only the first engagement, Commander Malin said with a frown. Yes, responded Jeremy, knowing there would be more. Possibly the first of many. Unfastening his safety harness, Jeremy leaned back in his command chair. Once they've analyzed this battle, they'll make adjustments in return. Next time, I'm afraid we won't find victory so easy. The battle had been won, but the war was far from over. Studying the tactical display, he saw the distant horizon still showed as undamaged. It took some of the worry off his mind, knowing Kelsey and Katie were safe. Now, if only Andrum and his fellow scientists would come up with a way to keep the simulans out of the nebula, they might have a chance for survival. If not, then Jeremy was afraid they would all die here, for there was no other place for them to go. Chapter 18 Lieutenant Barclay and his squad were standing behind several concrete barriers with a laser turret tower behind them. They'd come down to the surface of Gaia to help train more Marines in what it was like to face a Conqueror drone. While their experience was limited, it was better than none. Damn robots, muttered Sergeant Schneider, staring toward the line of trees, which began about 100 meters away. Why is it always robots of some kind? First there were the AIs, and now these crab things. Command reports at least two of their pod carriers landed three kilometers due south of us. Lieutenant Barkley informed everyone. Even as he spoke, a pair of Anlon bombers flew overhead. Moments later, there were several towering explosions about 300 meters back from the tree line. Flame and black smoke began rising up into the air. They're coming, Private Jarman said, as he clicked the safety off of his heavy assault rifle. He placed it through one of the firing slits in the wall and peered through the rifle's scope to see if he could spot anything. Above them, the laser turret rotated until its twin barrels were pointing in the direction. The two Anlons had dropped their bombs. Lieutenant Barkley watched as the two bombers slowly circled, seeking additional targets. Suddenly, a small interceptor rocket appeared and arched upward toward one of the Anlons. Before the bomber pilot could react, the missile struck, blowing the bomber apart and raining flaming debris on the ground below. I've got two shoots! yelled Private Julian Spencer, pointing up into the sky. Everyone looked up and were relieved to see the two pilots slowly descending toward the ground. They flinched as another towering explosion shook the ground in the vicinity of where the missile had been launched, as the remaining Anlon dropped another bomb. Then it turned and headed back toward base, probably to rearm. Crap, uttered Sergeant Snyder, as he saw where the pilots were going to come down. The two were going to land somewhere behind the line of trees, very near where the Conqueror drones were. Lieutenant, permission to lead a rescue mission. Permission granted, replied Barkley, nodding at Schneider. He knew if the Conqueror drones reached the pilots before the Marines did, they would die. Take Private Spencer, Ronaldo, Hayes, and Brentwood. The words were scarcely out of his mouth when the parachutes disappeared behind the tree line. Almost instantly, the screaming began. Belay that order. Barkley said, his face turning a ghastly white. He'd heard those types of screams before, back on the planet they'd found the drones on during their early exploration when the distant horizon had first made transit into this galaxy. It's too late. Sergeant Schneider gripped his rifle tighter as the distant screams faded away. He gazed in the direction of the tree line, contemplating going in search of the pilots. They're gone, Barkley said, tight-lipped and angry. He looked around considering his options. He had two full squads protecting the laser turret. In the distance near other towers, he could see more Anlon bombers diving and dropping munitions. He had a sinking feeling more Conqueror drones had made it to the surface than Command was admitting or were aware of. He wondered just how many drones one of those pods held. Movement in the trees drew his attention as the first Conqueror drone appeared. The metal crab-like creature was about four meters across with numerous legs and four appendages with large and dangerous-looking claws. It seemed to pause for a moment and then began charging toward the laser turret and the Marines. Barkley heard a loud humming noise and suddenly two ruby-red beams struck the drone, 
blowing it apart. Before he could voice his approval, the entire tree line came alive as dozens of deadly drones emerged and began charging toward the Marine's position. He was stunned by how fast they were moving. Fire! he yelled, seeing it would take the drones only a few seconds to cover the distance between the trees and the concrete barriers. From the protection of the concrete walls, the Marines began firing, laying down a heavy hail of automatic rifle fire that blasted into the oncoming drones. Above them, the laser turret recycled and let out another blast, incinerating a second drone. More bombers are inbound, yelled Sergeant Schneider, pointing upward as he saw another flight of four Anlons diving toward their position. Lieutenant Barkley nodded as he kept the trigger on his weapon depressed. He was firing round after round into the advancing drones, seeing they were having little effect. The bullets weren't penetrating. With dawning realization, he realized the drones they'd fought before were an older model. These must be newer and better armored. Switch to explosive rounds, he yelled, seeing his marines were in danger of being overrun. At the same time, the bombers made their first pass, dropping munitions on the charging drones. The bombs detonated, blasting huge smoking craters in the ground and throwing dirt and debris over the marines. With satisfaction, Barclay saw nearly half the drones had been taken out. Continue to fire! Most of the Marines had switched to explosive rounds and now began to take the drones down. First one and then another collapsed as they were blown apart or lost too many appendages to allow them to continue to charge the Marines. The bombers returned but couldn't drop more bombs as the drones were too close to the Marines' position. Barclay backed up as a drone reached the concrete wall he was standing behind and began to crawl over. He fired an explosive round into the drone's carapace, blasting a gaping hole into it. The drone collapsed and tumbled off the wall, no longer moving. On his right, he heard a Marine let out a piercing scream. Turning, he saw a drone grab a Marine between two of its pinchers and promptly tear him apart. Several Marines charged the drone, firing explosive rounds into it and blowing it apart. The laser cycled again and blew a drone off the wall it had scale. Barclay could feel the heat from the beams and stepped back even farther. His marines were being forced back from the concrete firing walls and slowly retreating toward the laser tower. As they fell back, they fired a hail of explosive rounds into the advancing drones. Another marine screamed as his leg was torn off, but he was spared a gruesome death when Sergeant Schneider ran up and placed his rifle up against the drone's carapace, pressing down on the trigger until his rounds penetrated and damaged the control circuits inside. The drone flopped down to the ground and stopped moving. Then, the fighting died away. That's the last of them, Sergeant Snyder called out as he scanned the battlefield around them. Let's get back to the firing walls and make sure no more can come through the tree line, ordered Barkley as he took a deep breath. Between the two squads, he'd lost two Marines and another three injured. Medics were already treating the wounded. In the distance, he could hear rifle fire and explosions from others under attack. He could also see large numbers of Anlons in the air, dropping munitions. He just hoped none of the Conqueror drones had made it into the cities. General McGowan was in the underground command center monitoring the battle against the Conqueror drones. There had been more drones in the drop pods than he'd imagined possible. They must have been stacked on top of one another inside. What's the status around New Eden? McGowan asked as he gazed at numerous view screens. On one... A ruined laser turret tower lay on the ground with marines engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat against a dozen Conqueror drones. He grimaced as the last marine was torn in two. Then the screen seemed to shudder and the area around the down tower erupted in violent explosions. Anlon bomber strike, Colonel Jarens reported. We couldn't hit them while they were engaged with our marines. The other towers held and our marine squads are reporting the destruction of all Conqueror drones in their respective areas. Around Clements, the fighting was much lighter, and most of the drones were eliminated by Anlon strikes. Any word on casualties? McGowan knew from watching the view screens that a number of his Marines had lost their lives in the brief battle. Not yet, Jarens replied. The Conqueror drones moved much faster than we expected. They managed to overrun a few of our positions before the Anlons could react. General McGowan let out a deep sigh. It had been difficult to watch the screens and see his marines being torn apart by the drones. We'll adjust our future strategy to take into account this increased speed of theirs, 
The armor on these drones seems different than the one the Distant Horizon has in its lab, Jarens continued with a frown on his face. Our armor-piercing rounds had little effect unless fired at nearly point-blank range. Most of our Marines had to resort to explosive rounds to stop the drones. McGowan watched the screen as Marines began to move out across the battlefield, making sure the Conqueror drones were all inactive. Occasionally, a Marine would fire several rounds from point-blank range at a drone and then continue on. I want those drop pods located and secured, he ordered. I need to know how many of those damn drones one of them contains. I also want to know why we're having such a hard time shooting them down. None of them should have made it to the surface of Gaia. Yes, General, Colonel Jarens replied. I'll have the teams on the way to drop pods momentarily. General McGowan stared at the view screen for another few moments. The city streets were empty with all civilians safely in the underground shelters. The only movement were marine squads patrolling the streets. I want the surrounding area between the pods and the two cities searched. I want to make sure we've destroyed every one of those damn things. Colonel Jarens nodded. I'll contact the commanders of all three bases and have them send out marines to start a thorough sweep. McGowan turned away, knowing for today the battle had been won. His biggest concern was what would happen next. If today was any indication, the next wave of Conqueror drones would be much larger, particularly if the defense grid had suffered major damage. Fourth Fleet and the Alton Fleet jumped back into orbit around Gaia. Several ships were sent immediately to the Clan Protector for damage repair, and the four fleet repair ships were ordered out to work on the other damaged ships. What did we lose? Jeremy asked as he leaned back in his command chair. They'd won this first round, but how many others were waiting in their future? It's not as bad as it could have been, Commander Malin said as she looked at the latest data on the ships lost, as well as the damage the fleet sustained. We lost the battleship Canis, battle cruiser Cheyenne, strike cruiser Alpine, and two light cruisers. The Altons lost the battle cruiser Swiftstar and Starreach. We also have about a dozen ships which will need major yard time to bring them back up to full combat readiness. What about our forces here at Gaia? They were hit pretty hard, Commander Malin replied. The AIs lost six of their ships, and Rear Admiral Marx lost two Monarch cruisers and three light cruisers. She also lost 42% of her Anlon bombers and 12% of her fighters. From the defense grid, we lost six of the Type II battle stations and 24% of the particle beam satellites. Jeremy winced at hearing those numbers. What about Grayseth and the Clan Protector? For some reason, the Simulans avoided that area, Malin answered. They might have detected the ion cannons the shipyard has, suggested Ariel from Jeremy's side. Or they could have been saving the shipyard for the mopping up process if they won the battle. What now, Jeremy? asked Kevin, getting up from his sensor console and coming to stand by his friend. The Simulans will be back, and they know what our defenses are like now. Jeremy looked over at Angela and saw she had the same questioning look upon her face. He let out a deep sigh. We repair our damage and get ready for the next attack. We'll redistribute the remaining particle beam satellites and adjust the orbits of the battle stations to fill in the gaps. I want 4th Fleet and the Alton Fleet to move down into the grid, and we'll add our firepower to it when the simulans return. What about the Project Andrum and the others are working on? asked Kevin. I don't think the simulans will return until they feel confident they can take us. Should we consider evacuating? asked Commander Malin. The command center became very quiet as the crew waited to hear Jeremy's answer. No, Jeremy replied firmly. It'll take the simulants several days at least, or maybe longer, before they can launch another attack. I'm going over to the distant horizon and see how close Andrum is to completing his research. Jeremy paused for a moment and then added, Angela, Kevin, I want you to come with me. The crew didn't seem surprised at their admiral taking Kevin and Angela along. After all, they were part of the Special Five. Rear Admiral Catherine Barnes gazed at the massive view screen, which dominated the front wall of the command center. It was focused on Gaia, and she was relieved damage down the surface had been minimal. We only have some minor damage to the hull, reported Colonel Leon. She'd been going over the damage reports that had been submitted from each department. I wish we had the new energy shield ready to go, Commander Grissom said. It would make a big difference. It's installed on the Gaia, Catherine responded. She was in orbit along with the rest of our ships. Check with Commander Newman and see how the shield reacted during the battle. 
Admiral Barnes, interrupted Captain Travers from communications. Admiral Strong is coming over and he wants to meet with Andrum. Catherine nodded. She'd been concerned about going into battle with the research group on board, but Clarissa had been quite vocal about being able to keep the ship and crew safe. He's also bringing the other two Special Five with him. Looking over at Kelsey, Catherine noted the frown that had appeared on her face. Catherine knew none of those five cared for that name. Very well, she answered. Inform Andrum the Admiral is on his way over. She would speak to Travers later and remind him to use the ranks of the five and not their nickname. Jeremy stepped into the large research lab where the Altons and Zed were working. He saw it was a beehive of activity with over a dozen Alton scientists in the room, as well as a number of Alton and human technicians. What immediately drew his attention was a large rocket-shaped device lying upon a big metal table where Zed was busy attaching some type of complicated-looking electronic device. Kevin and Angela tentatively followed Jeremy inside, not quite sure why they were there. With surprise, they saw Katie and Kelsey were already in the lab, along with Rear Admiral Barnes. Admiral Strong, spoke Andrum, seeing the Admiral had entered the lab. I'm glad you could come over. We're just about to run our first test. I need to finish installing this final hyperspace frequency wave emitter, Zed commented, as the AI used two of its tentacles to carefully attach the device to the missile-like object on the table. It'll only take another minute. Shiloom was standing near Zed, observing what the AI was doing. Is the power going to be sufficient? It should be for this test, Zed replied, as the AI finished the installation and then attached a cover piece, making the small missile look whole. We're only using an infinitesimal amount of dark matter. Everything looks good, Miko informed everyone from her computer console. Power is flowing and the emitter is ready to activate. What exactly are we doing? asked Jeremy. When we travel in hyperspace, we actually enter another dimension of space-time, explained Shilu, as she stepped over to Miko's console and studied several readings. The jump drives in our ships generate a hyperwave that opens up a spatial vortex. The more power we can use to generate the hyperwave, the faster our ships can travel. The governing laws in our universe prevent vessels from exceeding the speed of light because of the increase in inertial mass as a ship nears the speed of light. It would require nearly infinite energy to accomplish. However, in the hyperdimension, the laws of our universe no longer hold true. We have also discovered the hyperdimension has a number of different levels, perhaps an infinite number, which can be influenced by dark energy and dark matter. What this device does is make the levels we normally use too unstable to allow hyper travel. What if the simulants use different levels than we do? asked Kelsey. From what we have observed, they travel in what we would call the mid range upper levels the same as we do. Those are the ones we're going to destabilize. Jeremy stepped over closer to Zed to examine the jamming missile. How many of these would we need to keep the simulans out of the nebula? Hundreds, admitted Andrum with a deep sigh. However, if we were to deploy just a few dozen around Gaia's star system, we could make the simulans drop out of hyperspace considerably short of the system. From what we've seen of their subspace drives, it would take then over a year to reach us from where we can force them to drop out. That'll give us time to deploy even more hyperspace emitters, eventually sealing off the entire nebula. And us too, commented Kevin with a frown. It would tie us permanently to Gaia with no way to see what is going on in the rest of the galaxy, particularly the Sigma system. We would never know if any more ships come through from our galaxy, Angela said worriedly. There could be another rescue mission in the future, and we would never know about it. Can we make our ships immune to the jamming signal? Asked Jeremy. He would like to continue to monitor the Sigma system, as well as keep an eye on the simulants. No, answered Shiloom, shaking her head. It's not the ship's hyperdrive we're influencing with the emitters. It's hyperspace itself. Perhaps we should leave several tunnels open through the nebula, mused Andrum, as he thought over what would be necessary. We could set up a number of the emitter satellites to shut down when signaled. 
it would still take a few hours for hyperspace in those areas to return to normal, Shilum said, as she ran some quick calculations on Miko's computer console. It'd take a powerful hyperspace transmitter and several booster satellites placed strategically in the nebula to order the emitters to shut down in the designated tunnel areas. A hyperspace transmitter will still work? asked Catherine, showing surprise. Wouldn't the emitters affect hyperspace communication as well? No, Andrum replied. Hyperspace communications use the lower levels, or bands, for messages. If we had the power and could assess the really high levels of hyperspace, communications across light years would be almost instantaneous. That's one of the reasons we've made the advances in FTL communication over recent years, Angela added. When we started using Alton power systems to operate our communication systems, we nearly cut in half the time it took to send a message across Federation space. I ran some simulations with the aid of Ariel, and with the Fusion 5 reactors and a big enough transmitter, we could cut that time in half again. Everything seems to be functioning within the set perimeters for the test, reported Miko. As she checked her console one more time, she turned around and looked expectantly at Andrum. Very well. Let's turn it on, he responded. Activating the emitters, reported one of the human technicians, as he touched several icons on a computer display. From the small missile, a low-pitched humming could be heard. Everyone except Zed moved back from the device. There is no danger, Zed said in a nearly human voice. Twenty percent power, Miko reported. Disrupting wave is forming. The device seemed to hum even louder and the level of pitch increased. 40% power, Miko reported, her eyes staying focused on her computer display. Disrupting wave has formed into a sphere 10 meters in diameter. Confirm minor disruption of mid-range hyperspace bands, added Shilum, as she studied the data that was flowing across one of Miko's displays. 60% power, Miko reported, as the device began to vibrate slightly, and the humming increased in pitch even more. Confirming major disruption in all normal hyperspace travel bands. Shilum reported excitedly. It's working. 80% power, reported Miko, as the device began to vibrate more violently. Suddenly sparks shot out from the device, and one of the panels blew off, striking Zed's metal cube. The AI moved back a few meters and continued observing. Then the humming faded away, and moments later, the lab was left in silence. What happened? asked Jeremy, fearing the test had failed. Zed and several Alton and human technicians approached the missile-shaped object and removed a number of panels so they could peer inside. Zed used several tentacles to remove one of the emitters, which looked shorted out as it had obvious burn marks on it. We need to ground the emitters better, the AI reported after a moment. The emitter couldn't handle the power we were feeding into it, and the dark matter at its core burned it out. What does that mean? asked Kevin. If it's grounded better, will it work? Yes, I assume so, Andrum replied, as he stepped over to examine the damaged emitter. A full-scale model, properly powered and grounded, should work fine. Then we can deploy these things? Catherine asked, her eyes showing excitement. Yes, answered Andrum, smiling. The test exceeded my expectations. It will require adjusting some of the hyperspace equations. We set up to predict how the emitters would work. But I don't see any reason not to go ahead and begin constructing some to deploy. How many would we need to protect just the immediate area around Gaia? Asked Jeremy. There was still a danger the simulants could attack before the emitters were ready to deploy. Andrum stepped over next to Shilum and the two spent a few minutes checking equations on one of the computer consoles with the help of Miko. Finally, the two seemed to agree, and Andrum turned back around. Fourteen will adequately protect Gaia from attack, he reported. How long will it take to build them? Andrum gazed at Zed with a questioning look in his eyes. With the aid of human, Alton, and AI technicians, as well as unlimited access to the construction facilities on the clan protector, we can have 14 ready to deploy in three days, Zed answered. Can we get by with fewer? Asked Jeremy, wanting to keep the simulants away from the system. 
They knew which way the simulants came from when they jumped into the Gaia system. If it would work, he was going to deploy half a dozen of the emitters just outside the system to block the simulants' return. No, Andrum answered. It would only deflect the simulants' emergence point to a clear area, possibly even in another part of the Gaia system. Understand also that the disrupting wave the emitters generate only travels at the speed of light in our dimension. Once an emitter is deployed, it will take nearly 40 hours for it to reach maximum coverage, added Shilum. Then let's get to building these emitters, Jeremy ordered. I want them deployed as soon as possible. Ariel and I will have tentative blueprints for a full-sized model within the hour, Clarissa said. As she suddenly appeared next to Katie, I've already downloaded all the necessary information. Zed and I will go over to the clan protector and begin setting up an assembly line, added Corrine, who had been observing everything. She was in the lab because Zed was. I'll speak to Dale Thon to make sure he understands the importance of this, added Jeremy. He wanted everyone to understand construction of the emitters had first priority over everything else, even repairing the damaged warships. As everyone filed out of the lab, Jeremy just hoped they had the time. He was deeply worried the simulants would attack again before the emitters were ready to deploy. All five of them were in the officer's mess on the New Horizon. Can we get the emitters finished in time? Angela asked. She'd spoken to Brace earlier and had been relieved to hear he wasn't involved in the fighting on the ground, though many of his marines were. I hope so, replied Jeremy, wanting to sound positive. It should take the simulants several days to gather the forces they need to attack us again. Maybe, Kevin said doubtfully. The fleet we engaged between the third and fourth planets escaped with most of their ships intact. They could return any time. Yes, Jeremy admitted with a frown. After viewing some of the battle data, it's evident their main purpose was to keep us from returning to Gaia. In many instances when one of their ships was damaged, it immediately withdrew to the back of their formation rather than press the attack. Same as we did, Kevin said. That's why losses on both sides were so light. The only problem is they can afford to lose ships and we can't, stated Kelsey. We can't replace the lives that were lost. Jeremy knew Kelsey was right. Every ship they lost impacted their population base. They'd lost more people in the recent battle than the number of babies born since the fleets had become stranded. He took a deep breath and gazed down at the food on his plate. He didn't feel much like eating. We'll get the emitters built in time, Katie said her light green eyes glowing with confidence. I know Andrum and the others will do everything they can to make that happen. And once the emitters are in place, we have a wedding to finish planning, quipped Clarissa, as she suddenly appeared next to the table with a big smile on her face. Ariel and I have come up with some other ideas for a beach wedding. Oh no, muttered Angela, closing her eyes. Katie and Kelsey started laughing. Only Clarissa could go from talking about life and death to planning a wedding. I have picked out an outfit also, Clarissa announced. She closed her eyes and her clothing changed. She was now wearing a dark blue low-cut dress, which was extremely short. It also showed a tremendous amount of cleavage. Clarissa, admonished Katie, her eyes bulging. I'm not sure that's appropriate for a wedding, and I suspect you've enhanced your boobs again. Only somewhat, Clarissa said defensively. Then, with a frown, she closed her eyes for a moment, and her boob shrank, and the dress adjusted to show much less. Is this better? We're getting there, Katie said noncommittally. Kelsey and I will help you pick out something to wear. Can we go shopping? Clarissa asked, her eyes lighting up. We could set up some holographic projectors in one of the clothing stores in New Eden. Katie let out a deep sigh. Maybe, she replied. Let's get the hyperspace emitters built first, and then we'll talk about it. Great, Clarissa answered. I'll tell Ariel we're going to get to go shopping. With that, the AI promptly disappeared. Wait, Katie began, but the AI was gone. Guess we're going shopping, Kelsey said, shaking her head. That should be an interesting experience. Kevin and Jeremy said nothing. The entire exchange had been highly humorous. With the danger they were facing, it had been nice to feel normal for just a few minutes. Jeremy wondered if that had been the real purpose of what Clarissa had done. 
Sometimes, Jeremy suspected the two AIs understood humans much better than they let on. Chapter 19 Ten days passed and the first 14 emitters were successfully deployed with no interference from the simulants. Tensions were high in the Gaia system as the second wave of hyperspace emitters were readied for deployment. I don't understand, Catherine said to Jeremy with a confused look in her eyes. They were in the command center of the Avenger discussing the coming emitter deployment. Why haven't they attacked? I don't know, Jeremy admitted as he leaned back in his command chair and folded his arms across his chest. He looked over at Catherine, sitting in the other chair to his right. It doesn't make any sense. It might, Ariel said, as she turned and stepped away from Angela's console, where she'd been discussing the upcoming wedding. What if the simulans need their ships elsewhere? What do you mean, elsewhere? asked Jeremy, looking perplexed. They pretty much control this galaxy as near as we can tell. Yes, but remember the Dyson Sphere and the intergalactic vortexes we detected? Ariel reminded him. What if somewhere they've met unusual resistance and need the ships for an attack? Jeremy sat silent for a moment as he thought over Ariel's words. You don't think they're mounting an invasion of our home galaxy, do you? Unknown, Ariel responded, her dark eyes focusing on Jeremy, though it is a possibility. After we located the Dyson Sphere and beat back their first attack here in the Gaia system, they may consider our home galaxy a potential threat. I wish there was some way to destroy the Dyson Sphere, Catherine said, with a frown spreading across her face. She'd come over to the Avenger to discuss the new energy shield the distant horizon was being equipped with. If we could, it would cut this galaxy off from other simulant controlled ones and ensure our home galaxy stays safe. We have no idea how far they've expanded, or even if this is their home galaxy, responded Jeremy, wishing they had more information. For all we know, the Triangulum Galaxy is one of their conquests. I agree it would be great if we could do something about the Dyson Sphere. However, it's too big, and the material it's constructed from is probably impervious to any type of weapon we currently have. I don't think a particle beam or an antimatter missile would affect it. I can confirm that. Ariel said. The scans the distant horizon took show the entire sphere is composed of several unknown alloys of tremendous strength. Some of these same alloys were found in the excavations the Altons did on several of the abandoned originator worlds they discovered in their early explorations. It would have to be, in order to withstand the radiation from the star it surrounds. I don't see any way we can attack it. I wish we knew more about these originators, commented Catherine. From what Andrum said, their science is tremendously more advanced than the Altons. The Dyson Sphere is absolute proof of that, Ariel responded. Not even what the AIs built around the black hole can compare to it, and that was the biggest construction project ever done in our galaxy. I'll speak to Andrum, Catherine said after a moment. Once this next set of emitters is deployed, I'll suggest we focus his research on a method to destroy the Dyson Sphere. I also want to see if he'll tell me any more about these mysterious originators. I get the impression the Altons are hesitant to speak about them. It might be a waste of time having Andrum look into a way to destroy the sphere, Jeremy replied. How can you destroy something that encloses a star? However, it won't hurt to see what he can come up with. Looking at the main view screen, Jeremy gazed down at Gaia. The planet seemed so peaceful. I also want to know more about the originators. Where did they come from, and did they have colonies in this galaxy as well? The probability is very high, Ariel responded. With the Dyson Sphere being here, there are bound to have been colonies as well. Jeremy let out a heavy sigh. The Triangulum Galaxy held a number of mysteries. He would love nothing better than to go in search of the originator colony worlds, though he suspected all they would find would be ancient ruins. He knew Catherine felt the same way. The distant horizon had been built for exploration, a task that, with the decision to stay in the nebula, the ship would never get to fulfill. Once this next set of 24 emitters were deployed, they would be safe from attack and committed to not venturing forth in the near future. Perhaps they could finally make this world their home. Eventually, he planned on seeding the entire nebula with the hyperspace disruption emitters to keep the simulans out. In the Blue Giant Nebula, the simulants were preparing for an invasion. Inside the Dyson Sphere, nearly 3,000 simulant warships were gathered. 
For some unknown reason, the expeditionary invasion force sent to the AI's galaxy had failed to report back. They were shortly going to send a massive reinforcing fleet through to ensure that galaxy was swiftly brought under their control. It was remotely possible the initial force had run into unexpected resistance. If its numbers had been significantly reduced, the remaining ships might not have been able to deploy sufficient energy-collecting satellites, so a reverse vortex to the Great Sphere could be established. We will go through in 20 hours, said the High Commander of the fleet. All ships will be at maximum battle readiness. I have checked with the battle computer, replied the ship's second-in-command. It believes the expeditionary fleet might have met resistance from the AIs and the same organics who came to this galaxy. It doesn't matter, spoke the High Commander confidently. This fleet is powerful enough and contains sufficient battle cruisers to ensure victory. What about the AIs and organics we discovered hiding in the nebula? They will be dealt with shortly, replied the High Commander. A second force is being gathered and will arrive at the nebula in eight days. We know their defenses and the capabilities of their ships. This time, they will be defeated and annihilated. Admiral Race Tolson looked worriedly at the ship's tactical displays, fearful of what might shortly be coming. Less than an hour previously, the intergalactic vortex had flared to life for a brief time. They could be coming through at any moment, commented Commander Arnett. The fleet's at condition too. They'll be coming through in far greater numbers than before, Race predicted worriedly. The relief fleets are all here, Madeline pointed out, gesturing toward another display in the waiting fleets. We could push the schedule and send them through now. There would be a risk, Race said as he considered her suggestion. The simulants could show up as the fleets are going through. If that were to happen... They'd be sitting ducks. We also don't know what would happen if two intergalactic vortexes were established in such close proximity to one another. If we wait, we might not get the opportunity to send them through at all, said Colonel Cowell. I think we have to take the risk. Race took a deep breath as he reached a decision. This was their only chance to reinforce the lost fleets. To wait might lose the opportunity permanently. Let's do it. Contact Palel and tell him it's time to send the fleets through. Looking at the tactical displays, the area around the weakened area of space was covered in green icons, representing Federation and Alliance ships. There were also 20 indomitable class battle stations enclosing the area, plus 2,000 particle beam satellites. Race had a horrifying feeling. It wasn't going to be enough to stop the simulans this time. The relief fleets rapidly organized themselves as excitement swept through the ships. They were finally going to the Triangulum Galaxy to aid the lost fleets. Every person in the fleets were volunteers and knew this was probably a one-way mission. There would be no returning home. They were going to fight a war to keep the home galaxy safe, as well as colonize a new world. Morale was high as word swept through the fleets the time had finally come. I can't believe so many ships showed up. Madeline said, as the command crew worked like mad trying to coordinate everything. Some heads are going to roll once word of what we've done gets back to the Federation Council, Race said grimly. He knew he'd stretched his orders by not destroying the capacitor stations when Sixth Fleet arrived and he'd been told to do so. I'm not sure even Fleet Admiral Nagumo will survive the repercussions of our actions. I have Admiral Corell on the comm, reported Lieutenant Travers with an unhappy look. He's demanding to know what we're doing and why we're not moving immediately to detonate the capacitor stations. Tell Admiral Corell we're sending the relief fleets through first, answered Race, dismissing Corell from his mind. There was nothing the Sixth Fleet Admiral could do to stop the fleets now. Message sent, reported Travers. A few moments later, she frowned and turned back to Admiral Tolson. I'm picking up an FTL transmission from the Orion Victory. He's sending a report of what we're getting ready to do to the Federation, commented Madeline, shaking her head. How did that man ever become an admiral? Race didn't show the anger he was feeling, only nodded his head. He has some family connections. It'll take several weeks for his message to get to the Federation. This will all be over by then, and we'll be on our way back home. I wonder what kind of welcome we'll get, asked Colonel Cowell with a grimace. 
We'll probably all be court-martialed. If we are, we won't be alone, Race responded. A lot of people had been involved in assembling the relief fleets. Hillel says he can activate the Vortex at any time, reported Lieutenant Travers, as a new message came in. Relief fleets are ready, Madeline said, as she listened to the different fleet groups report in over her minicom. Race touched his own minicom, switching it to fleet-wide so all commanding officers in the different fleets could hear him. We are about to activate the Vortex. You will be going to another galaxy to fight in a war against a race that possesses a far greater threat than the AIs or the Hawklands ever did. You're all volunteers. Some of you have family in the Lost Fleets. Race paused, looking around the command center, all eyes on him. I wish you luck and good hunting. The Federation and its allies will never forget you. Race turned to Madeline. Inform Palel to activate the Vortex. Looking at the view screens, Race could see the three capacitor stations, which had been moved into close proximity to the weakened area of space. Thirty small vortex generators formed a ring, which would allow the formation of an intergalactic spatial vortex 800 meters in diameter. Vortex activated, reported Colonel Cowell, as a spinning white spatial vortex formed in the center of one of the main view screens. Send them through. Race ordered, in a calm voice. Type 2 battle stations transiting, reported Lieutenant Davis from sensors. Race nodded. They had modified 20 of the Type 2 battle stations, adding additional particle beam weapons and equipping them with heavier shields. The battle stations had minimal crews and would be responsible for defending the exit vortex from simulant attack. They'd been equipped with basic hyperdrives to allow them to make the transit. They were using maneuvering thrusters to enter the vortex since they were not equipped with sublight drives. As Race watched, the first 150-meter globe reached the vortex and vanished. The others followed in quick succession. Admiral Jackson is moving his fleet up, Madeline reported, as she watched the tactical display near her. It was full of friendly green icons waiting to make the transit. Admiral Jackson had volunteered to lead the Federation contingent through the vortex, He'd explained to Race that at his age, he didn't want to face a court-martial or be assigned to a desk job. The fleet he was leading in the Dauntless were the ships Fleet Admiral Nagumo had pulled from the reserve fleet and updated in the shipyards around Nutellus. The fleet consisted of six battleships, ten battle cruisers, twenty strike cruisers, ten light cruisers, eight older fleet repair ships, two hospital ships, twenty supply ships, six fleet training vessels carrying 60,000 replacement crew personnel, and ten very old and very large colony ships. Each colony ship held 20,000 colonists who had volunteered to go to Gaia to live. As Race watched, the six battleships moved up to make transit first, in case their firepower was needed when they exited the vortex. No one knew for sure what might be waiting for them but there was bound to be some type of simulant response when they detected the fleets appearing in the Sigma system. That was one of the reasons they'd sent the battle stations first. Good luck, Admiral Jackson, Race said over his minicom. It's been an honor serving with you. I'll tell Admiral Strong you said hello. Give the politicians back in the Federation hell, Jackson replied, as the Dauntless vanished into the vortex. The other ships of the fleet quickly followed their flagship into the swirling spatial anomaly. Cirrus and Nutellus relief fleets are going through next, Madeline reported, as the next group of ships neared the vortex. Race looked at the tactical display and the green icons representing the fleet. These were all new ships Governor Barnes and Senator Carnes had managed to get constructed and sent to the Galactic Center in the guise of protecting Astral. Ambassador Tureen had even gone along with the deception. There were eight battleships, 12 battle cruisers, 20 strike cruisers, 20 light cruisers, one hospital ship, two fleet repair ships, 20 supply ships, and five more colony ships, carrying 100,000 colonists. The mixed fleet quickly entered the vortex, with the distance separating transiting ships less than 1,000 meters. Admiral Bacall is up next, Madeline said, as she watched the tactical display. So far, everything was going very smoothly. It had been a surprise when the Altons informed them they also would be sending a relief fleet. It was a powerful fleet of 20 battleships, 40 battle cruisers, 6 additional science ships, and 2 very advanced colony ships carrying 20,000 Altons. Ambassador Tureen had sent a message to Race, 
saying that after reviewing Admiral Strong's data from the message probe, it was better to fight the simulants in their galaxy rather than their own. He had also promised to speak to the Federation Council on race's behalf, as well as the others who were involved in this endeavor. However, the big thing about the Alton ships was what the battleships were dragging behind them with their ship's powerful tractor beams. Each ship was pulling one half of an indomitable class battle station. Once they reached Gaia and were reassembled, there would be ten of the powerful battle stations protecting the planet. Alton fleets making transit, Madeline informed Race. In the tactical display, the friendly green icons of the Alton vessels blinked out one by one as they were swallowed by the vortex. Palel is asking us to hurry, reported Lieutenant Travers, worriedly. He has enough power to keep the vortex activated for only another 14 minutes. That'll be long enough, answered Race. The fleets were entering the vortex with minimal spacing and at high speeds to get all the ships through in the designated time period. His eyes kept shifting over to the sensor screens above Lieutenant Davis's console, worrying the simulants could show up at any moment and bring the transit of the relief fleets to a screeching halt. New Providence relief fleet is up next, said Madeline, as another group of green icons neared the swirling vortex. Looking at one of the view screens, Ray saw the two New Providence battleships enter the vortex, followed by 30 strike cruisers and 10 supply ships. Only the Carthians remain, he said as the last group of ships neared the spatial anomaly. We go on the hunt, Admiral Kalmat said with pride over the comm to race and the others who were listening. Our clans will grow strong and earn much honor in this new galaxy. For the hunt, race responded gravely. Go with honor. As he watched, the bear's flagship hunter entered the vortex followed by 60 medium cruisers. 20 supply ships, and 40 small colony ships carrying 80,000 bears. All relief fleets are through, confirmed Lieutenant Davis, with a relieved sigh as the last icon vanished. Shut down the vortex and begin recharging the capacitor stations, ordered Race. They'd finished with a few minutes to spare, so a lot of power still remained in the stations. Recharge them? inquired Colonel Cowell, looking confused. Shouldn't we be getting ready to destroy them? Not quite yet, Ray said with a wolfish glint in his eyes. I have a plan for the stations and the simulants when they arrive. I wonder if the simulants were waiting for the relief fleets, commented Madeline. There may be a huge battle taking place even now in the Triangulum Galaxy. We just sent 417 ships there, spoke Colonel Cowell with a worried frown. Each ship has a maximum crew. I hope we didn't send all of them to their deaths. We didn't, Race responded his eyes shifting to Cowell. Those crews are maxed out to give Admiral Strong additional crew support if he needs it. Most of those ships could easily operate with 30% less personnel than they have on board. The battle stations in Admiral Jackson's battleships should be able to protect the fleets as they arrive. Admiral Carell is on the comm again, reported Lieutenant Travers in a tired voice. He's demanding we immediately destroy the capacitor stations or he'll fire on them himself. Maybe we should have gone with the relief fleets, muttered Madeline, shaking her head. Admiral Corell was going to be a problem, particularly when they returned to the Federation. Race activated his minicom so he could speak directly to the rebellious Admiral. Don't fire on those stations, Race warned. If you do so, I'll have you brought up on charges of mutiny. Mutiny, sputtered Corell, barely able to hold his anger in check. I'll see you court-martialed. Perhaps, Race replied evenly, but I'm in command, and you will follow my orders, or I'll have you placed in the brig. Carell was quiet for a long moment. Are you going to destroy those stations? When the time is right, Race replied calmly, the simulants won't get control of them, nor will they gain a foothold in our galaxy. You'd better be right, warned Carell. If not, I'll be the first one to testify at your court-martial. Race turned off his minicom with a heavy sigh. What he was planning carried some serious risk. But if it were successful, it would deal a serious setback to the simulants and their war machine. Admiral Jackson felt a wrenching sensation and a brief moment of dizziness as the Dauntless dropped out of hyperspace. He blinked his eyes and took several deep breaths. Even as he did so, he felt the ship shake violently and alarms began sounding. Glancing energy beam strike to bow section 14, only minor damage, reported a shaken Commander Sharon Blanton, 
as she staggered over to the damage control console. Energy screen is coming up. Weapons online, added Captain Dwight Lance from Tactical. Who hit us? demanded Jackson, as the ship's view screens began to come on and the tactical displays began to update. Simulans, reported Lieutenant Miguel Ortega from his sensor console. I'm detecting 80 simulan warships engaging the Type 2 battle stations. Two of these stations have already been destroyed. All systems are powered up and working at optimum levels, reported Commander Blanton. Set condition one throughout the fleet. Stand by to fire weapons, ordered Jackson. They'd made transit at condition two. Battle stations are under heavy fire, reported Lieutenant Ortega. Even as he spoke, one of the battle stations vanished from his sensor screens. Battle station T6 is down. Move us into a system, ordered Jackson. Seeing that his other five battleships had made transit and his battle cruisers were beginning to appear. Put us between the simulans and the vortex so we can protect our other ships as they emerge. We need to give them time to get their energy screens and weapons online. The Dauntless and the other five battleships accelerated and were soon mixed in with the 17 remaining Type II battle stations. All ships fire, ordered Jackson. His eyes focused intently on the tactical display. The battleships fired a flurry of particle beams at the attackers. In the Simulan fleet, the particle beam fire from the battleship slammed into the main part of the Simulan battlecruiser, setting off massive explosions and hurling glowing debris into space. Three of the massive spires disintegrated, and then the ship blew apart. Simulan battlecruiser is down, reported Lieutenant Ortega. On one of the view screens, another one of the battle stations was under heavy attack. Its energy screen glowed brighter and brighter, and then a Simulan energy beam penetrated, blasting a huge glowing crater into the side of the station. The station seemed to shudder violently and then blew apart as a Simulan antimatter missile detonated inside the damaged area. Battle station T-16 is down, reported Ortega, gravely. The stations are taking a lot of damage. Our battle cruisers are joining the battle, reported Commander Blanton, as the ten vessels took up supporting positions around the six battleships. Order the battle carriers to hold position behind us to cover the support vessels. They're to keep the light cruisers with them. But I want the strike cruisers here pronto. Message sent, reported Lieutenant Brendan Neal from Communications. All of our fleet has made transit, reported Commander Blanton, as the friendly green icons appeared in the tactical display. Cirrus and Nutella's fleet are making transit. I want their battleships and strike cruisers in this battle as soon as their shields and weapons are up, ordered Jackson. The rest of their ships are to form up with our battle carriers and support ships. We need to end this battle quickly. The Dauntless shuddered again as several simulant antimatter missiles slammed into the ship's energy shield. Energy shield is holding at 90%, reported Captain Lance. Firing power beams. Battle cruiser Phobos is under heavy attack. Commander Blanton informed Jackson, as she listened to various commanders over her minicom, which was set to fleet-wide. They've suffered an energy beam hit to secondary engineering and have several fires out of control. Put her up on a view screen, ordered Jackson, shifting his attention to the front wall of the command center. The powerful battlecruiser appeared, and Jackson grimaced as he saw the top section of the ship explode, and debris started drifting away from the ship. Order the Phobos to pull back. Too late, Commander Blanton replied as an antimatter missile slammed into the stern of the battlecruiser, and the ship vanished in a fiery explosion. Battlecruiser Phobos is down, reported Lieutenant Ortega in a shaken voice. Our strike cruisers have arrived, Commander Blanton reported, as the 20 green icons spread out around the battleships and battlecruisers. Intensify our rate of fire, ordered Jackson firmly. Hit them with everything we have. The space between the simulants and the human ships became filled with weapons fire. Exploding missiles slammed into the screens of both sides, and occasionally a particle beam or an energy beam would slip through, damaging the unfortunate ship. From the vortex, more ships emerged, and as they did, warships were sent up to assist Admiral Jackson in his battle with the Simulan fleet. As the minutes passed, the Simulans began to lose more ships, as they were now vastly outnumbered. What does the battle computer say? demanded the Simulan high commander. He'd not been expecting to face a fleet this size. His ships had been on patrol in the system when the vortex had activated and 20 small spheres had come through. He'd instantly engaged them, thinking this was some type of probe force. Chance of victory is at 8% and dropping, the ship's second in command reported. The battle computer is recommending an immediate withdrawal. The Simulan high commander winced 
as one of the view screens was covered in white light as an escort cruiser exploded from an antimatter strike. If our other fleets were still in position, we could destroy these organics, he proclaimed, as he gazed with hate at the numerous red icons flooding into the system through the vortex. The other fleets had been pulled back to participate in the invasion of the AI galaxy, the same galaxy these ships were coming from. He had no reinforcements to call upon. We know where they'll go, the second-in-command replied. The battle computer predicts with a 95% certainty these ships will proceed to the nebula, where the other organics and the AIs have taken refuge. The high commander nodded. He'd made his decision. In a few more weeks, we'll have gathered sufficient forces to annihilate all within the nebula. We'll withdraw and take part in that attack. No technologically advanced organics can be allowed to survive. Once our invasion fleet reaches their galaxy, there will be no more ships of the organics coming through this vortex. Strike cruisers Nimrod and Voltaire cover battle station T-14, ordered Jackson as he saw the station being attacked by six simulant vessels. In the last few minutes, six more of the battle stations had died fiery deaths. They'd served their purpose in keeping the simulants away from the open intergalactic vortex, though they were paying a steep price. The station was fighting valiantly against its attackers, firing particle beam after particle beam with its missile tubes in auto mode. Antimatter missiles were being expelled at a rapid rate, lighting up the simulant energy shields with cascades of exploding energy. Suddenly, one of the simulant shields weakened, and several bright blue particle beams penetrated, raking the ship's hull and opening up numerous compartments to the vacuum of space. Then, one of the station's antimatter missiles shot through a hole in the screen generated by a particle beam, and the simulant escort cruiser vanished in a massive fireball of uncontrolled energy. The remaining simulant ships continued to press the station, as they moved closer, firing every energy beam they had at the battle station. The station's screen exploded in a cascade of colors as energy was spread across it. However, the firepower from the simulant ships was too great. A simulant energy beam penetrated the weakened shield, blowing a particle beam cannon to shreds and blasting out a deep glowing gash in the station's armor. Several more particle beams slipped through the energy screen, tearing open major sections of the hull. Finally, Twin simulant antimatter missiles flashed through the now minuscule screen and exploded. Two glowing suns appeared as the station vanished under the onslaught of the released energy. The battle station T-14 is down, reported Ortega. The strike cruiser couldn't get there in time, said Commander Blanton, sadly. Simulant fleet is withdrawing, reported Lieutenant Ortega, as vortexes began to appear on his sensor screens. Let them go, ordered Commander Jackson not wanting to risk losing any more of his valuable ships. How many of the battle stations are left? Only seven, reported Commander Blanton, shaking her head at the losses the stations had taken. Two of them are reporting significant damage. Pull the crews off the two damaged stations and have several of the battle carriers move up and attach the other five to their hulls. Once the two damaged ones have been evacuated, I want Devastator 3 set to destroy them. Also, check the wreckage from the other stations to see if we need to eliminate any of it before we leave. All fleets have made transit, Lieutenant Ortega informed the Admiral. I'm also not picking up anything on the long-range scans except the retreating simulants fleet. Jackson nodded. That gave him enough time to organize his fleets and set out for the nebula. He was surprised there hadn't been more simulant ships waiting for them. From the data Admiral Strong had sent, the simulants normally kept several fleets nearby. He wondered where they were. In a nearby star system, an AI sphere slowly rose up out of the thick concealing atmosphere of the gas giant it had been hiding in. Its long-range sensors had detected the arrival of more Federation fleets and the ensuing brief battle with the simulants. The AI in command immediately ordered an FTL message to be sent to the nebula and to stand by to make a hyperspace jump to the Sigma system. They would make contact with the new arrivals and escort them back safely to the nebula, where they would be taken to Gaia. The AI in command was curious as to why such a large fleet had been sent. There was no doubt it would please Admiral Strong and the other organics, but the AI was interested in finding out just why this fleet was here. Deep in the heart of the Blue Giant Cluster, 
the gathered simulant fleet waited inside the Dyson Sphere. Several times, small vortexes had been established with the AI galaxy as tests were run to ensure everything was as it should be. The massive fleet's high commander gazed impassively at a viewscreen, showing the now inactive vortex. His fleet was ready and would be making the journey in waves with numerous ships transiting within seconds of one another. If there were an organic or an AI fleet waiting, this method would ensure enough ships survived to carry the attack to the enemy. As rapid as the transit was planned, it would take only a few minutes to allow them to overwhelm any waiting opposition. We attack in 12 hours, the High Commander spoke, satisfied with the reports from the last test. Our battle computer predicts a 96% probability. We can successfully make transit and eliminate any waiting opposition. It is as it should be, replied his second in command with little emotion in his voice. We shall go to this new galaxy, find its great sphere, and then begin our war against the galaxy's organics. Hours passed, and Race was pacing in the command center, as much more time had gone by than he'd thought possible before the expected simulant attack. Glancing at one of the main view screens, he could see three massive globes floating in space. All three of the capacitor stations had been moved inside the weakened area of space, where he expected the vortex to open. Admiral Corell is demanding to know what you're waiting for, reported Lieutenant Travers, with a disgusted look on her face. He's threatening to send another FTL message to the Federation. Before Race could reply, warning alarms began flashing, and red lights appeared on the sensor console. Vortex activation, reported Lieutenant Davis. Massive vortex is forming. All ships go to Condition 1, ordered Race, over his fleet-wide minicom. Stand by to fire weapons. Immediately, more alarm klaxons began to sound, and additional red lights started to flash. The command center came alive with intense activity as the crew prepared for battle. Order all non-combatants to jump out, ordered Race. The fleet repair ships, simulant science vessels, and the supply ships would make the jump to the astral system. Simulant ships making transit, reported Commander Arnett, as red thread icons began to appear in the tactical display nearer. All ships, hold your fire, ordered Race, as he prepared to implement his plan. Colonel Cowell looked at Race in confusion, but passed the command on to tactical. 240 simulant battlecruisers, reported Lieutenant Davis, as the sensors identified the enemy ships. More ships making transit. Our non-combatant ships have jumped. What is the first group doing? demanded Race. He needed them to stay in the weakened area of space. Forming a defensive globe around the vortex, Madeline answered, as she studied the tactical display. They're scanning the capacitor stations, but haven't fired upon them, added Lieutenant Davis. They're not armed, so they're not a threat, explained Race, nodding his head in satisfaction. He had hoped the simulants would ignore the stations. More than likely, they'd want to board them and check out the technology to see if there was anything they could add to their own. More ships making transit, Colonel Cowell said worriedly as the tactical displays began to fill up with red thread icons. Admiral Corell is demanding permission to open fire, reported Lieutenant Travers. All ships hold your fire, Race ordered again, knowing some of the crews were probably getting trigger happy. For long minutes, the simulants continued to make transit, and then finally, after the last ship had come through, the vortex collapsed and disappeared. Detecting 3,212 simulant vessels, reported Lieutenant Davis in a stunned voice. Admiral Corell is requesting permission to withdraw, added Lieutenant Travers. That figures, muttered Madeline. Race was quiet for a moment, and then, leaning forward, typed in a code on his command console. Instantly, a signal was sent to the three waiting capacitor stations. Inside each, a dead man switch was activated. Power conduits opened, and energy was allowed to flow unrestricted through the massive stations. In just a few microseconds, all three stations detonated in blasts as bright as a supernova. The sudden release of energy spread out around the stations, encompassing a number of simulant vessels. There was also a powerful blast wave radiating outward from all three. Filaments of fire spread out across the weakened area of space, consuming nearly everything it touched. Confirmed detonation of all three capacitor stations, reported Lieutenant Davis, 
as all the screens in the command center were suddenly covered in static. The ship shook briefly, lights dimmed, and then everything settled back down. For a few moments, there was silence, and the screens began coming back to life. Race looked intently at one of the view screens, showing three glowing suns in the center of the weakened area of space. Around them, hundreds of smaller fires seemed to be burning. All units, open fire, he ordered. Lieutenant Davis, get me a count on the surviving simulant ships. It looked to race that the damage the capacitor stations had done to the simulants was far more than he'd hoped. There's still a lot of interference, Davis reported, as he tried to interpret the data coming in. Just how big were those explosions? asked Commander Arnett, as she gazed in awe at the view screens. I've never seen anything like that. Not even when Admiral Strong destroyed the translation stations of the AIs. I don't know, Race replied. Not even Palel was certain what would happen when we released all the stored energy in the capacitor stations. I know it was far more than a thousand antimatter missiles all detonating at once. At least 1,600 simulant ships confirmed destroyed, Davis finally said, as his sensors began to give him some data. Many of the others are heavily damaged or adrift. All ships, move in and finish them off, ordered Race, feeling the tension ease. All battle stations and particle beam satellites are to open fire. We lost some of the particle beam satellites in the blast, Commander Arnett reported. That was to be expected, Race replied, as the fleet opened fire on the now disorganized and nearly helpless simulant ships. Most of their shields were down, and with the firepower he had available, they wouldn't be able to last long. His trap had worked. As he gazed at the view screens, he felt great sadness. While he had in all probability eliminated this simulant threat to the galaxy, he'd permanently marooned the Lost Fleets and the Relief Fleets in the Triangulum Galaxy. There was a good chance they would never be heard from again. The explosion of the three capacitor stations in the weakened area of space had ensured no vortex could ever form there again. Chapter 20 Jeremy stared in amazement as the relief fleets continued to drop out of hyperspace into the Gaia system. Ship after ship exited swirling blue-white vortexes and joined their fleet formations. It had been necessary to shut down 20% of the hyperspace disruption emitters to allow the fleet's entry into the Gaia system. As soon as the last ship made transit, the signal would be sent to reactivate them. There are so many spoke Kelsey, staring in disbelief at the large view screen in the command center of the distant horizon. Admiral Jackson is leading the fleets, commented Catherine, as a large number of Carthian ships began to appear. There are colony ships, supply ships, and even ten fleet repair ships, added Kevin. He was standing next to Katie at her computer console. As well as some Alton colony ships, added Andrum with a big smile. I am told 20,000 members of my race volunteered to come to Gaia. But look at this, Catherine said as she adjusted the large view screen. Instantly, an Alton battleship came into view, pulling a partial sphere behind it. What's that? asked Angela, not recognizing what she was seeing. Part of an indomitable class battle station, answered Clarissa. She was standing next to Catherine with her hands on her shapely hips. When reassembled, there will be ten of them. Jeremy was silent for a long moment. Admiral Jackson is more senior than I am. He will now be in command of our fleets. Surely he won't take command away from you, uttered Kevin, showing shock at Jeremy's statement. It's his right, Jeremy replied in a calm voice. I want to set up a meeting with all fleet admirals on the clan protector in four hours. That should give the relief fleet sufficient time to go into orbit. 416 ships, confirmed Captain Reynolds. Why are they here? asked Commander Grissom. Anne looked at Jeremy questionably. I don't know, answered Jeremy. It was great to see the ships from home, but he was deeply concerned they were here for another reason, rather than just to colonize Gaia. He suspected he would find out when he spoke to Admiral Jackson. Four hours later, Jeremy and all the admirals of the fleets were gathered in a large conference room upon the clan protector. Looking around the room at those present, Jeremy couldn't help but feel 
A big chunk of the leadership of the Federation fleets, as well as their allies, were present in the room. From his own forces, there was Grayseth, Dalethon, Rear Admiral Marks, Rear Admiral Barnes, Admiral Cletius, the Command AI, and himself. From the relief fleets, there were Admiral Jackson, Admiral Bacall, Admiral Sith, and Admiral Calmont. Jeremy cleared his throat and spoke. Let's get this meeting started. I'm sure we all have a lot of questions. For the first order of business, I formally turn over military command of the forces in the Gaia system to Admiral Jackson. A number of the people in the room looked surprised. Even the command AI seemed to be startled as the glowing ball of energy, which served as its head, seemed to double in size and brightness. Admiral Jackson stood and smiled. I believe we're missing a few key people. He spoke into his minicom and the door opened as Kelsey, Kevin, Katie, and Angela stepped in. I ask them to attend this meeting, as we have a very important ceremony to attend to. I don't understand, said Jeremy, feeling confused. Admiral Jackson stepped around the table and approached Jeremy. From a folder he was carrying, he removed a letter bearing the seal of the President of the Human Federation of Worlds. From his pocket, he removed a small metal case. Admiral Jeremy Strong, by orders of the President of the Human Federation of Worlds, you are hereby promoted to the rank of Fleet Admiral, Jackson said in a solemn voice. He opened the case and removed two five-pointed gold stars, the symbol of the rank of a Fleet Admiral. With an element of grace, he removed the simpler stars of Admiral from Jeremy's shoulders and replaced them with the new insignia. Stepping back, he saluted Jeremy as everyone else in the room stood and did the same. Fleet Admiral, commented Kevin with a grin. Does that mean I get a raise? Everyone laughed and started talking. Grayseth walked up to a still-stunned Jeremy and grabbed him in a tight bear hug, forcing the breath from his lungs. The clan has been greatly honored with your promotion, Grayseth proclaimed with deep satisfaction in his voice. It is only right that you continue to command the hunt. Kelsey came over to Jeremy and looked at him with pride. After what we've all been through, you deserve this. She said, you're the reason we're all still alive. Clarissa and Ariel suddenly appeared, startling Admiral Jackson. Both were dressed in their regular fleet uniforms. Fleet Admiral, they both said in unison with pleased looks in their eyes. Thank you. Jeremy finally managed to stutter, addressing Admiral Jackson. I think it's best if we get this meeting started. For the next several hours, Admiral Jackson and the others filled in the lost fleet admirals on what had been occurring back in the Federation and the former Hawkland Empire. The Borzon and the Shari are stirring up trouble along their respective borders, Jackson informed them with a deep sigh. Sometime in the future there will be another war, but by then we should have hundreds of former Hawkland slave races as new allies. You mentioned Admiral Tolson plans on using the remaining three capacitor stations to close the black hole area prevent intergalactic vortexes from forming, asked Jeremy with a concerned look. This would permanently maroon them in the Simulan galaxy, and from what Jackson had said, they wouldn't even be able to send a message probe back because they couldn't generate enough energy to do so. Yes, Jackson replied. That will effectively eliminate the Simulan menace to our galaxy. We think from some of the energy readings we observed in their previous attack, They'll still be able to open up small vortexes in other sections of the galaxy. However, Admiral Tolson and the Altons feel confident only a few ships will be able to come through, and they should be able to handle them easily. That's one of the main reasons for the size of the relief fleet. We want to take the war to the Simulans and prevent any of their ships going to our galaxy. It'll take a lot of energy to move the vortex's exit point away from the galactic center. We need to find their power sources and eliminate them so they can't eventually generate the power to send large fleets through again. Admiral Tolson's wrong about the threat being eliminated, Jeremy said, shaking his head and drawing in a deep breath. I need to tell you what we found here in the Triangulum Galaxy, and why the home galaxy is still in grave danger. Jeremy then began, with the help of Catherine, Andrum, and Clarissa, to describe the Dyson Sphere they'd discovered. Admiral Jackson and those with him stared in utter shock when Clarissa projected an image of the Dyson Sphere on the view screen in the conference room. We'd been better off leaving the area around the black hole alone, commented Admiral Seth of New Providence. 
At least there we could pin down the simulans as they emerged. Now what are we going to do? They could show up anywhere in the galaxy with a massive war fleet. Jeremy looked around at the others, seeing the worry in their eyes. There's only one thing we can do, he said grimly. We have to find some way to destroy the Dyson Sphere. All eyes turned toward the massive dark sphere on the view screen. How could they destroy something so large and protected by thousands of simulant warships? It will take time to develop a plan, Jeremy said after a few moments. We need to continue deploying our hyperspace disruption emitters to ensure this nebula is impervious to the simulants. The new colonists need to be settled on Gaia. We have a lot of work to do if we're to take the war to the simulants. You're right, Admiral Jackson responded. The Dyson Sphere has been there for millions of years. It can wait for a few more. We should have the time, particularly if Admiral Tolson is successful in destabilizing the Vortex area. It'll take the simulants a while to figure out what happened. Jeremy nodded. Then let's figure out how we're going to settle the new colonists on Gaia. With the number of people you've brought, we can build a beautiful world to live upon. The two cities we currently have on the surface can be the beginning of something truly marvelous. While it's true that only a small part of Gaia around the equator is habitable, it's still a large enough area to serve us for many centuries to come. Grayseth stood and looked over at Admiral Calmont. You have brought males and females from our five largest clans, he boomed in his loud voice. Gaia will be a good home for the clans, and our young can learn the ways of the hunt as they did in the early years. Jeremy smiled warmly. Admiral Jackson, Admiral Bacall, Admiral Sith, and Admiral Calmont, I want to welcome you to your new home. I'm certain the members of the Lost Fleets are anxious to receive the messages you've brought, as well as become reunited with the family members and loved ones which are part of the colony fleets. In the home galaxy in the old human federation of worlds, the planet Macon orbited around its primary. On its surface, former Fleet Admiral Heaton Streth was in the midst of a terrible dream. He was floating in space, and before him was a massive black object encompassing a star. His mind could scarcely comprehend what he was seeing when he was suddenly awoke. Janice sat up when she heard Heden groan loudly. Was it a vision? She asked worriedly. It had been months since Heden last experienced one. Janice had hoped they were over. Was it about Jeremy and the Lost Fleets? She reached over and turned a lamp on. My head, muttered Heden reaching his right hand up and massaging his brow. He stood up and staggered over to the window. Opening it, he allowed the cool breeze blowing off the lake to strike him. Taking a number of deep breaths, he turned back toward his wife. I think we screwed up big time. Janice got out of bed and walked over to the crib, which held their infant daughter. She was still sound asleep. What did we do wrong? That's just it. We did everything right. I even called in a favor from President Malay so Jeremy could be promoted to Fleet Admiral. He has the forces now. He should be able to cause the simulants a lot of problems in the Triangulum Galaxy. I'm sure he will, Heaton answered. His head felt like someone was pounding it with a sledgehammer. Problem isn't the Triangulum Galaxy. It's here, in ours. Janice remained silent, not sure what to say. When Heaton was ready to explain, he would. With a deep sigh, Heaton sat back down on the bed. He sat there for several moments, trying to make sense of his vision. He strongly suspected what it was he had seen, but it was so fantastic. If he was right, the galaxy was in deadly danger. I need to send a message to Admiral Tolson, he said at last. I have another mission for him, one I'm not sure even he will believe. Back on Gaia, several days had passed. The cities of New Eden and Clements were in a euphoria of happiness and non-stop partying. The first colonists had already come down, reuniting hundreds who thought they would never see their loved ones again. Many more were still up in orbit waiting. The supply ships had brought several thousand of the spider work robots. They'd been unloaded and new streets, businesses, and homes were already under construction. There would be three races on Gaia, Human, Alton, and Carthian. It would be a new society like none before. In orbit, new AIs were being constructed. Soon, new AI ships would be built, much more powerful than their predecessors. With the aid of the repair ships, 
which had come with the relief fleet, a massive space dock was being added to the clan protector. In orbit, ten indomitable class battle stations were being reassembled. They would form an impenetrable barrier to simulant attacks when combined with the Type II battle stations and the particle beam satellites. On the beach, a solemn and festive ceremony was being performed. Admiral Jackson had been asked to handle the rituals and had agreed without a moment's hesitation. How often did one get the opportunity to perform the marriage ceremony for one of the special five? Kelsey and Katie stood at the happy bride's side, holding colorful bouquets of native flowers. Jeremy and Kevin stood next to Brace, their eyes on their beautiful wives. The ceremony was short and sweet, and as soon as Brace kissed his bride, everyone broke out into applause and laughter. We should have had hamburgers for the meal, commented Kevin, as he filled his plate from the large buffet provided by the resort. You're going to turn into a hamburger, Katie said, shaking her head and laughing. Did you hear about Carell? asked Kelsey from Katie's side. What? asked Katie, looking over at Kelsey. I haven't spoken to her since the fleets arrived. Slenard was on one of the Bears' colony ships, Kelsey announced. Corell has already resigned her commission and is coming down to Gaia to start their family. That's wonderful, said Katie, feeling excited for her bear friend. She glanced over at Kevin, wondering how much longer it would be before they started a family. Perhaps it was time for them to have a serious talk about children. Jeremy looked around at all of his friends and loved ones. Gaia was going to be a great world to live on. It was a place where their families could be raised in safety and learn the history of the three organic races that inhabited it. Above it, the AIs would serve as protectors. Looking upward, Jeremy knew nearly a thousand warships now orbited the planet. He had hoped his time of fighting had ended. But now, the Dyson Sphere represented a serious threat to the home galaxy. With a deep sigh, he knew it would have to be dealt with. Pushing the thought to the back of his mind, he walked over and took Kelsey's hand. Angela and Brace were laughing and looked unbelievably happy. Tonight was not about war. It was about a new beginning. Ariel and Clarissa watched the ecstatic couple, feeling extremely pleased with everything. Centuries in the past, Ariel had promised Jason Strong she would look after Jeremy and the others. Now all five were happily married and perhaps soon would be starting families of their own. She wasn't overly worried about the threat the Dyson Sphere represented. The reason was simple. Jeremy always found a way to win, and she was certain he would solve this problem also. What now? asked Clarissa in her youthful voice. It's simple, Ariel replied with a big smile. Let's go join the party. Moments later, the beach was full of laughter as the party really began. This has been The Lost Fleet, Into the Darkness, a Slaver Wars novel, Volume 2, written by Raymond L. Weil, narrated by Liam Owen, produced by Sci-Fi Publishing, copyright 2015 by Raymond L. Weil, production copyright 2015 by Raymond L. Weil. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.